It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comments too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an enemy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Mike Steinel, who will be joining us a little later on tonight. I got uh, a residual today. This is very exciting. I got a residual. I hold in my hand a residual from Comedy Central for the Donald Trump roast, which we did, I guess, 10 years ago, $1.56. I got a dollar fifty six residual from Comedy Central for the Donald Trump roast. So and by the way, a dollar fifty six is more than he gave to charity for that roast. If you watch the Comedy Central roast, Trump said he was giving his entire salary to a charity. And apparently that charity was Donald Trump. He never gave that's what I heard from people high up, that they made the check out to him and not the charity he claimed he was giving it to. Surprising, isn't it? That's odd that that would happen. Welcome to the mop up for January 3rd, 2021. Wow. This is episode 1301. Today we start our 13th season, and this is the first episode, hence, therefore, and ergo, it's episode 1301. By the way, it's pronounced ergo. If you're going to say ergo, say ergo. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is a snowy 27 degrees. New cases of COVID in America are up 204% over two weeks ago. But fatalities are down 3%. Fatalities are down because vaccinations lessen the severity of the virus. Also, we're discovering that the new Omicron variant is said to be less fatal than the Delta variant. It doesn't seem to attack the lungs. That's according to the CDC. And according to reporting that's being done in New York City hospitals, which seems to be the epicenter so far for the Omicron outbreak, all the hospitalizations from this virus are unvaccinated. Anybody who contracts Omicron and needs to be hospitalized is either unvaccinated or got a breakthrough case and that sent them to the hospital because they have an underlying precondition. They had to go to the hospital because of an underlying precondition, like being over the age of 65 or having diabetes or having a, a, a compromised immune system. But if you're under 65 and you don't have any comorbidities and you're vaccinated, you will not die or get too sick from the virus. Ergo, <laughs> get vaccinated. 
get vaccinated and wear a mask. I really want to get this going to have people say ergo, not ergo, ergo. If you're going to be an feat intellectual snob, it's not just the words you use. It's how you say them. Ergo is fine. That doesn't annoy people. Ergo, that really gets under people's skin. And that's my goal in life, to get under people's skin. The Wall Street Journal reports that America spent $14 trillion since 9-11 to fight two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, there's no draft, right? And Dick Cheney, he was vice president, he introduced a policy over at the Pentagon when he was the first Bush's Pentagon chief. He introduced this outsourcing policy over at the Pentagon where ordinary military tasks are farmed out to private contractors like Halliburton or Blackwater. And they have now reported that the lion's share of the $14 trillion that was spent since 9-11 to fight two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, $14 trillion were spent on Iraq and Afghanistan. $14 trillion were spent. The lion's share of that money, as much as half, according to the Wall Street Journal, went to private contractors who, according to the Wall Street Journal, jacked up prices and failed to deliver what they promised. Ergo, we lost both wars. We privatized both wars. Half the money went to Halliburton, Blackwater, Raytheon, and we lost. Like, I will keep on reminding you, when you turn government services over to for-profit corporations, they jack up prices, pay themselves enormous salaries, and fail to deliver. That is always the case. There is not one example of a private corporation that took on a government service and delivered it more efficient, more efficiently and cheaper. That's just not the way it works. We've tried this for 40 years all over the world. I talked about Britain privatizing their water. It's an ecological disaster. It doesn't work as much as seven trillion dollars of the 14 trillion we spent on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as much as seven trillion dollars, according to the Wall Street Journal, found its way into defense contractors, construction firms, as well as, and this is where it gets personal, as well as paid mercenaries, soldiers for hire. It is estimated that by 2008, there were more paid contractors fighting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan than there were military soldiers. In 2008, that's when we were at the height of both wars. The U.S. had 187,900 troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. That was the height of the wars over there. We had 187,900 troops in Afghanistan. There were 203,660 contractor personnel over there fighting the war. We had more mercenaries fighting the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq than we had soldiers. Ergo, we lost both wars. When you depend on mercenaries, when you depend on for-profit corporations to fight your wars, you are going to lose. By the time President Trump left office, we had 18,000 contractors in Afghanistan and only 2,500 troops. We privatized the war in Afghanistan and we lost. We lost. If you look at the casualties, 7,000 American service members died during, during the uh, two decades of war. We know of only, we've only know that 3,500 U.S. contractors died in Afghanistan and Iraq. We don't have the exact number of mercenary soldiers who died in 
Iraq and Afghanistan because our military doesn't keep track of U.S. contractors who died fighting for us. Believe it or not, the Labor Department keeps track of all our mercenaries who die overseas. And the Labor Department says its numbers are incomplete. Unbelievable. We, we send mercenaries to fight these wars. They get six figures and we don't even keep track of their casualties or, or, or their deaths. We lost Afghanistan. We lost Iraq because it was a war for profit. We hired mercenaries. This is the same reason the British lost the Revolutionary War. They hired Hessians. They had to hire, they had to outsource the fighting. The CIA outsourced the interrogation of, of armed combatants. And so we waterboarded. The reason we were torturing and waterboarding is because we outsourced the interrogation of enemy combatants. Our two wars were fought by our soldiers, as well as Eric Prince and Blackwater and our soldiers in the heat of battle. Our soldiers, not the mercenaries, our soldiers had to make decisions based on the needs and the safety of the mercenaries who were earning six figures a year. They couldn't go into villages without clearing it through the for-profit contractors. They couldn't save lives or take lives often until they consulted with the for-profit contractors. Americans working in Iraq and Afghanistan made billions Read this Wall Street Journal article. Read how Americans went overseas and saw an opportunity to make billions subcontracting interpreters for the State Department, for the CIA, and for the Pentagon. Subcontracting, and according to the Wall Street Journal, they paid their Iraqi and Afghan interpreters crap wages to gather, to interpret the intelligence that the CIA and the Pentagon was gathering. And then our generals, Petraeus, wonders why we weren't getting the right intelligence during the surge, why we couldn't figure out what, what the Iraqi uh, tribal warlords were really planning. We couldn't get the right intelligence because loyalty is a two-way street. And when you subcontract out the job of interpreter so that Americans make billions and the actual interpreters get paid what Americans get paid, crap wages, you're going to get shoddy. At best, you're going to get shoddy work. Uh, and then, of course, interpreters who take a gun and shoot at our own soldiers, which was also the case. Our, our soldiers, the ones who enlisted in our all-volunteer army, $14 trillion to fight two wars, but our soldiers went off to fight with the army we had, not the army we wish we had, as Donald Rumsfeld told the soldiers who were complaining that they didn't have enough protective gear or ammunition. They didn't have the right communication devices. $14 trillion, half of that going to Blackwater, Halliburton, the defense contractors. There was plenty of money to be had setting up a billion dollar industry in Iraq and Afghanistan, subcontracting out interpreters and paying them shit wages. But our soldiers didn't have protective gears for the uh, improvised explosive devices, and they came home wounded and dead. They were asked to fight. Our soldiers were asked to fight these two wars on the cheap, while the contractors gouged taxpayers, you and me, in the name of profit, not freedom or democracy, profit. It was for profit. They went to war for profit. It used to be we fought wars for profit, like to protect our financial interests. Now the actual fighting of the war is for profit. The war is the end, not the means. 
it's it's pretty pretty heinous and and it makes all of us complicit makes all of us complicit in this it makes america not just a failed state but a bad state we're bad people we allow this to happen because we're more concerned about our netflix queue than we are the plight of our soldiers who are lied to and sent off to fight wars for profit it's we're bad that we allow this and and the only way we can redeem ourselves is to bring back the draft and everybody is against bringing back the draft i want to bring back the draft not just because i hate my kids that's part of it but i also hate my future grandchildren i hate all our kids and in all seriousness the solution is bring back the draft so much of our nation's ills could be solved if we simply brought back the draft because that would we would pivot away from a war economy if every kid had skin in the game. If a war is worth fighting, then everyone should fight it. Otherwise, we don't fight the war. We have had an all volunteer army since the Nixon administration, and the results are in. When you don't have enough soldiers, you privatize our military ergo we lose all our wars americans are suffering because we don't have a draft we have become intellectual isolationists we have no idea what is going on in the world because we don't have to there's no fear of our being sent to fight in some police action overseas Note, only 1% of this country passes through our military. 1%. The rest of us, we care more about our Netflix queues than we do about any of the potential hot spots for American soldiers overseas. So we don't question anything. We don't question why we're flying drones over Ethiopia. We don't question it because we have no skin in the game. In 2008, at the height of Afghanistan and Iraq, nobody in America could tell you who the leaders of Afghanistan and Iraq were. Nobody could tell you who we were propping up in Afghanistan and Iraq while we were at the height of those two wars. Why? Because there's no draft. Only 1% of this country ever had to worry about fighting there. So it's easy to call yourself the world's policeman if you don't have to walk the beat. We have become the world's policeman because there's profit in the policing. And as long as we don't have to send our kids or our grandkids, as long as we're sending more and more contractors who get six figures, as long as it's for profit or armed drones, if we have armed drones, killing innocent civilians or, or contractors killing innocent civilians, thousands upon thousands of innocent civilians were killed by armed drones during the past 20 years. Read the New York Times three weeks ago that we know of, we know of maybe 6,000 civilians who were killed by armed drones. That doesn't include the, the innocent civilians who were killed by Apache helicopters by soldiers who were laughing while they killed innocent Iraqis. That's why Julian Assange is being extra, extradited because he released that footage showing American soldiers laughing while they were killing innocent Iraqis. So Julian Assange must be put on trial for treason, even though he's not an American citizen. And the, the soldiers operating the Apache helicopters never prosecuted. As long as only 1% of this country has to even worry about serving overseas, we will continue to kill innocent civilians overseas needlessly. And they, the people who profit, we're talking about $14 trillion 
during the past 20 years. As long as none of us have to fight these wars, just pay our taxes, they will continue scaring us into these wars for profit. And so long as corporate America benefits by convincing us we're safe from imaginary enemies, it will continue and continue and continue. And they're still ginning up these imaginary enemies like China, like Russia on the border with Ukraine. Keep us scared. Keep us convinced that there's a war that we don't want to fight. So how much do I have to pay? How much of my taxes? What percentage of my federal budget has to go towards the illusion of safety? $780 billion? That's what we just signed. It's about a trillion dollars a year that goes to the Pentagon that we know of. They've never been able to audit the Pentagon. We pull out of Afghanistan and somehow the, the spending on the military goes up. That's to tide the military industrial complex over until we decide whether or not we're going to war with China or Russia. This will not happen if we bring back the draft. Suddenly, if everybody has to serve, our enemies won't be as menacing as they are right now. Brown University's Costa War Project. You should go to this website. This is where the Wall Street Journal is getting its information. Go to Brown University's Costa War Project. It's a group of scholars, lawyers, good lawyers, there are some, and professors who are drawing attention to the hidden costs of America's permanent war economy. We're not in a permanent state of war. We are a war economy, and we will continue to fight these wars. Our economy will continue to be a war economy until we bring back the draft. Otherwise, we are doomed as a nation because we do not have a sense of public service. And a sense of public service for a war economy is serving in the military and cleaning it out. When you serve in the military, you have a healthy distrust of generals and contractors. The more people who get exposed to the bullshit of our military, the less likely we are to support foreign interventions. You can only achieve that by the sacrifice of a draft. Transgender adults were three times as likely as cisgender people to experience starvation in America this year. That's according to UCLA. The UCLA Williams Institute says people are poor and that's why they don't have enough food. It's important to consider how stigma and discrimination impact economic resources across someone's life. Bullying, harassment, and discrimination can make it difficult to complete high school, pursue higher education, and secure better paying jobs. And that's why so many transgender Americans are starving because of persecution. The Equality Act would lift uh, transgender people, LGBTQ people out of poverty. And Congress passed the Federal Equality Act. And Joe Biden, to his credit, has, says it, has said it's a priority for his administration. It would ban discrimination against people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Like I said, the House passed the bill in February of last year, it stalled in the Senate, and President Biden has called this bill a priority for his administration, which is why he hasn't been able to sign it into law, because he has no priorities. He just has branding exercises. Everything gets stalled in the Senate because it's the Republicans' fault. There are no executive orders to sign. No, everything is Mitch McConnell's fort, fault or fort. Betty White passed away a few weeks short of her centennial. 
I remember sitting in a control room at CBS when I was a young comedy writer and getting scolded by Robert Sherman. He was a producer. He scolded me for laughing out loud at Betty White's witticisms. He whispered, he said, standards and practices, those are the censors, standards and practices is with us in the control room. And if you laugh at Betty White, then they realize she just said something incredibly filthy. Betty White was, <laughs> was a genius and one of the, had one of the filthiest minds without ever saying a dirty word. She was uh, a gift. Uh, I knew her tangentially. Betty White played in a poker game that was down the hall from me when I first moved to Los Angeles. And through mutual acquaintances, I got to be introduced to her repeatedly throughout the years. I was always, re you know, she wouldn't know who I was, but I got to reintroduce, get reintroduced to Betty White several times. And the conversation was always about my cats and dogs. She would always ask about my cats and dogs and their names and asked if they were rescues. And I always gave the correct answer that they were rescues. They weren't purchased at a pet store. And when I said, uh, they are rescues, she would said the same thing over and over again, and it bears repeating. She said, they rescued you. They found you. So uh, that has always stuck with me throughout the years. Uh, I've had more cats than I choose to remember, and five dogs who I do choose to remember because cats are better than dogs. But I do know even the cats rescued me they found me pets have psychic power to divine who will make an appropriate companion and then they turn on the charm especially cats uh, so you can honor betty's life by rescuing a cat or a dog and then getting their genitals mutilated by a professional remember to mutilate your cat her dog's genitals by a professional, make sure they can't reproduce. I know a, a tiny, tiny bit about Betty White, and I know her politics weren't as progressive as people right now are ascribing to her. I know that she dedicated, uh, she wasn't the progressive that we like to think she is. I know that she dedicated her life to protecting animals. But I also know that she believed in zoos. She probably, this is hearsay, she probably supported Obama, but she was not the progressive that we want to think she was. The point is we can love someone, and we do love Betty White, whether we agree with their politics or not. We must, going forward in 2022, stop defining each other by our politics because politics in America means nothing. It's not who you are. This has been, you know, we can no longer discriminate against race or sexuality or religion. We have to hate. So it's politically correct to hate somebody because of their politics. And that gives our politicians license to just be members of a tribe. They don't have to do anything. It's either team blue or team red and it's the same thing as being a Mets fan versus a Yankees fan. And if they deliver, we're still loyal. The Mets suck. You're still a Mets fan. We have to stop identifying with Team Red and Team Blue. That's one of the problems with our government. In America, politics is like religion. There's blind allegiance. The leaders don't practice what they preach. And the followers will remain faithful as long as they're kept stupid. And, and the reason Betty White is so beloved and aspirational is because of what she did, not what she said about the supposed big issues of the day. She wasn't Rob Reiner on Twitter trying to convince us that Joe Biden is the most transformative president since Roosevelt. She just did what she did. She comes from a time when politics and religion were personal. You know, ballots are secret. 
right now you have to tell people if you're red or blue. Uh, and I say, if it's not your business to discuss politics, then your politics is nobody's business. And so Betty White uh, was pretty much apolitical, at least as far as we know. We don't know how she voted. We don't know who she donated money to. And the world would be much better off. America would be much better off. Washington, D.C., would be much better off if Hollywood took a page from Betty White and refrained from speaking out on politics. You know, there's the Johnson Amendment that forbids religious figures from endorsing candidates. The same should uh, apply to celebrities, Hollywood celebrities, because they have more sway, unfortunately, than our religious leaders. Uh, it would be great to punish somebody like Rob Reiner uh, if he speaks out on politics. Celebrities, for the most part, are stupid. They don't read. They get things told to them. They don't have time to read because the pursuit of fame is it dulls your senses. You don't have time to read. And if you're not reading, you're ill informed. If you're making movies, you're an ignoramus. That's all you know. It's a 20 hour day. You're not reading. So celebrities, people in Hollywood should keep their mouths shut on politics. You know, in the 60s, Tony Bennett, Paul Newman, even Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston supported Bobby Kennedy uh, before Charlton Heston supported the thing that killed Bobby Kennedy, but they all marched with Dr. King or protested to end the Vietnam War. They spoke out on the environment. The lesson that mere mortal celebrities took from that is they must use their fame to speak out on the important issues of the day, to which I say, shut your effing mouth. Just shut your mouth. Uh, you make it worse by speaking out by drawing attention to specific candidates. That's, uh, I understand why so many Hollywood celebrities want to speak out because uh, they, they no longer make art that is political. They no longer make music that is political. Singers, actors, writers, performers need to speak out because 99% of what passes off as culture doesn't really challenge the status quo. Uh, we need more movies like Don't Look Up, you know? Don't Look Up doesn't both sides the issue. What pa what's passed off as political is both sides, you know, both sides are bad. We need more movies like Don't Look Up and fewer idiots like Rob Reiner telling us what they think. Most of what comes out of Hollywood says nothing. So the people who live and work there feel compelled to say something on their own, and it's just annoying. Uh, never before have so many self-important, empty-headed celebrities felt the need to identify with a specific party instead of, you know, a cause. Find, find a cause and rise above Democrats versus Republicans. That's why Bono was so great when he went to Washington lobbying for uh, aid to Africa for AIDS. Uh, he was successful because he couldn't vote in America. And a lot of people on the left criticized Bono for meeting with Republican Senator Bigot, horrible human being Jesse Helms. And Bono met with horrible Republican George W. Bush to push for getting AIDS medicine to Africa. But they moved on it. They moved on it. And the only single thing that George W. Bush can point to is he is partly responsible for the increase in funding for AIDS relief in Africa. And that was because Bono didn't care which party got the credit for it. He met with the evil Republicans. So if you want to speak out, speak out on a cause if you're a celebrity, but don't endorse, don't get involved in 
in politics. It accomplishes nothing. When 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 Rob Reiner endorses Joe Biden, it pushes uh, most people away from Joe Biden. When Barbara Streisand speaks out against Bush, it pushes people towards Bush. Barbara Streisand should concern herself with unions. Then maybe she would pay all her debts to her workers, which she doesn't. You know, it's easy to not pay your workers what they're owed uh, when you're fighting globally with Clinton. I'm a good person. Look how much I care about the world, just not the people who work for me. Well, the midterms are upon us and we are in a permanent campaign here in America because it's easier to make promises than it is to deliver. Most democracies, most civilized democracies start their elections anywhere between three to three months to six weeks before the voting begins. But here in America, the minute you're elected to office, you're on the phone raising cash for the next campaign. And all anyone covers is the politics, who's up, who's down, because it's the promise. That's what people love, the promise. There are billions to be made by the promise of government, not by the actual governing. Millions, billions to be made in the media, television advertising, radio advertising, entire networks thrive off the, the game of politics. Political consultants make hundreds of millions of dollars selling ads to these uh, networks and radio stations, advising uh, candidates, lobbying firms, lobbying firms, most of their money comes from campaign donations and getting involved in issue campaigns that are super PACs, that are endorsements of candidates. It's a permanent campaign and everyone benefits except the voters. Elected officials prefer campaigning to governing because it's easier to make promises than it is to deliver on them, right? Biden gets elected, we have the Oval Office, we have the Senate, and we have the House, but nothing can get done. We have to focus on the midterms now. The minute they had the House, the Senate, and the White House, the Democrats immediately said, if only we had more. We, we can't do anything until we have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. I mean, we could get rid of the filibuster, but that would mean we'd have to deliver instead of making promises. Going into the new year, I have not given up on the Democratic Party. I know most of my listeners, or a good number of them, and my guests have given up on the Democratic Party. I have given up on the people running it. I still believe in institutions, and I think the people running the Democratic Party should be institutionalized. I, I think they're, they should either be put in, in a, a, a mental health facility or preferably prison. So I believe in taking over the Democratic Party and changing the party from within by responding to the challenges from outside. There's room for everybody. There's room for David Cobb from the Green Party to make the Democratic Party do it. And there's room for people in the Democratic Party to change it from within and clean house. Personally, I believe, you know, Marianne Cummings, Professor Marianne Cummings, we need, we need everybody. She, I think she would prefer creating a third party. I, I say, go ahead. Uh, for me, it doesn't seem to be worth trying quite yet because let's try finishing the transformation of the Democrats. You know, we talk about the sweep of history and how Reagan changed American politics and how we view government, but we don't really talk about how Clinton changed the Democratic Party. We don't have a Democratic Party to fight Reagan's 
transformation of our economy. We need a Democratic Party that hasn't been transformed by Reagan. Reagan transformed or the Democrats allowed Reagan to transform our party. There's a slow transformation swinging back to what the Democratic Party used to be. It was never perfect, but now it's this is the worst Democratic Party in my lifetime and in the history of the Democratic Party. This is a failed party. But if you go back to 2016, there was Bernie, maybe Congressman Barbara Lee. Was that it? I think that was it. You had some pretenders like Sherwood Brown, you know, but you didn't have real you didn't have real leftists. Sherwood Brown is against Medicare for all. Um, now look at what we're saying. Thanks to Bernie, uh, AOC from New York, Elon Omar from Minnesota. Uh, Ayanna Presley from Massachusetts, Rashida Tlaib from Michigan, J Jamal Bowman, Corey Bush. So we're seeing more and more real leftists, people who identify with the Democratic Socialists of America, caucusing with the Democrats and working to change it from within. Let's let's finish that job. Let's finish transforming the Democratic Party because we can't transform this country until we have a one party that offers something to the American people. The clock is ticking and I think that causes people to give up. They think we don't have enough time. We, we don't have time to be patient. Yes, there is a climate emergency and there is also a crisis of democracy that should not paralyze the people who want to transform the Democratic Party. There are always going to be emergencies. I'm not discounting the, the end of our democracy, which I think happened a couple of years ago, but I'm not discounting how bad things can get. And I'm also not discounting the climate emergency, which has started, but Humans do not perform well. We do not think clearly when our pituitary glands are squirting out all this adrenaline and creating a permanent emergency state with all of us in a permanent panic attack. That's how we ended up with the Patriot Act. That's how we ended up with TARP. That's how we ended up with the invasion of Afghanistan. That's how we ended up with the invasion of Iraq. We were terror, terrorized and terrified. We don't think clearly when we are terrified, when we are cowards. See, if we brought back a draft, uh, civilian citizens would learn how to think clearly in a crisis. None of us can keep our head in a crisis, so we panic. There's a climate emergency and people are third party or I'm not voting. I I'm a prepper. Uh, the reason we have a climate emergency is because there's a shortage of long term thinking. And we're told that the planet has 10 years. So why think long term about the Democratic Party? That's what they want. Exxon wants us not to think long term. As long as we keep thinking the planet only has 10 years, we're going to make short term decisions which benefit nobody. Our side, the left, you need to take a deep breath and not be scared. This is battle. This is war. If if there were a draft, we would be trained to think clearly while the enemy is attacking us. Yes, the earth is about to die. So uh, I choose to think of Apollo 13. These were all soldiers who went off to join NASA. And Apollo 13, the capsule was leaking oxygen. They were running out of oxygen, but mission control worked the problem 
because they knew exactly what they wanted to land those three astronauts safely on Earth. This is our Apollo 13 moment, and we need to think long term. And clearly, yes, there is a climate emergency. There are going to be refugees from Florida, Florida, making their way up the coast. But there will be a planet in 50 years. There will be some kind of civilization and there will be a government and there will be something resembling a democracy. Even when Chile was under the iron grip of Pinochet, there was something resembling a democracy. There were institutions that after 17 years were able to weaken Pinochet and usher in a democracy. Not everything is Nazi Germany. You know, it's it, what, 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 whatever the right has in store for us, it doesn't necessarily mean concentration camps and every major city in America raised. We don't have to go right to Nazi Germany. Things can get a lot worse. Things could end up like Nazi Germany, even worse since we have nuclear weapons and crazy Christians who want to welcome the, the second coming. Yes, things can get a lot worse. That means you have to fight to make sure they don't. A Republican takeover doesn't mean some apocalyptic death sentence with concentration camps and, and sea levels rising and only those with artificial gills sold to us by Elon Musk uh, only the people with Elon Musk's artificial gills will survive the rising sea levels. It's That's not in the foreseeable future. It's coming if we don't do anything, but it doesn't help to catastrophize that way. We need to fight and think long term. And that means even if Republicans gain control of the House and the Senate in November, that means the fight continues. The Democrats from within, the leftists, can win, even with the Republicans controlling the House and the Senate in November, starting in January of 2023. If we think long term and the Democrats, the leftists and the Democrats, replace the corporatists with representatives from Bernie's wing of the party, the squad's wing of the party. The truth is, before we transform the country, you need to either create a third party, which I don't think is reasonable, or transform the Democratic Party. We need a revolution in this country, and it starts within the Democratic Party. I believe it must be the People's Party. The Democratic Party has to be the People's Party. Howie Klein is going to bring on another candidate. Howie Klein introduces us to all the great candidates who are progressive, left, many are DSA, and they're all doing it within the Democratic Party. We need to prop up the good Democrats and get rid of Rob Reiner and David Geffen. David Geffen picked Obama. He decided and he poured enough money and got enough money for Obama that he beat Hillary. Uh, he was right, but uh, but he was, he was right about Hillary, wrong about Obama. David Geffen doesn't care about you getting free health care or free daycare, free tuition. He doesn't, Rob Reiner isn't talking about slicing up state budgets to make sure all public schools are funded equally. If you don't wake up every morning worrying about the eviction crisis, homelessness, infant mortality, world hunger, getting medicine to everyone who needs it. If you don't wake up every morning thinking about human dignity for everyone, unions, ending endless wars, unraveling the military-industrial complex, 
getting all the guns off our streets, enforcing antitrust laws that are already on the books, and making sure our prisons are filled to the rafters with white male, white collar criminals. If you don't wake up every morning thinking about that, you're not a bad person. You're just not a Democrat. You're not a Democrat. And we need to make that clear that Rob Reiner is not welcome inside the Democratic Party. You know how the left has made Joe Manchin's life miserable and they show up outside his yacht and when he's trying to drive his Maserati out of the parking garage, they block it and he's gotten really angry. We're afraid he's going to go to the Republicans. I'll get to that in a second. I want Rob Reiner to go be a Republican. Let him go be a Republican. They could use somebody like Rob Reiner. We don't want him. And we should kick him out, as well as David Geffen. Take all these rich Hollywood liberals and let them go be Republicans so that there's a Rockefeller wing once again in the Republican Party. Let's make the Democratic Party inhospitable to anybody who is not a leftist. Now, you do that by listening to Howie Klein, listening to how he vets his candidates. And what we need to make sure is that the squad takes over the Progressive Caucus. And Pramila Jayapal is sort of the squad, but, you know, she got screwed by the Congressional Black Caucus, the Democratic Congressional Black Caucus on Build Back Better. So th they outflanked her on Build Back Better, and that's why she agreed to the bipartisan infrastructure vote without the one on Build Back Better. So we need more African-Americans in the Congressional Black Caucus who are also members of the squad to prevent neoliberal hacks like Congressman James Clyburn from pushing the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure bill without also a vote on Build Back Better. See, Clyburn is a Democrat, he's African-American, but he pushed Biden down our throats and he, did it, he helped orchestrate an end run on uh, bringing the bipartisan infrastructure bill to a vote without a vote on Build Back Better. He's also uh, is uh, stripping police reform bills of getting rid of qualified immunity. You can't reform the police unless you get rid of qualified immunity for police officers. In other words, if a police officer, like what happened in Los Angeles last week, uh, what, what, like what happens every day in America when a police officer shoots somebody in the back because the police officer is too fat to chase after somebody he thinks is a suspect, that officer should be allowed, they should be allowed to sue that officer. But with qualified immunity, you cannot sue a police officer. James Clyburn is part of the old guard. We need to elect more African-American Democrats who side with the squad. Congresswoman Val Demings is an African-American woman running for the Democratic nomination for Senate in Florida. She's not the African-American woman we want. If you say you want a revolution, start within the Democratic Party. That's where it starts. All parties are empty vessels until they're taken over. All parties are ripe for a takeover. They are empty shells by their very nature. Newt Gingrich took over the Republican Party in 1994, and he was just the speaker. He was just the speaker. Then it became George W. Bush's party, and now it's Donald Trump's. And the Democratic Party is ripe for a takeover. It was FDR's party, then it became Lyndon Johnson's party, and it stood for something until it became Bill Clinton's party. And it's been Bill 
Clinton's party ever since. This party is lousy with third way bullshit artists. You know, uh, Tony Blair, third way the Labor Party into becoming acolytes of Thatcher and Bill Clinton, third way the Democratic Party. And now you cannot tell the difference between Pelosi, Schumer, and McCarthy and Gingrich. There's no difference between the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership. They're both answering to the same paymaster. Reclaim the Democratic Party. That's the job of the left. If the left cannot reclaim the Democratic Party, we had it. Foley, Tip O'Neill, these were left of center speakers. If the left can't figure out the levers, levers of power within the Democratic Party, then it's not going to figure out the levers of, par, levers of power with a third party. There's an empty shell ready to be taken over. If you can't figure out how to take over the Democratic Party, then you don't deserve the lever, levers of power in our government. It's that simple. I don't believe it's time for a third party quite yet. It's time for a, a second party. Let's transform the party into what it once was before Clinton and, and Carter. It, it started with Jimmy Carter, a failed president, uh, a failed president because he abandoned the left, he abandoned unions. And as Harvey J.K. was talking on Thursday's show, he was a member of the Trilateral Commission who believed in less democracy, not more. Clinton and Carter changed, transformed the Democratic Party and made it about less government. Carter said, government can't solve all your problems. Bill Clinton, during his inaugural speech, said, the days of big government are over. So we need to be a little patient, even though the, the clock is ticking on the climate, you, un you need to understand the sweeps of history. And it's the Democrats that changed. First, the Democrats changed, then the country changed. The Democrats became Reagan Democrats. And uh, it started, it, it, you know, really started in 92 when Clinton got elected and it was no longer the party that spoke for the 99%. Clinton destroyed the party. Clinton destroyed the party. He deregulated Wall Street. He overthrew Glass-Steagall. He got rid of welfare. And he passed NAFTA. He turned his back on everything the Democratic Party used to stand for. Unions, the working poor, the poor, and regulating the financiers. Clinton destroyed the Democratic Party. He transformed it. He turned the Democrats into Reagan Democrats. He took Wall Street money and he paid them back, just like Obama, just like Pelosi, just like Schumer. We need Lyndon Johnson. We need Hubert Humphrey. We need Walter Mondale. We need what we once had, Tip O'Neill, and we have to fight for it starting now. Biden, Harris, Buttigieg, they're not the Democratic Party. And this is the year where we measure success, not by whether the Dems keep the House or the Senate. Nothing will change in the Democratic Party until we support all the primary challenges from the left and start replacing the Godheimers with the AOCs. That's how you measure success in November. How many corporate Democrats got replaced with leftists, anti-corporate Democrats? Assume we're going to lose the Senate. Assume we're going to lose the House. 
how many leftists got elected in the Democratic Party. Don't tell me the party, the Democratic Party, is too entrenched to be, be changed. Fight. Forget which party wins in, no, in November. The left needs to put more numbers on the board. More numbers. In 2016, it was inconceivable that there would be such a thing as, a, as the squad. In 2016, it was inconceivable that people would talk about Medicare for all or forgiving student debt or free tuition at all public universities or income inequality. Things change slowly and then very quickly if you think long term. So don't let them trick you into being in a permanent state of crisis mode. They want you terrified. They want you unable to think clearly. They want you to think that the planet only has 10 years left, which it does and it doesn't. It does and it doesn't. The, the neoliberals understand that crisis is an opportunity. Milton Friedman said that in Chile, and then he said, exacerbate the crisis, make it worse, so we can implement Straussian Chicago school economics and have Allende disposed of. Rahm Emanuel, who was a neoliberal, said after 2008, when he became uh, Obama's chief of staff about the economic crisis, crisis is an opportunity. But they use it as an opportunity to make corporate America more influential in Washington, richer and more powerful. Crisis is an opportunity. And it's either an opportunity for the neoliberals and the fascists, not so sure there's much uh, sunlight between neoliberals and fascists these days, or it's an opportunity for the left. Crisis, and we are in a crisis, is an opportunity to offer alternative solutions to what is not working. We know neoliberal policies not only don't work, they're, de they're destroying the planet. They're killing us. The Democratic Party is ripe for a takeover debate debate the issues. Let the left debate the neoliberals running the party. They will lose. It's why Nancy Pelosi did not debate Shahid Buttar. She didn't debate him because she can't win that debate. It's why Bernie didn't get to speak during the debates. It's why Perez, who was head of the Democratic Party, insisted that everybody run for president in 2020 so that the debate stage would be flooded and Bernie couldn't be heard. Because when you hear Bernie, when he goes on Fox, people say, you know, uh, I would vote for him or Trump. Uh, so crisis is an opportunity. Uh, the Democratic Party is ripe for a takeover, as is corporate America. Before we go to a third party, fight within the Democratic Party. And uh, before we give up on capitalism, let's see if we can fight corporate America. They want us to believe you can't win. But uh, maybe there's still, maybe we could try capitalism. Maybe we need to fight corporate America. Maybe corporate America is not synonymous with capitalism. Maybe corporate America is a kleptocracy, is some kind of other form of economics. Maybe capitalism, maybe we should try it. Uh, capitalism is not fascism. 
And fascism is when corporations and the military run our government. So maybe we should spend some time speaking out against corporate Democrats, but also speaking out against the corporations, the specific corporations who control them. There is a left-right alliance. There's a Democratic Party, Republican Party alliance speaking out against corporations. You have Josh Hawley, you have Republicans who hate Apple, Google, Amazon, Raytheon, Boeing, ExxonMobil, maybe not ExxonMobil. Uh, both sides of the aisle, there are politicians who recognize we all have a common enemy, and that is corporations. Corporations are not synonymous with capitalism. They are the enemies of capitalism. Your enemy isn't Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates. Your enemy is corporate America. The, corporate America is destroying this planet and our democracy. And nothing will fundamentally change until we, as consumers, start holding corporate America responsible for the destruction of our democracy, our planet, and our lives. It starts with taking over the Democratic Party, but also taking over our economy. Stop watching and believing advertisements. Everything you see on television is a lie. Every advertisement for a politician is a lie. Stop believing it. Stop watching this crap. Corporations lie. That's their job. They, they hire ad men to lie. And why should you believe them? Why should you believe any corporation? All they want is to maximize profits. All they want is to pay their employees less and trick you into spending more on their useless products, right? There's a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a marinara sauce that has a label on it that says, you know, Frank Sinatra, right? And then they and the, it sells for eight dollars. And then they take the label off the very same marinara sauce and put Costco on it, and it costs half. It's a lie. It's just a label. This is what corporate America does. They trick you. It's all about marketing a feeling or a story and stories are lies so don't believe them a product they'll try to tell you that a product is a feeling no it's either a useful good or it isn't the marinara sauce either tastes good or it doesn't not because they slapped a five cent sinatra label on it instead of a costco label on it Pay attention to the corporations. They are your enemy. Support local businesses. Support bookstores, local bookstores. It's good for your health to, to leave your apartment and walk and find a local bookstore and support it. Support local businesses. Support bookshops local pharmacies, support, support local supermarkets. Corporations lie, and so do their candidates. That's the truth. If you're a corporate Democrat, you are a liar. And we can fix this economy and our government if we fix the Democratic Party by purging the party of corporate Democrats. Look who donates to the candidates. If the candidate takes corporate funding, they are a liar. No corporate Democrat is ever going to give us Medicare for all or a public option. They're not going to do it. They're going to say they're going to give us a public option but they're lying. 
Joe Biden is a product of corporate America. He gets his financing from corporate America. So is Vice President Harris. And so when they ran for office, their campaigns were nothing but corporate advertisements with false promises. Get rid of the corporate Democrats. Get rid of the Democrats who take corporate money. If a Democrat says to you, we have to overturn Citizens United for me to stop taking corporate funding, he's a cor he or she is a corporate Democrat and a liar. You can get elected without taking corporate funding. Let your opponent take corporate funding and run on that because your enemy is corporations. And America knows that. America knows that. We don't need to overturn Citizens United. We don't need to get the money out of politics. We need to get the politicians who are obsessed with money out of politics. The money that is spent to get these candidates elected doesn't work. It's immaterial. They did a postmortem on the 20... 20 elections and the Democrats discovered that something like two thirds of the money raised and spent was wasted, had nothing to do with getting results. They were buying advertising time for congressional candidates in television and radio markets where they weren't even running. This money just gets spent to be spent. It has nothing to do with winning. Bernie didn't take corporate funding and look how far he got. Trump, look how far Trump got before he started taking money. So when you look at who is supporting these candidates, if they're supported by corporations, they're liars and call them out on that and make it sell law that corporate America is your enemy and that corporate America is not synonymous with capitalism. If you take corporate money, you're a liar, you're compromised. Biden took corporate money. He, so he ran promising to be the most pro-labor president in history. So far, one Starbucks in Buffalo has gone union. One, I think. They voted to unionize. Let's see if it sticks. That's it. That's it. One Starbucks in union and people point to the Kellogg strike or John Deere. That's that's not because of Biden. That's union unions exercising what little muscles they still have left. Biden doesn't get credit for Kellogg or a John Deere strike. One union, one union shop at Starbucks, like 25 people in Buffalo went union. That's all Biden has to show for being the most pro-union president since Roosevelt. He promised to raise the minimum wage to $15. Nothing, not even voting on it. They didn't even vote on it. They just took it out. He thinks that saying what he, that what he stands for is good enough. He thinks if he says he's for the $15 minimum wage, that should be good enough because he's a corporate Democrat and corporations use Madison Avenue to surround their product with a feeling, with a tribe, with a story. So you look at Biden and his story is he's pro-union and for raising the minimum wage to $15. Doesn't matter if he doesn't deliver. That's what his product stands for. The same way ExxonMobil says it stands for renewable energy. If you only watched television advertising, if you only read print advertising, you would be utterly convinced that ExxonMobil was the world's biggest champion of renewable energy and that Joe Biden was to the left of Bernie. If all you did was watch television advertising and, and hear Biden's speeches, you would believe that he was uh, to the left of Bernie. Biden promised to relieve at least $10,000 of student debt, which he could do right now through executive order. Didn't do it. 
Why would he tackle debt? He's the senator from debt. Delaware was founded on debt. His entire political career was funded by the credit card industry. He wants you in debt. You think credit card companies want Americans to get into the habit of having less debt, f tasting the freedom of a debt-free life? And you think corporate America doesn't want all our graduates crushed by the weight of debt? That's how you get a more compliant working class debt. This country was founded on indentured servants. Slavery came later. This country was founded by pliable and frightened servants who were working off their debt. The crushing weight of debt returns America to its economic roots. Biden wants you in debt. Biden promised a public option on Obamacare. He said he was against Medicare for all, but he would introduce a public option. He promised a public option one year into office. He hasn't even mentioned it. He hasn't even like floated it to have Manchin kill it. He promised to speed up the phasing out of fossil fuels. American consumption of coal, the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases, America's consumption of coal is, uh, coal is up something like 8%. It's up 8% in uh, 2021, with no sign of it going down in 2022. Forget phasing coal out. He can't even phase it down. Most of his failures and their legion, I don't... I, I think pulling out of Afghanistan, you know, he can run for re-election on that, but even that, I'll talk about that later. Most of his failures are attributed to one man, a deeply compromised senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Somehow one man is holding up the entire domestic agenda of the Democratic Party, and we're supposed to believe that lie. Joe Manchin's daughter should be behind bars for price fixing the EpiPen. We've been over this. I, I don't need to go over Joe Manchin's daughter or his wife. They're criminals. Joe Manchin collects at least half a million dollars a year in dividends from a coal company he founded and then transferred to his idiot son. So he's getting half a million dollars a year in dividends from a coal company. So if Joe Biden, if the Democratic leadership really stood for what's in Build Back Better, Joe Manchin would be on board. There are ways to get Joe Manchin on board Build Back Better and terrified of going over to the Republicans. You can get Joe Manchin. First off, you don't even need to, you flatter him first. You, you put into Build Back Better, you load the bill with enough pork to guarantee that West Virginia goes from being the poorest state in the union to one of the most educated and vibrant. You start building university, you start building Joe Manchin Community College, the Joe Manchin University, the Joe Manchin Bridge, the Joe Manchin Museum. You go all Keynesian on Joe Manchin and West Virginia, and you promise that Build Back Better will pump billions of federal aid and assistance into West Virginia. That's the first step. You buy Manchin's vote. Anybody got a problem with that? That's how it's done. Pork. You, then you go to West Virginia with or without Joe Manchin and you sell Build Back Better to the West Virginians and you move the polling up on Build Back Better, right? If you're the president, you go to West Virginia. You got a problem with Manchin, he won't budge. You take it right to his voters and he's, you know, you embarrass him. You're the president. You have a bully pulpit. You carpet bomb the state of West Virginia with radio and television ads and interviews and rallies and promises, real concrete promises to get the West Virginia voters on board. 
You sell it to Manchin's voters, not to Manchin. You move the polls to convince Manchin that it is in his interest to be in favor of this. When Joe Manchin lies and says, I can't go back to my voters in West Virginia with Build Back Better, say, yes, you can. Look at the polling on this. You're a liar and you do it publicly. Did Biden or Harris, did anybody in the administration go to West Virginia to campaign for Build Back Better? No, Biden worked the phones. That's what he did. He, he claims he wants Build Back Better and that the best way to get it passed was to negotiate with Manchin because I'm, I'm an old senator. I know how to work the phones. So let's just bring him in, keep it all inside the loop. It would be unseemly for Joe Biden to bring the American people, the voters of West Virginia into this, into the negotiations because Biden and the Democrats couldn't care less what the voters want or what we think. You know, Princeton came out with the results of a study back in 2014 showing that the American people do not get what they want from government and that the government doesn't listen to the American people. Princeton collected data on 1,800 pieces of legislation that were passed over a 20 year period. And then they looked at the polling on these pieces of legislation, and it was irrelevant. It, di it didn't matter what a majority of Americans wanted passed and what they didn't want passed. What mattered is what the richest 10% of America wanted. That moved politicians to, to vote accordingly. They, politicians ignore the 99%. They listen to the richest 10 percent. And this study coming out of Princeton concluded that uh, we're an oligarchy, that this country is run by oligarchs. We have uh, politicians who only answer to the richest 1 percent, at best the richest 10 percent. Imagine a president, a Democratic Party, moving the polls by selling their policies to the 99%, not picking up a phone and calling Joe Manchin. Imagine a president who shamed Joe Manchin to voting for Build Back Better. Because if the people in, uh, of West Virginia understood what's in Build Back Better, they would poll overwhelmingly in favor of it. And quite frankly, if a president can't move the polling on Build Back Better in West Virginia, he or she should not be president. If you can't carpet bomb the people of West Virginia and talk them into Build Back Better and explain how it would transform their lives for the better, you shouldn't be president. But Biden wouldn't even try. He shouldn't be president. Biden couldn't be bothered. He wanted to pass Build Back Better, so he claims, through backroom deals because that's how he got the Democratic nomination, through backroom deals. Nobody wanted Biden or Harris to be nominated. They worked the phones. And that's how Biden governs, by working the phones, calling the very same people who got him the nomination. He's, he's trying to pass legislation on the phone with the same people who fixed the nomination for him. And that's why he's even more unpopular than Donald Trump. Look at the polling. He is more unpopular than Donald Trump. Why? Because Donald Trump, who is going to kill, get us all killed, he at least took it to the people. Trump had the support of a base because he went out and took it to the people. Remember 2016? Remember how the Republicans, the Bush Republicans worked the phones to stop Trump? While they were working the phones, Trump worked the people and he got the nomination and he won because when you have the people, you have the power. You want a revolution in the Democratic Party? Work the people. Work, get somebody like Bernie or AOC 
Work the people. All right. Uh, forget which party wins in November. Keep track of how many corporate Democrats we can crush in the primaries. Find the challenger on the left and fight for that candidate in the primaries. A leftist, a president who knew Build Back Better was the safety net the American people desperately needed, would have fought for Build Back Better. And uh, you're not going to get that from a corporate Democrat. Um, I got to wrap it up. I could keep going. Uh, is Mark Breslin here yet? He's not here yet. Uh, I'll have to save this for Friday. Um, look, wars should not benefit corporate America. Wars shouldn't be fought. And if they are fought, they should benefit the people who are being oppressed. Health care should benefit the patient, not the health insurance corporations. Educating our children should benefit children, not corporate America. Providing paid sick and family leave should help families, not insurance companies. That's what Nancy Pelosi wants. She wants the, the, the sick, uh, the paid sick and family leave, the benefits to be administered by private health insurance companies. Providing daycare should benefit parents, not corporations who, corporations who are too cheap to provide take daycare, corporations who uh, run for-profit childcare centers, which care more about the bottom line than paying their employees a livable wage. So the midterms start now. It's 2022. I don't care if the, uh, if the Democrats win more in the House or lose the House or the Senate. I care that corporate America loses in November. That's what I care about. Corporate America needs to be the loser in November. Stop supporting corporations. Do not buy what they're selling, and that includes their politicians. Thank you for that fake manufactured applause. I didn't have enough time. I wanted to, there was so much I wanted to talk about. Hey, Dan in the newsroom. Dan, are you here? You want to go over uh, community billboard? before Mark Breslin arrives. All right. You're listening to the David, Fel David Feldman show. This is like a Twilight Zone episode where I, <laughs> I'm just talking and uh, nobody's, uh, nobody's really out there. It's just some, some solipsistic exercise in futility. This is uh, The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. I can take calls from our Zoom room as we're waiting for Mark Breslin. Raise your hand if there's anything you want to talk about. If you would like to join me in the virtual studio audience, you can do it by going to the website and signing up. And then we do office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Why is everybody saying congratulations, Nick? What did uh, I got my first negative test result today, so no more COVID for now. That's good. Professor John, that was the best uh, Twilight Zone episode you've shown so far. Friday night, Professor John showed an episode of the Twilight Zone. That was amazing. Oh, I'm glad you liked that one. That was uh, called On Thursday We Leave for Home. That was amazing. James Whitmore? James Whitmore, yes. Yeah, pretty amazing. Good actor. Yeah. How was your New Year's? 
Uh, nice. Yes, we actually had uh, two people over that we hadn't seen in two years or more. And uh, it was a is nice it going to be another two years? Is it going to be another two years? <laughs> Could be. Could be from the looks of things uh, with uh, Omicron. I don't know. But it's oh, on your mind, knows? sir. You always have something interesting. Well, yeah. So um, uh, you said we need to try capitalism, David. Yes. What have we been doing for the last, though, I don't know, three, four centuries? Well, is that we, we talk a lot about this. Is this capitalism? Is this what Adam Smith talked about? Was it was it Professor Marianne who said she read the part of Wealth of Nations where he talks about labor? Is this capitalism? Uh, I I think it is. I think it it's what capitalism devolves into, because one of the things that capitalism does, even in its best form, as practiced in um, say Scandinavia or practiced in, in the United States <clears throat> since, um, you know, roughly between, uh, the late forties to the early seventies. Uh, you know, I mean, that's sort of the best we've seen, but what happens is, uh, that it devolves into, if you leave the power of, production and making all decisions associated with production in the hands of a few people and they're called capitalists because they control capital they own capital they make the decisions um, w over time they accumulate more and more wealth and they use that wealth to take over the political system and no matter which country you look at in the world, uh, look at the Scandinavian countries, they have been going in the opposite direction since the 1990s. Right. But that doesn't mean capitalism in the Scandinavian countries can't be saved through some hybrid of capitalism and socialism. Right. Sure. I mean, I'm all for that. Uh, well, see, but the, the question is. Here's here's why is it go ahead. Why is it going in the other direction? And why are so many people, even in those countries, um, disillusioned with their political system? And so that means those countries are ripe for some kind of uh nationalization of industries and more government and less concentration of wealth more more taxation i'm not, i'm not saying here, here's what i'm my question for the left is you can blame capitalism the same way you can blame the democrats or the republicans it's a label and I'm not sure this is capitalism and I'm not sure the Scandinavian countries ever had socialism and I'm not sure Russia ever had communism. But to, to just chalk something up to this myth mythological economic system that doesn't exist, doesn't uh, address the solutions. So that, that's my criticism of the left is it's easy to just say it's capitalism's fault. The same way the Democrats say it's easy, you know, the Democrats say it's the Republicans fault. So it lets you off the hook and you don't have to govern. Uh, this is the problem I think the left has that that, that well, I, I think it's, you know, it goes beyond just the label. It goes beyond. It goes to what specifically is wrong with the economic system. You know, is it a problem that the workplace is a dictatorship? I think it is. That's the norm in capitalism. 
So we've seen workplaces that are more democratic and they function at least as well as those that are autocratic or totalitarian even, you know, where, where people are observing your every move, your every keystroke, your every, um, with the, when you go to the bathroom, how long you're in the bathroom, you know, we've seen that and we compare it to other forms that, that are more democratic co-ops, et cetera. And we see that's better. Now, if you want to call a, an economy based on cooperatives, capitalism, then let's call it, that's fine. I'm all for capitalism, but it gets down to the specifics of what it is you mean. But I, I see your guest is here, so I won't take up. Thank you. I, let, let's time. continue this. I, I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Go let's ahead. go to a civilized country that doesn't kill innocent civilians, thousands of innocent civilians with armed drones. Mark Breslin is up in Canada, Toronto. He is the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America. We, we were discussing socialism and capitalism. And is that conversation had in Canada? Do they blame your economic system for your nation's ills? No, David, they mostly blame me. It's <laughs> <laughs> very unfair. I have to tell you. Um, and as far as, the, you know, you say thousands of, in our country, thousands of people are not killed by drones. You're absolutely correct. But there's always hope. <laughs> because frankly, not everyone should live. Um, but that's a controversial. And then maybe I don't want to take that position today. And this is why when you do run for office, you you run for office running like a boutique kind of candidate. Like you're not for everybody. You're very select few. I've always said I should not be running for office. I should be running from office. <laughs> do they just do, do do I have a very I have a very complex and contradictory political position. I consider myself and I have for a long time a Warhol Republican, which means I'm pro business and pro orgy. <laughs> Those rarely go together. <laughs> If Yuck Yucks yes. were a worker-owned business, I suspect it would not work because it well, wouldn't reflect you know, your taste. No, but part of the well, there's all kinds of taste issues and and things, and and you want a company like Yuck Yucks to have a a kind of. Um, an attitude towards things you want. You want there to be a consistency of product rather than people arguing about <clears throat> what the product should be all the time. But the real problem is that these people are not full-time employees. They're only part-time workers. I think when people are, are full-time employees, full-time workers in a place, they have a much better reason to say, hey, I want to I want to say in how things run. But when you work maybe a total of you know, six hours a week for a couple of that that really gives you the right or the insight of how to make things done. Now, I believe in democracy. I believe well, that makes one. Of right. I believe in an, an Athenian democracy. I believe that that is the idea of America. We're not we're a republic, barely. But it would be great if all of us could vote and the majority within reason gets to dictate our direction. But as a comedian, I do not believe in democracy. I believe the customer, and you've said this, is always in the way. <laughs> the customer is in the way. Now, this is why I've never really made it as a stand-up comic, but I think the best comics are undemocratic. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, um, the, I wouldn't just say comics. I mean, I would say that's true for musicians. I would say that's true for just about anybody in the arts. Um, you only have to be on a movie set to see that the director cannot be challenged or nothing would ever get done. Right. And time is money. Um, 
And these are highly speculative ventures as businesses, any any artistic venture. So you have to kind of have somebody be responsible and they have to have reasonably autocratic powers. Now I say reasonably because obviously you don't want like sexual harassment happening um, at, unless I'm in charge <laughs> in which case it's fine, um, because I would do it tastefully. Um, and the like, well, I'm sorry, but, you, you um, broke up. You would do you would do it tastefully, and what? The, the lighting would be low, and the lighting so would, would be, be low, all, right. right. It would not be pornographic; it would be erotic. Right. So, um, and that would be all right. But um, you, you don't you don't want um, you don't want everybody arguing about which direction um, there should be an ending. I don't know if you ever saw any of those Czechoslovakian black box theater uh, experiments where um, the seats were wired for the audience, and then they could all choose what happens next. Did you ever see any? No, of that? no. Big thing in the '60s and the '70s. The these the Czechoslovakian theater companies did this, um, and I went to one. And all that happened was the audience wound up choosing the most boring and the most obvious choices. Um, they didn't go out on a limb of where they wanted the scene to go. So but that, is that you know, does you, that say more about Czechoslovakia than it does about the idea? I mean, suppose it was in America. Well, I, I, I don't I don't think that would be true. It'd probably be even worse in America, frankly. Um, the, the Czechs are, are, I know a lot of Czech people, and the Czechs are actually very interesting and very unusual. They make unusual choices in a lot of things. So um, I know, know that. Do, have you ever played Flight Simulator? No, I played Fight Simulator, which is a completely different thing. <laughs> I mean, I whenever I play flight simulator i always make sure to occasionally crash into a building i don't think people in czechoslovakia would do that so i think i would if i could vote on the direction of a play or a movie i would probably invite more conflict and shame and hurt yeah i i the the piece that i saw was kind of lightweight to begin with um you know, was it wasn't Hamlet, but um, uh, no, I, I don't think there's a lot of room for um, anything but autocracy in the arts, um, except to protect people who are working there from abuse. Right. But I don't think I don't think everybody should sit. All the actors should sit around in a movie production and say to you know, Mr. Spielberg, "Well, I think the ending should be this." Right. Well, I think the ending should be that. I, there's just no room for that. Well, they actually do, though. You know, we're again. Well, they te they test the movie. They they'll take it out to it's pass it. That's the audience that decides, not the actors. I'm sorry. That's the audience that decides, not the actors. You know, in many the ways, worker, the workers don't decide at at a at a screening um, right. what's right or wrong with the movie, um, but the audience does. I'm not sure I even like that particularly, but when millions of dollars are at stake, I guess you have no choice. So there is something. Let me let me retract what I just said. I'm glad you do that. There is something democratic about comedy because if you're not getting laughs, you're David Feldman. Yeah, if you're not getting laughs, you're not you're getting, doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong, right? Or you're doing it wrong from a marketing point of view, from the marketplace point of view. You might be doing it right. So if we elected but, people based on laughs. I'm sorry? If we elected our politicians based on how hard, how big a laugh they got. Well, there have been examples of uh, comedians who have become uh, leaders in their country, right? Right. There was a South, somewhere in South America, there was a comic. Um, somewhere in Europe, there was a comic. What about um, Iceland? Not Hunt. Sorry? Didn't Iceland elect a comedian? I think Iceland elected a comedian. Ukraine. Zelensky is a comedian. That's what, that's what I was thinking of. Zelensky. And they've done well in terms of their relationship with Russia. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, the, the comic knows what they're doing. Right. Um, He's not negotiating yeah. with Yakov Smirnov. That's, that's the problem. But based on la what makes people laugh the hardest, if, if, if you campaigned... If you, if we voted based on what makes people laugh the hardest, then we would be America would be a deeply segregated, misogynistic, war filled, 
gun toting. America would be what America is. Well, it is now. You just yeah. described America. Very good, Dave. I think that's fantastic. No, but when you when you bring this up, I just start to get nostalgic and think how much I wanted to see Al Franken uh, debate Donald Trump and what an amazing debate that would have been because he alone, he alone was the only person even close to running who had that kind of sense of humor. And I think a, a, a guy like Trump can only be dealt with with a sense of humor because Trump ironically sees himself as a funny guy. He is. Yeah. Oh, I, I think, honestly, I, I'm not trying to say this because we're doing a show. This is this is my heart. I mean this from the I, I, I swear to you, I believe this. I watch his rallies and I think he is as entertaining as any comedian who can fill an auditorium. Maybe he's as entertaining, but that doesn't mean he's as funny. Um, I think he's funny. different. I so? think he's funny. He acts out the bits. He does voices. Yes, that's right. He, he does all those things. But when, when you work with a young comedian, what you always have to tell that young comedian is the most important thing is your likability. And because he comes across as such a self-satisfied, smug prick, um, it's very hard for him to have that vulnerability that will sell any real comedy. May I disagree so, with you? May I disagree? Okay. I believe that if I worked with him and he weren't Donald Trump, he was just the mentally ill Donald Trump, but with no... And he had that demeanor. And if I said to him, even if you're bombing, pretend, act as if you're killing. Don't let them get to you. That he yeah. could, uh, in a year, he would be one of the best comics who ever did it. If, as long as he never yeah. admitted defeat. He's out of a job. He's probably looking for something. Why don't you and I make an approach? We yes. could... Uh, you know, we could turn him into something. We'll start him off in the smaller clubs in Canada. He will him off in the smaller countries. Uh, and, you know, he'll he'll get a reputation there. And then we can bring him up to, uh, to play the big room, which is America. You know, you could get a lot of publicity. He's not selling well with Bill O'Reilly. He's going around the country and ticket sales aren't good. You should make him an offer to give up his American citizenship, do America a favor come to Canada, I can arrange it, and I will manage your, I, you will work forever. You'll work all my clubs, and I, well, anyway. Well, we've seen, we've seen non-comics uh, do, com do comedy, and usually it doesn't work very well. Um, like, you know, you remember I was Timothy Leary's agent up here in Canada when he was doing comedy clubs, and he was fascinating. But I wouldn't exactly call it stand-up comedy. Um, I did the same thing with Wadey Gravy. Do you remember Wadey Gravy? Sure. Hugh yeah. Romney. Yeah, Hugh Romney had an amazing charity that he was doing. He was doing it all for for, for a charity, uh, which was the Eyeball Project, where he was, um, I think, buying glasses for people in Africa who could not afford glasses. Um, and also, he was really interesting. But was he funny? Well, you know. And there's, and there's lots of other examples of that. Did you do LSD with Timothy Leary? Of course. How could I not? And was he a good, what do they call them, Sherpas? What do you call somebody who guides you through a trip? Yeah. Um, um, I know what you mean. Yeah. It was he a good guide. We can just say, was he a good guide? And the answer is yes, he was fabulous. Um, I remember we um, everything seemed, seemed like a cartoon. We went, it was, a, it was a hot summer night and we went for the longest walk and we walked into a friend, a friend was having a dinner party and we walked into her dinner party. And first of all, she freaked out that, you know, obviously Timothy Leary was there and we could not stop laughing. We couldn't even have a conversation with anybody because we were just laughing so hard. And at one point I remember I was lying on the carpet of the, um, of, of the dining room rolling around laughing i couldn't stop laughing wow that was like the first time i ever smoked pot 
could not stop laughing. Could not stop um, laughing. I, I don't remember that. I just remember um, I felt a little uh, dizzy, so somebody gave me a sponge uh, to put on my on my forehead, and I thought it was a piece of bread, and I tried to eat it. <laughs> and then I actually got in my car, my parents' car, because I'm still living at home, and I drove home like at four miles an hour. I, I got home. And my, uh, my, we lived with my brother-in-law, and my brother-in-law was the accountant for Sara Lee Cheesecakes. And really? He would, often freeze, he would get free cheesecakes if they printed the label wrong or something. So our freezer was stuffed with cheesecakes. So I took the cheesecake, and I ate the entire <laughs> cheesecake. <laughs> oh, right? The next morning, my mother said to me, Mark, well, there was a cheesecake I was going to defrost. Where is it? I said, well, I, I had it. She said, you had the whole cheesecake? And I said, well, no, I had friends over. <laughs> and one fork? <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a, a son. Yes. What is your terror? Do you have the same terror we have in the United States about climate change? Democracy. I mean, you're not losing your democracy. You're worried about America losing its democracy, right? But you're not. You're no. We're not worried about that. My 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 fears for my son are much more prosaic. Um, like, uh, will he become a good student? Uh, right. Will he find something he loves to do with his life? Um, how much struggle will he have in his life? To have no struggle is not good. Right. Have too much. It's also not good. You have to have some kind of, you know, there's a strike zone for struggle. I feel my life has been full of struggle. And if I had to sum up my life, it would be struggle, triumph, repeat. <laughs> struggle, repeat. Right. Because for most people, it's struggle, fail, repeat. So I think at least in my life, I've had I've had that as a as a positive thing, but to think that there's no struggle in my life, I've always struggled and I've always been aware of my struggles ever since I was, you know, five years old. Right. Life is come life. Easy. Some people, some people, you know, life is like applesauce. Some people it just, you just have that, that applesauce that just goes down so easy. And for other people, it's kind of chunky and it gets stuck. I, you know, so I, I always say life is like applesauce. Sometimes you can spread it on your genitalia and get to, see another side of your dog yes that's so true <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can really get to know know your dog in a, a much closer closer way as roman polanski once said to me life is just a bowl of cherries <laughs> but, <laughs> and that bowl is robert evans or no jack nicholson's hot tub was it Jack Nicholson's hot tub? Yeah, I believe it was. Oh, oh, maybe it was Robert Evans. I think it was, it was Nicholson. Robert Evans. You sure? Or did the no. Nichols, Nick, was Nicholson and Evans? Maybe they were. They were friends. They were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Evans made Chinatown for one brain, right. so they must have been. Right. Well, any resolutions? Uh, yeah, not really. Not really. I, 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 I'm going to work out. I'm not going to work out. Right. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nicer to homeless people. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not going to do this. Right. Uh, whatever, whatever I would come up with, I would, I would not follow anyway. So what is the point? I was talking what to my friend. Point? What is the point of New Year's anyway? I've never really understood it. And, you know, until I started working New Year's when I became a comic, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. This false frivolity based on some calendar change as if we're all going to be different because we flip the calendar over is ridiculous. Just right. ridiculous. Well, you, uh, Humbert College teaches comedy and you've given lectures to potential club owners and you've given the best advice any anybody has ever given club owners. I, I, I've, well, I have a drink machine in the room. I'm sorry? 
No blender drink. No blender drinks in the room. Yes, you're right. That's the best. No, you say every New Year's Eve, make sure you hand out the noisemakers before the show starts. That's the first. Yes. That's yes. It's all night long yes. and drive people to crazy. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I really don't. I really don't like New Year's. I think it's. I think life is an aesthetic continuum, and the worst part of New Year's is that it actually provides hope. And if there's anything I can't stand, David, you know me, it's hope. Yes. Here's here's a, an idea. I was talking to my friend Andy, Andy Breckman, last night, and I said the problem with New Year's resolutions is you have to keep them for a year. What if we just had New Day resolutions, or mm -hmm. like or a resolution for like I resolve for an hour that I'm not going to smoke cigarettes. I resolve yeah. for an hour that I'm going to exercise. That's an excellent idea, but I think it should be expanded to more things like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but I think all marriages would work if they were only for a day. Yeah. A hundred percent success. Maybe, maybe for you. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think a woman could stay married to me for an entire day yeah. with me. Or even a day. With oh, I'm. It'd be a no, nightmare. David, you sleep in there, there right away. Now you're now you're up to like three in the afternoon. You're halfway there. Yeah, but I would cheat on her. By I'm just making a joke. Uh, yeah. I don't want to go there. Uh, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we ask our audience in the Zoom room to make yes. a resolution for the next hour? Put it in the chat room, make a resolution, and then I'll check in with you later and you can tell me how your resolution is going. Instead of it being a year, it should just be, you know, a day. Yeah, I like that idea. Tell me about comedy in Canada. What's happening? Oh, the worst day of my life. I had the worst day today. They've shut everything down again. We're in complete and total lockdown as of Wednesday for three weeks. No restaurants, no shows, no uh, comedy clubs, nothing. Everything is shut down. Everything is shut. Pretty much everything is shut down. You can go grocery shopping. Our... Wow. Closed. And the weather's cruddy. You know, it's really cold out. And, you know, our day was exciting. We went and we got, we drove to PetSmart and we got cat food for our cat. That was our exciting day. Uh, the schools are closed for two weeks. Jackson has to go on online learning, and we know that that doesn't work. So it's 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 rough. It's going to be rough for how, how many years do you think it's going to take before something eclipses this? I don't know, but it's really weird when you look back at 9-11 and think wistfully about how wonderful a day that was. <laughs> it's a nice autumn day. Mark Breslin is the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy club in North America, and it'll reopen soon, and everybody should support live comedy. And I look forward to talking to you next week, sir. Sounds good, David. Have a good one. This too shall pass. I remember my father said that on his deathbed and then he died. He said, this too shall pass. And then that was the last, those, that was his, those were his dying words. My father used to say that when he was constipated. <laughs> you mean every day of his life? Thank you, Mark. <laughs> let's, let's go to Los Angeles where Howie Klein is standing by. He is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for progressive candidates here in New York City. We're going to meet somebody who's running for New York's third congressional district, I believe. Is that correct, Howie? Uh, unfortunately, you were breaking up while you were speaking, so I couldn't hear all your words. Oh, how I don't know what you're asking is correct. Are you asking me about where Melanie is from? Is it the third congressional district here in New York? Right. So it, it's so the district is the North Shore of Long Island, and it goes from 
um, Suffolk County, right through Nassau, and into Queens. Now, the district is being with, uh, redrawn right now, so we, no one is positive, but it's likely that it's going to be it's going to move further into Queens and maybe less into Suffolk. But it, it, it's you know people think of it as the North Shore of Long Island, and, and um, even though there's a lot of people in Queens, a lot of people in Suffolk, uh, a lot of people think it's a it's a Nassau County district, which is not. Tom Swasey is the current congressman, a, a very conservative Democrat, and he's uh, he's going to run for governor, so he's not running for the seat again, so it makes it an open seat. And Melanie, who's going to be our guest now, uh, is is currently the front runner in that race. Great. So we actually have a progressive front runner, which is extremely rare. Great. And uh, is Melanie with us? She's with us. Yes, she is. And we're going to raise money for her today. I hope so. We're going to raise a lot of money for Melanie. Good. Let's do it. Yes. And I think the best way to do it is, is for Melody to come on and tell us a little bit about um, herself and why she's running. And the best way, while, while she's talking, she, she needs to unmute herself, go to, how do you pronounce Darigo? Is that how it's pronounced? Darigo. Yeah, Darigo2022.com. Darigo2022.com, D-A-R-R-I-G-O, 2022.com, and give her money. If you heard the first 90 <laughs> minutes of my show, this is what you need to do. You need to give her money. Fighting for the families of Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. Thank you, future Congresswoman Melanie Darigo. Go ahead, Howie. Hey, Melanie, how you doing? Hey, Howie, how's it going? Hi, David. Thanks for having me here tonight. Yes, well, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. And, you know, we, we are eager to make sure that our listeners get a feel for who you are and what's going to be the difference uh, between you and just another person who's trying to say, hey, vote for me, vote for me. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what's in store for um, the families um, in, in the, in the third district, if they elect you. Yeah. Well, um, again, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, my name is Melanie Dorigo. I am running for Congress in New York's third district. Uh, I spent my career as an allied health professional, which means I built uh, health improvement strategies for families, for patients and leader organizations to produce better health outcomes. So healthcare is very important to me. Uh, I'm also a nonprofit co-founder and a community organizer and a mom of three. I've been organizing with, for issues like universal health Healthcare, climate action, social justice issues, common sense gun safety legislation, repro rights, and I've made getting corporate money out of politics a central issue of my campaign. We need to look no further than the newspaper or the TV to realize the outsized influence of corporate money in our political system and how it's always working against us. Uh, so I'm a grassroots funded candidate. Uh, we've been doing really well organizing in the district. Uh, for, for the listeners, I did run in this for this uh, seat last cycle. Uh, we got a little under 30% of the vote for a first time candidate that's actually exceptional. Uh, so we're back to finish what we started to finish the job and start putting people first and fighting for our families. Okay, and last time you ran, you were running against an incumbent. This time you're running um, uh, for an open seat. And this time people have heard your name and know who you are. Last time they didn't. Right. Right. And I think, look, you know, in the last election, we were able to build I, what I think is a pretty impressive coalition of support. Uh, and I think this time relaunching the campaign, it, it has given us this advantage because we when we relaunched, all that support came back and we've been able to really build on that support. So at this point in the race, uh, I have 15 endorsements and, and we're you know getting more endorsements, it seems like every single week, which is wonderful. Um, I'm actually the first candidate of the cycle to be endorsed by brand new Congress by, um, uh, excuse me, um, I don't know why I just had a, a little bit of a blank out there, um, by the National Organization for Women, Moms in Office, Progressive Women of New York, the New York Progressive Action Network, and a slew of others. 
Uh, it was recently endorsed by National, Indivisible, and Blue America. So we're very excited. And uh, we're just going to keep on building until uh, we not only win in June, but win in November. And then we're going to keep on fighting and make sure that we can pass progressive policies that help all of us. Well, speaking of progressive policies that help all of us, one one question that I've asked some um, candidates in the past that people like, and, and I've gotten a lot of feedback saying, oh, that's a good question, you know, ask other people that. So I'm going to ask you now. <laughs> uh, okay. Not long ago, there was a, a, a contentious battle over strategy in Congress about how to hold the line or not hold the line and passing uh Joe Manchin's hard transportation bill or holding or hold it up until he agreed uh, to pass the social infrastructure bill. Now, I, I know from the stuff I've heard from you that you're a big fan of the social infrastructure, infrastructure bill and what's it and the stuff that's in that bill. But in terms of strategy, there were only six Democrats um, who, who voted uh, against going forward. Uh, would you have been one of those six? Do you do you know? Do you have any inkling of that? I, I I would have been, and I had been saying as much for months and months. Um, you know, I think that uh, obviously, listen. You know, Donald Trump traumatized a lot of Americans, and I think that there was this craving to return to some type of normalcy. And I think you know some of what we're combating right now is is trying to figure out. Well, wait, what was normal? Because Donald Trump was against voting rights, but yet we can't seem to pass any voting rights. Donald Trump didn't want to pass paid leave, but we can't seem to pass paid leave now, right? So I, I think we're struggling with what that looks like. Uh, but I think for many Democrats in particular, uh, they put all their faith and fought and did what they could. They wrote postcards. They Some knocked doors. Some made a lot of phone calls. They donated money uh, to make sure that we won the House, we won the Senate, and we won the White House. And here we are, and we're not able to pass anything. Uh, you know, I, I have to say, and I, you know, as easy as it is to Monday morning quarterback, I think that the six were absolutely right to hold the line and and you know of course it's easy to say that now that we've seen joe manchin go back on his word which is you know what i think most of us who are paying attention thought would happen right i and i i, I i'd be remiss if i didn't point out that your district and aoc's district share a common border in queens yeah so we have a little intersecting point as it stands today. We'll see if that changes or shifts, but we're either way, we're very, you know, geographically quite close. Right. And she was one of the six, of course, who, who refused to vote for um, the hard infrastructure bill. Without can, I ask you a mm -hmm. yeah, can I ask you a question, Howie? Sure. So, oh, uh, sure. and, and Melanie, I made the mistake of not having AOC on the show when she was a candidate. Howie, looking at this race, she, Melanie has a very good chance of winning, doesn't she? Yes, I, like I said, I, 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 when I look at the race, I see that Melanie is um, a front runner, is the front runner in the race, both in the primary and in the general election. I, I from what I read over the weekend, it looked like, wow, she's, <laughs> a year from now go ahead please so that just means you have to have me back once i win david yeah well we'll see if you want to come back <laughs> usually when they're I elected make a point no we're listen we i i recognize that it's it's all the supporters along the way you know this is this is ne winning an election is never about a single candidate right it's always about the the entirety of all the supporters it's it's every phone call it's every door knock it's every donation it's every interaction where we can uh, reach out to voters right it's all of us that get us there it's, it's never about one single person and i never ever forget that because i think it's it's just very important for the movement uh at least for a sustainable movement right All right go ahead howie with, with, you said you were going to ask me a question but i, I didn't oh, no, the question was this is somebody who is going to congress there's no question yes uh, we, well we, we certainly hope so now that doesn't mean that people should slack off She's going to go to Congress if she keeps getting the kind of support that she needs to win this election. So, you know, that's not just donating. Jo donating is very important, but she needs volunteers as well. She needs people to do everything that makes a campaign tick. And Melanie, is there a uh, is there a volunteer page on your website? 
Yes, absolutely. If you go to if you go to the regular homepage, there's um, a little menu bar. So Dorigo 2022, D-A-R-R-I-G-O 2022.com. And you can sign up to volunteer. Great. And, and, and what would volunteer what would someone volunteering do? I mean, like take someone who's who lives in the district first. Tell us what you would want them to do and, t- and then tell us what uh, people from around the country would do uh if they were to volunteer like someone in california yeah yeah Uh, so in district obviously omicron is throwing a little bit of a wrench in our plans but uh hopefully in a couple of weeks you know we'll be out knocking on doors talking to voters that's very very important uh hosting events whether it's via zoom and actually that's something you can do uh, from anywhere in the country uh but in district we can certainly do it in home or in a backyard uh in terms of you know broader volunteers uh, there's always a job i always tell everyone if you want to get involved in the campaign i promise i have have a job for you because we can always use more folks and it can manifest in a variety of ways you know uh, folks can help out in particular aspects whether it's um, you know with data work it's um, potentially with comms it's writing letters to the editor uh, it could be phone banking volunteers it could be uh, helping outreach uh, outreach to voters over the phone there's there's always jobs to do so it, it's sort of we we what we like to do in the campaign like we certainly have needs but we also so for our folks who really want to volunteer and become, uh, you know, ongoing volunteers, we like to find out what they like to do. And then we'll sort of place them in an area of the campaign where they can get something out of it. And we're getting something out of it as well. Great. I know that Biden uh, won your district, right? He beat Trump there. Mm-hmm. Yes. By like 10 points or something. Um, it was a little less, uh, but here's the thing about this district, right? I think there was, uh, it, it, it can be tumultuous, but uh, mostly what we found, and I've knocked, you know, over the years, tens of thousands of doors in this district, our voters are craving a representative or leadership that is going to fight for them and prioritize their needs. And we just really haven't had a strong representative to do that. And of course, you know, um, with with the presidential election, I think there was um, a bit of burnout. But yeah, I mean, you know, de- definitely it's a blue district. It's been a blue district for over 20 years. And, you know, we're waiting for redistricting at the moment. We do anticipate it likely getting bluer. But, you know, regardless if it gets bluer or not, we feel really confident confident about where we are and the work that we've done already at this point. And we know we're about to uh, really enter that, you know, home stretch of the primary now where it's just, you know, nonstop voter outreach. We're feeling very good about it. So I've lived in both Nassau and Suffolk County, Suffolk County when I was uh, in college, but I lived there for four years and uh, I was younger when I lived in Nassau County. But it, I, I, I want to I don't know the people who, who, you know, I know some, but I don't, I don't know the people the way you know them who, who do live in your district now. And I want to ask you, when, when something is brought up uh, that's like a contentious uh, issue, like, I don't know, take uh, Medicare for all, what, what kind of response do you get uh, f- from that? Do people, are people? Do people say, yes, we really need that? Or do they say, yeah, it's too expensive, uh, leave me alone? Well, you know, I think one thing that we have done really well and consistently as a campaign, and this is both in the 2020 cycle and now in the 2022 cycle, uh, is that we have had a very strong voter education model. Uh, We've always worked to bring, uh, you know, supporters and voters in as opposed to ostracizing them, right? Just because we think one way and they think another, let's have a real conversation and let's meet them where they're at. Um, And so, yeah, I think, you know, if you're not in the room with someone and and someone hears a snippet from the news that tells them that they should think one way about something like, for example, Medicare for all, I think this has really shifted. Um, Let's the first time I started running, it was pre pandemic. And I think it was a little bit harder on an issue like Medicare for all. But I'll tell you, we have had so much success. And and what I have done is not walk in with the buzzwords, right? So the 
Medicare for all, that phrase can be triggering for folks. I, you know, I don't know why, but it can be. Uh, and so I would go into a room and I would say, let's talk about health care. What if we had a system that where there were no deductibles and there no were there were no co-pays and it, you know, included long-term care and hearing aids and dental? What if we had a system like that? And then I would talk about it and I would go into depth and then I would get everyone in the room shaking their head like, yeah, well, that sounds great. And then I would tell them, well, we actually do have a proposed piece of legislation that would do just that. And then I would say it's Medicare for all. And you would see almost, you know, the total shock. Um, and, and, and that's how we would bring folks in, you know, because we would sort of disarm any preconceived notions they had about a particular policy. And we did this across the board for a variety of policies. And then we'd have folks come and ask us questions. And, and believe it or not, over the course of the years, we've had uh, supporters who said, you know, I support you because I like what you're doing, but I'm not, I don't support Medicare for all. And then over time, after having several conversations with me and with the campaign, they changed their mind because all their questions were answered. And we create this safe environment to allow people to learn without ostracizing them. And I'll tell you, uh, it's a very successful model. Yeah, well, that's a good way to do campaigning instead of just sitting on the phone calling donors all the time. But um, do, do you, I mean, I feel like... A, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Are, are most of the people who live in your district homeowners? Uh, yes, there, it's a very high uh, home ownership district, but we do have a lot of renters as well. But it is is primarily homeowners. Because and the reason I'm asking that is because homeowners always seem to be a little bit more adverse uh, to uh, to programs that that they fear will make their taxes go up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I think, listen, nobody wants to pay more taxes, right? If we did a survey, I don't think there's a person. Well, there are. There are a few now. Now there are. But maybe 10 years ago, they would say, no, I don't want to pay taxes. Um, but I, 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 again, I go back to if you can educate a voter base and and, and tell them exactly where their money is going. And, and, and look, there are proposed models for how we pay for Medicare for all. There's tons of studies now at this point that would show that not only would we save you know, 450 Fifty billion dollars a year. We'd save sixty-eight thousand lives a year. And I think when we talk to folks like that and show them, well, look, you know, you pay a deductible every month. And I think we tend to not remember our deductible that we're paying because it comes out of most of us. It comes out of our paychecks, and we don't even think about it as an actual cost, right? But it is. And I think once we're able to educate folks on that and show them exactly how it works, it makes a lot of sense because, frankly, um, you know. Uh, universal health care medicare for all is not a radical proposition in, in my opinion it is the most pragmatic policy it's it's fiscally and morally responsible and it, and frankly if it were a, if, if we were a corporation and someone pitched this idea and said hey we're going to save lives and we're going to save all this money it would be heralded as a huge success right so uh, i think our our biggest challenge is really just trying to break through the misinformation and the noise Right. And people, a lot of people get uh, their information from Fox News, right? A large numbers of people. Is that is that the case in your in your district? Is that where is, are people getting their information from Fox? Um, I, I don't know too many Democrats these days uh, that are that's getting their information from that particular source. Uh, but certainly there are a fair amount of Republicans that are. And, and that, I think, is unfortunate. You know, um, I think Nielsen ratings doesn't even classify Fox News as a news source. It's classified as entertainment. And I wish more folks knew that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Mm hmm. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, Howie, we, we've knocked doors, and, and, and I think I may have mentioned this to you, and, and this is not uncommon. When we're out in the field knocking doors, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly common to, for, for someone to answer the door and not be the person you're looking for. It's their spouse, and they're a Republican. Uh, and when we have conversations, and, and they're you know, meeting them where they're, well, tell me about your issues. Well, I'm not, a, I wouldn't vote for a Democrat. Okay, well, what do you care about? And you start to have a real substantive conversation. We've flipped voters at the door. We've had Republicans change their registration to support us. Uh, and I think it's because most people truly want the same thing. 
things. We want good schools. We want a livable planet. We want good health care. You know, these we, we want jobs, right? These are, I, I think there's a lot more in common uh, than we realize. And right now, um, you know, media is is very divisive and it's it's really tearing us apart. But I think um, it, it's really that work, you know, and it's hard because it's grinding work to be out there every day knocking those doors, but it works. Do you mind if I, I'd like to ask you a question? The the incumbent who's running for for governor's how do you pronounce Suizi? Suizi. Has, has he endorsed you? He's very no, he very conservative. Not. not to endorse anybody. So, I go to capitaltrades.com and I keep track of Democratic congressmen and Republicans, but it's mostly Democratic Congress people who are trading on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Should he be trading close to $7 million? He made 155 trades in 2021, totaling $6,500,000 going in and out of a question uh, that's a more of a general question than just about Swazi. Uh, he's one of many, many. I mean, why don't we make it about Pelosi, who's 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 trading hundreds of millions of dollars between her and her husband? I don't know if I'm right about that hundreds of millions, yeah. but many millions of dollars in um, uh, on the stock market. So the, really the question that I think you want to ask, David, is um, should members of Congress be, tr be trading on the stock market? Especially if they're if they're in, in committees or or even an ability to vote on the floor of the house uh, that it, that has some influence on uh, the value of those stocks, is that something that you've thought about at all, Melanie? Absolutely. Um, you know, the the incumbent was uh, is currently on the House Ways and Means Committee, and you know, quite literally, is writing tax laws for the corporations that fund him. Uh, and there's something fundamentally flawed about that. Uh, you know, and I, I I certainly don't want to make this conversation about him. He's no longer my opponent, but he and several other congressional representatives uh, were just found in violation of the Stock Act for not reporting their trades. And I, I think that that is, I mean, I don't know how that happens at that level, but clearly it, it has been happening. So that's being investigated. Uh, it's my personal opinion that I don't believe that um, congressional members should be trading. I mean, look, certainly they're allowed to have an account, but put it in a blind trust and let someone do it. But I, I do not think with the information that they're receiving, receiving, they should be allowed to continue in this manner. And I mean, you look at Congress and look what happens, right? You look at my incumbent, um, you know, he's, this is his third cycle and you've seen his wealth balloon three or four times in, you know, in the amount of time he's been in Congress. Now I'm not saying, you know, for sure that that is what he's done, but um, it, it's just, I don't think that they're, uh, I, I don't think we should be doing that. I don't think we should be trading uh, while we're getting all of this information and certainly writing laws that could potentially um, benefit the companies that we're trading or buying stocks in. Should we know what candidates are worth and in the Democratic Party? Should it be a detriment if they're worth too much? You know, it's a good question. I think um, when we look at Congress and particularly a couple of cycles ago, it's gotten a little bit better. But um, when you look at Congress, there are a few characteristics that stick out, right? It's mostly old white men with nice ties, right, who, who have tremendous wealth. And I do think that that's a perspective that sure deserves a seat at the table but it definitely does not deserve all the seats at the table right so we certainly need a more diverse congress um and i think we have seen i mean it, look at the world that we live in we have seen what a congress uh, looks like when they legislate for those at the very very top uh and and you know we see it over and over and over again and i think it's why we are unable to pass this reconciliation bill there's no no real substantive reason why Joe Manchin would vote against this reconciliation bill. Uh, it's not about helping the people of West Virginia who who rank near, at the bottom of nearly every list in this country with health care, education, um, economic development, all of it, right? But he's a coal baron, and it goes against his personal interests, right? right? So I, I do think that there has to be some sort of checks and balance system. Now, again, I'm not saying that they, you know, there should be no wealthy people in Congress. There should be a mix. But, but the Democratic diverse, Party, country. this is something I feel very passionate about because 
Character mm -hmm. does count. And we judge a person's character by in politics on whether or not they cheat on their wives. That seems to be what brings <laughs> Democrats down. Shouldn't their character be measured by their net worth? Wouldn't wouldn't voters be better informed? <laughs> I'm being serious, Howie. Wouldn't wouldn't we do? Well, you know, you're being very, very general as well. I mean, I I agree with you. You know, most most rich people that I've come in contact with tend to be very greedy. The rich, the richer they are, the greedier they are. But it's not all all of them aren't like that. I mean, we certainly wouldn't have had FDR as president if, if you uh, had your uh, the David Feldman rule in place. Well. Well, I think I think that's true. If I could just real quick, he, you know, he was uh, personally he was poor. He had to borrow money from his mother, Sarah. He did not have money. He lived in his mother. I'm serious. He he was personally impoverished. Go ahead. Uh, from I rich, live in one of the wealthiest congressional districts in in the country, and what I can tell you is that yeah, look, I I don't think that there's one key factor that influences who you are as a person. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the election districts in 2020, uh, in it, very close to where I live, there's a, a, a wealthy area, and I had done some events, and I spoke to folks, and I spoke to them about a Green New Deal and Medicare for all, and, and very progressive, you know, policy, and. And I ended up winning that election district. And so, and these are very, very wealthy people, you know, wealth beyond what I could imagine. And so I, I think it's important not to just judge, you know, based on that one factor. Uh, but I think to your point, in Congress, there has to be a checks and balance system when, when their wealth is growing tremendously. And we should pay attention to that. We should know what Absolutely. our, we should know what our representatives what they're worth when they take office and what they're worth as they're about to leave office. Go ahead, Howie. You're right. We, and, and, and that's why uh, those records are publicly available. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's, um, I think it can be difficult to sleuth through, right? I mean, all the information is there, but I don't think the process is very clear to uh, the average constituent how one would you know, uncover what their congressional representative is worth and how their wealth grew and what did they invest in, right? And, and I think that that can be problematic. And I think we're seeing that, you know, with Joe Manchin right now. You're right. Uh, Congress writes those rules and they write them for their own benefit. So, you know, you know, even when you come to the definition of bribery, they take their own, their, their, their own um, behavior and they right around that so that what they do isn't part of bribery whereas everybody who looks at what they do knows exactly what it is it's bribery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it may be legal but that does not mean it's ethical we're, we're almost out of time i have three questions that i ask all the candidates okay okay uh did the taliban attack us on 9 11. no does Medicare for all mean putting health insurance companies out of business? Can we have Medicare for all and still have health insurance companies? Uh, no. no. Okay, forget it. You got my vote. Go. To <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Do you, in, do you live in the district? No, but I'm moving there. <laughs> those are those are I think the two most difficult questions for a politician to answer and most don't answer it that give you a much more difficult one especially in a district like melodies but there's no time for, to go into the uh the whole uh situation in israel so we'll have to do this another time go to darigo 2022.com d-a-r-r-i-g-o 2022.com Give her money. She's going to Congress. So give her money. D-A-R-R-I-G-O 2022.com. Melanie's going to win. She's endorsed by Howie Klein. That's all you need to know. She's endorsed by Howie. Give her money. Do you take corporate donations? No. Are you a multimillionaire? No. No. <laughs> Things would be a lot easier if I was, but no. <laughs> okay. The mother of three, but not a multimillionaire. So a millionaire in a different kind of way. 
That is true. I, I get a million kisses. <laughs> You're going to win. I, I believe so. I believe so. We're very excited. Uh, you know, we have to continue to grow the Progressive Caucus. We need to get folks who are fighting for us in office. It's the only way we're going to save our democracy. It's the only way we're going to create a future for us, our children and our grandchildren. Right. And well said. Howie, you get the last word. Thank you for Melanie. Last word is, is just uh, I want to just ask Melanie if she'll come back to celebrate with us when she wins the primary. Let's do it. The election is November 8th. When is the New York primary? June 28th. June 28th. You're going to win. I mean, I've gone over, you know, you you can win this thing. Oh, yeah. We can win this thing. We absolutely can win this thing. We're going to continue to work hard. So thank you to everyone who uh, listened to me tonight. And if you can support us however you can, whether it's a donation or you can volunteer, it, it would really go a long way with a campaign like ours. We're a grassroots candidate and uh, it, it's really about the people. So come on and join us and build with us. Thank you. Go to D-A-R-R-I-G-O so 2022.com. Give her money. Now, go. Howie Klein endorses her. That's all you need to know. Thank you, Melanie. Please come back. Thank you, Howie. Thank, Thank you. you, David. I'll see you next Thank you. Bye. Uh, Bye, Mel. Thank you. Follow Howie on Twitter at Down With Tyranny and read Down With Tyranny. And to find other candidates to support, go to the Blue America Pack or read Howie Klein. And right now, go to darigo2022.com, D-A-R-R-I-G-O, 2022.com. $5, $500. Give her money. It's what I talked about at the top of the show, that the revolution starts, and, and David Cobb will disagree with me on this, or maybe not, I was saying at the top of the show that the revolution starts within the Democratic Party, that there, we need people pissing into the tent. But uh, if you go in the tent and if the left cannot take back the Democratic Party, then they don't deserve to govern. If you if the left can't present to the American people a, a plan and a platform and work the levers of power and seize control of the Democratic Party. They don't deserve to seize control of the Senate, the White House, Congress and the Supreme Court. David Cobb, welcome. David Cobb well, uh, ran for president on the Green Party ticket and he managed Ralph Nader's presidential campaign in Texas. Welcome back. We didn't have you last week. That's true. So I want to say, David, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, and I love the uh, three questions that you boiled down to just two with Melanie. <laughs> right, that was uh, <laughs> the speed. Like you, like you, I noticed the immediacy of yes. her answers. Yes. The unflinchingness of her answers. And uh, that went a long way. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw the same thing you did. Thank you. Yes. It was like that was it. I the speed she knew the answer and i want i i yes it's the speed there was nothing political about that or nope. politics nope, she knew the that. answer right. yeah so what about right. that you're 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 i want to talk about whatever you want to talk about but some of the things i talked about at the top of the show was if we believe that the planet has 10 years then why do any long-term planning? That, that there's something crippling about being told the planet has 10 years. That's not really helpful because if we're in a state of emergency, we don't think clearly. Some of us do, some of us don't, right? Like, let's just be clear about that. Like there are some folks and look, uh, I, I, like, I'm not telling you these anecdotes to pat myself on the head. I like, I don't think it makes me better. I didn't do anything for it, but I can tell you, I have uh, sank on a shrimp boat where it looked like uh, I might uh, die. Uh, I have been uh, in a very severe earthquake coming from Texas to California 
uh, and, uh, you know, a 6.5 that made me think, you know, like I could die right here. And I've, uh, I've had a gun pointed up against my temple, uh, uh, a, uh, a revolver right up against my temple. Uh, so there are three occasions where I have been faced with my eminent demise, death. Uh, and I can tell you, David, like in each one of those times, I wasn't courageous. I want to be really clear about this. I'm not saying I was courageous. I'm saying I was laser focused, tunnel vision. Each time I just completely, my mind just immediately went to, I could die right here, here's what I should do. And again, not courage, uh, not uh, nothing, uh, nothing else, uh, but just here's what I should do to survive. Um, and I think that there are some folks who just sort of have that tendency. So I can just tell you, for me, the knowledge of the ecological crisis and the economic crisis and the political crisis, which all together are creating literally civilization-wide collapse, has got me just laser focused on what I think that we and I uh, should be doing. And to be clear, I have come to the conclusion that I have very little agency about the global or even the national level stuff. So that's the reason that I focus so much of my time at the local level, because I feel like there is agency and I feel like I, there are things that I can do to actually impact uh, the result. So like for me, I'll just answer your question. I actually find it helpful to have the clarity uh, of uh, the, the climate crisis and have scientists explaining what our window is. Uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have clarity that capitalism as an economic inst uh, system of how to organize the political economy is collapsing and being replaced with a, a, a version of crypto fascism. And I have clarity about why the political system is collapsing because it can't maintain order between these competing worldviews. Because again, they hence you've fascism. Hence, it is fascism. It you, is, you need fascism to maintain order. You, they have to. The neoliberals have to turn to fascism to maintain order. Or uh, some version of socialism, like like uh, like that, that, and that's the reason that I think that it like the center cannot hold. There's a great poem, right, that that uh, talks about it. But but it really is true. Again, I'm not in any way gleeful about this. I am simply assessing what. Okay, I so here I, I've, I've, I've hold on to your thought. Here is my critique of the people who have a critique for for capitalism. Looking, objectively listening to the conversations that we have on this show, the, the center cannot hold. There's going to be chaos. There's going to be rioting in the streets. There's going to be a complete loss of control. From, from most Americans' perspective, a majority of Americans, fascism promises order, at least temporarily. You can, you can make a case for even the, the Roman, the ancient Romans who gave us our democracy, our republic, had dictators. There, were, there was, they built into the Roman democracy, republic was a dictator during a time of crisis. Fascism was baked in to Roman democracy. Uh, what does socialism have to offer in terms of chaos and rioting in the streets? So uh, it, it's a fair question. And uh, I, I want to be how do you how do the uh, American people buy into socialism to calm the waters as, as, a, as a way to calm the waters? So what I would say is this, like to answer the question, we have to come to terms with the existential nature of the crisis that we're in. Like the center cannot hold. So one of the two ways to organize society are going to actually uh, become not just dominant, but the way we organize society. 
So my appeal to ordinary Americans is not to get caught up in labels or not to get caught up into uh, like a like what the left loves to do, uh, which is sort of uh, endless debate over precision of words, but to simply say what we are talking about is creating a society where everyone's basic needs are met, that we not just survive, but we genuinely thrive. Rich and meaningful lives organized around the principle that we're all in this together, everybody's needs have got to be met, and, and here's the kicker, everyone has the right and responsibility to offer their gifts as labor. We all have skills, we all have talents, and the right hates to acknowledge it, but most people want to give labor and they want to give those gifts. What it means is to give up the illusion of a kind of power that somehow your success comes from exploiting or oppressing others. It is a reminder that the, 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 the human impulse, I mean, we exist as a species, David, we have survived as a species as basically as collaborators. You know, the, 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 uh, it, it's pretty clear that Homo sapiens sapiens, like us, has been around for 200 to 300,000 years, right? Like that's just more or less it. We would not have survived as a species if we did not collaborate, uh, if we had not engaged in some version of power with dynamics. This way that we are currently organized society in this very clear top-down power over way that we've been trained and taught and lied to uh, and that too many of us believe in fact are the quote natural order is actually unnatural. It's only at best of our two to 300,000 years at most it's probably a thousand years uh, uh, old or so. It is absolutely positively at the anomaly and our job is to speak, break it down without dumbing it down, right? Uh, to speak plainly and clearly about the fact that we are in an existential crisis, there is still time to act where your children and grandchildren can have a wonderful life but it's gonna require us to give up the, the billionaires. It's gonna require us to give up the hoarding of money, power, wealth, and decision-making authority. Um, and, and so that's, to me, ultimately, socialism is just economic democracy. I was reading about evolution about two weeks ago about how once we started cooking our food, our energy went from our stomach. We didn't have to chew all day. So then it made our brains bigger and we became smart. Fire made our brains bigger because the food, the energy went to our, to the, to growing out our brains. We didn't need big stomachs anymore. And That's so interesting. I, so I, I, let me, let me just finish. Let me, let me just finish. Hang on for one second. Cause it speaks to what you were just saying. Our brains grew larger. Our heads grew larger, which means that childbirth became more difficult to pass through a woman's whatever they call it. And so a woman, a female human cannot give birth alone. We're one of the few animals that needs help birthing a child. So as we got smarter, it necessitated collaboration. Otherwise, the woman would die during childbirth or the baby would die during childbirth because of our big, bigger brains. So the answer, I think, is if we're going to continue with hyper individualism, women need to have bigger openings to accommodate our skulls. The, 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 I, I, as a comedian, I saw you ask yourself if you should tell that joke. Well, I was thinking, and why did the, poorly. why didn't you women, why did, so, but uh, according to evolution, but here's the beauty of evolution. We evolved into a co more collaborative society 
instead of giving women wider openings to accommodate the head. Instead of, isn't that, evolution decided, well, the, the culture will evolve, will be more collaborative than give women wider openings for bigger skulls. So I don't know the study that you're describing. I make right? most of this uh, stuff. I make most of this stuff up, but it's good. No, it's good stuff. And and honestly, David, uh, I, I'm I'm I, I enjoy these conversations uh, because they challenge me. So one thing that I would ask you for real is uh, to to drop me an email with uh, whatever you were reading about this around right. food because that's a very intriguing idea. And I'll ask you. Have you ever heard of the stoned ape hypothesis? The the ape smoking dope? Not smoking dope, actually psilocybin mushrooms. Terence McKenna, uh, who wrote a book called Food of the Gods, had this idea that uh, the, the evolution uh, is that it was the consumption of psychedelic uh, funguses uh, that played a crucial role in the development of both the human mind and culture. Um, and I, it's just I, a very idea. The what what it is is, I haven't heard about psilocybin. I've heard about it with uh, grain alcohol. That once they began fermenting, once somebody mixed water with wheat, it created bread and beer. Mm. And once, right. but, 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 so so I'm going to interrupt you because I I know about uh, like. The, how beer was developed. But remember, what's interesting about both the fire uh, theory that you just described, and and I'm going to call it McKenna's theory because it's not mine, but the one on psilocybin is tied to when the human brain really had that big explosion. Had consciousness. Because, of, of consciousness, because one thing that we do know is that it was like hominids, right? Before Homo sapiens sapiens, but hominids, the, the, the brain tripled in sides, uh, more or less. Uh, and I think, and I'm gonna, I, I'm really rough on the numbers, but you know, a million years or so ago when hominids really began. Uh, and uh, so it could be either the cooking of food or it could be uh, the, uh, uh, the use of mushrooms that actually uh, did that. And we do know that there was a creative explosion that happened about 40,000 years ago um, that was just prior to the migration from Africa to Europe. And that could either be, again, psilocybin or beer or some other thing. But to me, these are all incredibly interesting. I think the beer, I, I go with the beer. I think you drink, you, you get beer and you say, I'm not wandering anymore. I'm just sitting, I'm just sitting back. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. No more, no more nomad for me. I'm, I'm just staying put. Let's raise some animals and grow this crap right here. And, 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 and figure out a way to play sports. Right, and so, beat people uh, up. So, so one thing that I do wanna uh, sort of circle back to is the fascism. And I did, I did see that, boy, that, that got a lot of conversation going on your comment section. Uh, I know you always warn me not to read it, uh, but I can't help myself. I, 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 and I find a lot of the, uh, oftentimes I go back and reread these comments good. after I, I come good. up there. Yeah. It's good stuff. But the thing that I really want to underscore, uh, David, is that fascism as a political ideology is emerging, not just in the United States, but around the entire world. And it's emerging for a reason because it, it, fascism is not merely totalitarianism. It's not just jackbooted thugs. It's not just racist cops killing people of color. I mean, these are all horrific things, right? But fascism is a particular hyper-nationalism associated with how to organize the political economy. Uh, and it is uh, it appeals at, at, at certain times when there is chaos. And we are in, a, just like in the 1930s, the entire global economy was more or less uh, evolving or morphing from agrarian society to, to some version of what we now know as industrialism, right? Uh, and it wasn't clear, what would that be? Oh my God, and everybody was sort of feeling chaotic. And the fascist and the hyper-nationalist had a, they had a plan and they 
They they asserted that plan, right? Remember, uh, and they appealed to people around that nationalism. By the way, the same thing that Trump and other like neo Confederates and outright fascists uh, are outlining today because we know that society is in a sense of chaos. And here's the thing, David, I don't know if you caught this. I just want, let me finish this because it's really, to me, it's super important. NPR had retired two-star U.S. Major General Paul Eaton on to talk about a recent uh, co-op-ed where he feared an actual military coup uh, uh, after the 2020. Right, he wrote that with Chaguba, General Chaguba, who looked into Abu Ghraib, and they're very, they're worried about soldiers taking arms against other soldiers. So, like, I just want to say, when NPR has a two-star major general opining about this. We have to take this very, very seriously. And what gets me, like what, what terrifies me is I see fa- like what we're talking about is fascism coming about not as a result of a successful coup a la the, the, the January 6th insurrection, which is what it was, but actually using the electoral process to have fascists actually get elected, quote, legally. I'm not gonna call it democratic elections because our electoral system is so profoundly flawed. We could get into that on another show. But I would say that using the legal process, we have a distinct possibility that like a fascist element of the Republican Party will have control of the US Congress uh, by November of this year uh, and the presidency in 2024. And what terrifies me is that the leadership of the Democratic Party and the neoliberals are not rising to the challenge, not one damn bit. They they don't either understand the challenge. Uh, they are certainly not acting commiserate to the to, to the degree of the crisis that is being faced. And I don't know if it's because they don't have a plan or they would really rather side with fascists uh, than with socialists. Well, uh, but, but, but can I address that for a second? Yeah, I think it's pretty apparent that the Democrats, the Democratic leadership lacks the vocabulary to address the rise of fascism in America because they are the reason People are turning to fascism. What they have cr- they have created the vacuum in this country. The Democrats, not the Republicans. The Republicans are fascists. They've gone full bore full bore fascists. The the Democrats have created the vacuum. They offer no alternative to fascism because they are the problem. In order for them to. Right. And- and so, so yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's why you hear me say it all the time. I engage in electoral politics, but I'm not an electoral fetishist because here is, and hello, Dr. Fraud. So such a pleasure. Hi. Happy New Year. Um, Happy New Year. Because here's what I think, uh, David, is that as fascism is emerging, uh, the solution to fascism is actually not going to be uh, uh, found merely at the ballot box. I do think that voting is a tactic that should be used. But I think the real way that you combat fascists, and by the way, it's not to punch a Nazi, right? And to be and, and to be very clear, I'm pro-punch a Nazi. I know that there are other people uh, on the left who are not. I, like, I believe that, like, Nazis will kill uh, people that I love and cherish. Fuck those people, right? Like I have literally, like, uh, like, uh, like, there may be some people who can find the humanity that's left uh, in such a person. I'm not that person, and I'm not going to waste my time doing it. I have a so, rotator like, cuff. <laughs> I would throw. I would break my rotator cuff if I punched a Nazi. So you go ahead. All I'm saying is. I'm not getting into the punch a Nazi pro or con because I think that's an irrelevant conversation. I think the real relevant conversation is how do we actually combat and ultimately overcome fascism? And I genuinely, sincerely believe the only way to do that is to create a society in which the seeds of hate and fascism 
cannot flourish, right? And that's the reason that you constantly hear me talking about what we're doing at Cooperation Humboldt, the solidarity economy work, the work that we're doing to actually give people meaningful work to do that actually makes them feel good about themselves and their community and that meets people's needs. That's how we combat fascism by, by like, there are always gonna be some cockroaches that are just hate-filled whatevers, right? Like, but, but that's a distinct minority it grows in periods of desperation and crisis and people are looking for what the answer is and honestly the neoliberal democratic party does not have an answer that's part of the problem so before we bring it i see dr harriet fraud let, let me ask this of dr harriet fraud i'll give her a proper introduction uh in a second <laughs> If you are lucky enough not to be, you know, evicted right now, we have an eviction crisis. If you're lucky enough not to be a homeless, be homeless. If you're lucky enough not to be a member of the LGBTQ community and fearing for your life and, and unable to find work because of how you were born. If you are, let's say, a vast preponderance of America, which is unable to come up with $500 for a medical mm -hmm. emergency, but somewhat, somewhat secure. Chaos can seem manufactured. This, this chaos, if you turn off the TV, if you don't listen to my show, if you don't read what's going on, chaos can seem manufactured is there an illusion of chaos that both sides create for their own benefit does the left scream of chaos because it it moves the needle in its direction does do the neoliberals scream chaos because it moves the needle in their direction how chaotic is america right now i went well, to get opinion, i'm it sorry it is chaotic because look it's a failing empire and the basic promise for white people who are headed in a family headed by a male was that each generation could do better than the, the previous one and that people would have a decent standard of living and a home that has failed even with two people we're lucky enough to get work, working full time at minimum wage. You can't afford a two bedroom apartment in any state, city or county in the United States. It's failed. It has failed its people and it becomes more unequal every day. And people are desperate, you know, terribly. Desperate, but is that chaos? Is, is, is there isn't there a difference between desperation and chaos? Are we it seeing ca so much chaos? I'm sorry. It's desperation because it isn't chaos. I mean, there isn't a corporate order in this society. It's breaking. Everything is breaking down, though. Nothing works. It's like a third world country. Nothing works. But right. it's orderly. It believe in it. Look, in France, when you want to go on strike in the university, you don't pick it outside. You just do only what's on your job description and nothing works. People have to care. They have to be invested. They're not. There's no point anymore. Five million people have decided to just drop out and do something else. 250,000 minimum are on strike and others are organizing to strike because it isn't working. And it isn't chaos, it's despair. And the people at the top are prospering, 400 billion were was earned by manufacturers of armaments alone during the recession people are desperate and unhappy but it isn't chaos it's just indifference and sadness and dysfunction does that and make it ripe for fa can fascism rise when yes it could just and from so desperation or do you do you don't you need disorder don't you need the streets erupting well, you need you need a sense 
that you need law and order to hold things together because they're falling apart. And that sense can be given by a movement that's an alternative, by a plan like Cooperation Humboldt, that's an alternative. Americans don't have alternatives. They don't have alternative visions. The anti-communist crusades of the 50s really smashed the left here. And class consciousness is just coming back. If Americans had a vast mass movement that held together all the disparate outrages of Black Lives Matter, of the sexual rights movement, of the Me Too movement, and basically of the right to a decent life and not indecent profiteering, I think the mass of movement would be, the mass would be galvanized. And I don't think it's chaos, it's despair and dysfunction. Right. But, you know, and there is crime, that's true, but there was crime before. There aren't more murders that much than there were before. Shootings are it's, up. So, I think it's really worth pointing out, Dr. Fraud, is that every time there has been a, a massive disruption, people automatically actually try to care for each other, right? Like that's, that's and right. again, like it tells me that most humans are actually decent. Most people right. are actually wanting to do the right thing. And I do believe that a, one of the real real uh, just heartbreaking realities of that anti-communist crusade of the 1950s has been the blunting of the revolutionary vision and imagination. And I see it honestly, David, uh, on uh, in your comment threads. I mean, the number of folks who immediately when somebody like myself or Dr. Broad uh, try to raise up the bigger, like we could actually win the whole enchilada, the number of people uh, who are, are like almost like the crabs in a bucket, right? Like, no, no, like get back into the play, the small ball of the Democratic Party and just electoral politics. Uh, and it's, it's it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking because that fails them again and again and again. Fail Bernie twice, that's who stabbed him in the back. We have to understand that. And we don't have an alternative vision. One of the reasons that workers are doing better in Europe and that they have fewer COVID cases and many fewer deaths from overdoses is because they do have an alternative to believe in. Overdoses and addiction went down by 75% when they legalized um, drugs in Portugal with its socialist, communist, and green connection for the last 12 to 15 years. It's become a, gent a much gentler, more civilized society. People have something to believe in. And I think that the United States now is in just a, a sad state. But when, but there's still so much kindness when people need it. There really is. I was walking up 14th Street and there was a very dark skinned black woman leaning against one of the buildings and there were five cops surrounding her. And they weren't a predatory cop energy. They were on their cell phones. I could see that something happened. She might have collapsed. And they were trying to get her help. And I felt so bad for her that I waved to her with my caring expression that I felt. And she blew me a kiss. That's there. Right. That kindness. And it, it's there in so many ways. The little gentlenesses between people. The kindness, if somebody stumbles, they help them stand up. So but the question I have, kindness. right, this was an interesting weekend for me because New Year's Eve was Friday night and we all got, we really got like a full, everybody just said, that's it. New Year's Day and Sunday, I think everybody I know just took time off. And I thought about the way I depict the world to my listeners and what the truth is, that I have an agenda. I think I have a moral imperative to point out all the suffering that's going on. And nothing is good enough in this country. And if you don't wake up every morning thinking about the suffering, then you're not helping anybody. I, I don't need anybody celebrating how great America is. That doesn't help anybody. Then I thought, well, what is the actual truth 
you know, what is the weather? You know, I can, I can find out what temperature it is, and they can tell me it's cloudy, it's sunny, climate change is real. What is the weather here in America, and what are we looking for? What kind of storm is coming in November? Because both sides are guilty of a st warning of a big storm, like the end of democracy, the flooding in the streets, chaos, chaos. And then you turn off the TV and you stop thinking. And like you said, you go outside, and you're on 14th Street, and this woman throws you a kiss. What is the weather? Are we dealing with reality and the truth? Is America really about to turn into the 60s? Uh, the, the we all want the 60s, yeah. You know, look, we it's not about to be fascist immediately. The January 5th people, many are going to jail. They're in disgrace in a lot of areas. But there are different possibilities. The United States is, is falling. And whether we can catch it with the left movement, whether the right will catch it, most people are not hateful fascists. New York City is a city of many people of many colors. People basically get along and are kind to each other. There are occasional predators, but, you know, it's when I was on the subway, some woman was... She was actually an Asian woman. She was in a big rush and she was pushing her way and pushing everyone. And she knocked down a guy who had a hunchback and a big shoe. And I went to pick him up and so did another man. And I said, oh, she was an asshole. And people around said, yeah, she was an asshole. And we lifted him up and he walked up the stairs. Look, people, some people are pushy and cruel and there's nurturers out there too. When people are pushed onto the tracks, people jump onto the tracks to try to save them. Right. That there is a lot of different energy now. And, and what we lack is a unifying movement that could celebrate Cooperation Humboldt and Cooperation Jackson and the unity of all of us with our identity as human, not our separate identities as different people. Unity but is our right. identities of a united people with all different identities. Are you, uh, you know, that's how we ended up with Hitler, a united, <laughs> a united no, movement. It was only Aryans right. that were united. Right. And this is the thing, and, no I'll, ground I'll like uh, and I, I, I'm so sorry that the time, our, our time just flew by, but I, I will just share this. Uh, Dr. Fraud's point, I think, is profound a unifying vision and if we actually learn to just talk about love and compassion and kindness and sharing and insist on that being how we organize our political economy we've got a winning frame it really is that simple that's what i mean when i say we have to break it down without dumbing it down uh, and, and I really do believe that. And I want to thank you, Dr. Fraud, for the incredibly kind words about Cooperation Humboldt and Cooperation Jackson. Uh, and to, to say, David Feldman, and to your listeners and viewers, this movement is happening all across the country. I have the great privilege because I uh, of the work that I do and, and the people that I'm connecting with. It's happening everywhere. It doesn't get talked about very much, but there is a new economy rising up out of need and what uh, uh, Dr. Fraud and I think would call uh, would talk about organic intellectuals. These are people who may not have actually studied Das Kapital. They may not have an understanding of what an interstitial space is or what a historic conjuncture is. They don't need to because they're living a kind of desperation and they're realizing the only way forward is together. And those are the people that I want to work with. And those are people all over who we'd need to reach with a mass movement. And people are dismembered from each other. And that's, you need a unifying socialistic vision that allows people to have their 
vision of equality for African Americans and Latinx and gay and Hispanic and uh, anyone else and all sexualities together because we need each other and we can win. And it's a very straightforward message. And I can see it. I can see it because I have people calling me from, uh, you know, Oklahoma, places I wouldn't imagine. The Columbia, um, Columbia University is organizing under the Machinist Union all the teachers, assistants, and so on. Some undergraduates, some graduates, perfectly sophisticated and smart. Really brilliant people. And the girls and boys who walked out of uh, Tompkins Square Middle School against sexual assault and all the other middle schools that are walking, you know, they're walking out because they have a common vision. We're in this together. We'll change it. And I think that's a compelling message. And it's more compelling than Marjorie Taylor thinks that Jews are killing Santa Claus with space lasers. You know, I, I, I really do think that's more appealing. Right. to most it does and speak so then, to the oh. it does speak to the hypocrisy of the so-called liberal elite when harvard and yale refused to did harvard recognize the uh, the uh phds yeah. the adjunct professors i don't know if they even tried to organize but i know that they achieved that seventeen thousand uh, workers across the University of California system, including students who are underpaid and many of whom are Col homeless. Columbia won't recognize the union, though, right? Not yet, but they're getting ready to strike and they they are brilliant. They're brilliant and they're together. And the young undergraduate woman who's um, a leader there is amazing. These are amazing people and they have a vision. And look, strikes are happening across this whole country. People are saying, it's interesting, as they're saying, okay, five days to recover, five days before, because you have to get back to work. The message is the workers make the money. Hello, they're getting the message. You have to right. get back to work so we can make money because we're the ones who make the money for you. People are catching on. Plus there's a an L NLRB that's a little more favorable, a little more Much favorable more. under Biden. They're more favorable, and that helps enormously. But people all over are catching on, but what they don't have is a broader organization. In the 30s, the communists and the two socialist parties were there when you were evicted. They moved your furniture back in. You know, they were right. there. They were everywhere. One in every four families had an active communist member. That's why they had to have an outrageous, outrageous campaign against that communism meant violence and overthrow of the government. And so the, the Ethel, Ethel and Julius Rosenbergs were killed for conspiracy to commit espionage, not even to doing it. These people in the Capitol were trying to overthrow the government. They were doing it. Eve Moskowitz and Brothman for conspiracy to lie. What? And people were convicted on the base on con contradictory testimony. But the judge, Judge Kaufman, who was responsible for the killing of the Rosenbergs, let it through contradictory statements. Things testifying David Greenglass testified against his sister Ethel Rosenberg even though he was a mental patient and also was facing a life sentence and only got 15 years after testifying against her there was a massive government push to make leftism a conspiracy so that they could push a cold war against our World War II ally who lost 30 million lives against the fascists. We've lost more people to addiction than we lost in World War II. 400,000 in World War II, over 600, no, now it's 700,000 on ODs. So, you know, the that Sackler was family, The Sackler family killed more Americans than Hitler. That's right. 
and they're still want they've had to pay a, a couple of billion out in uh settlements and they're still walking away with the 37 billion that they made or a lot more because they've invested it and now have more so right. you know they're untouched they have not served a moment's time and neither have the people who fomented the real overthrow the real attempt to overthrow not the conspiracy not some kind of discussion but the attempt to overthrow the election sorry david no i I, i've got to jump but i'm going to say this david uh, like next week let's please talk about the business plot and general smedley butler and what we can learn about the fascist attempt in this country uh immediately after world war ii because that's what's coming now right you know there's a new book out about smedley butler we should have the author yeah yeah. Oh, uh, the, well, like a great unsung American hero, the most decorated Marine in U.S. Marine Corps history, Dr. Smedley Butler. Uh, there's a reason that the, uh, we're not taught about Dr. Uh, Smedley Butler uh, in our uh, sanitized uh, U.S. history textbooks. But I do have to jump. Uh, but I do want to talk about this. Rising fascism is real, and we've got to get over the, the kind of, like, we, we've got to have, what is our plan? What is the American people's plan? And that's what I want to talk about next week. Thank you. Thank you, David Bye, Cobb. You Thank you. Dr. Fraud, uh, Smedley Butler said he looked back at his career and he was a gangster for capitalism. There, Some people say there was a coup when Roosevelt first took office that was orchestrated by General Motors, the Bush family, Harriman Brothers, to place Smedley Butler in the Oval Office to remove FDR. A fascist coup uh, was in the offering. The the jury, some people believe that, some people don't. Uh, Bernie, had he won, because we don't have a leftist infrastructure yet, because we basically have the squad, nobody else yeah, a lot of the city council and they, look there's a progressive movement growing up there too but we don't really have a big progressive movement behind them so had bernie been elected president there would have been no infrastructure in place no leftist infrastructure in place to protect him that's right and if bernie had had the courage to then start creating one even before they stabbed him in the back and disqualified him and said, I've been stabbed in the back and disqualified. We need another movement. He wanted to protect the country from Trump because he felt Trump was fascism. And so he compromised. And also he's been in electoral politics all his life. But you need to have a movement. And we don't. And, you know, a glaring example of what's happening here is that the United States is the leading place of death from the coronavirus. Over 800,000 people. Now, I added up the deaths in Germany, France, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and it was 254,000 who died. China has 3.7 something billion people. China has, we have 4% of the world's population. We have 15% of the COVID in the world. China with its billions has inoculated 86% of its people actually it's 85.64%, about 86%. I think they have about a billion two, a billion three. Well, maybe it's a billion three seven three. That's what right, it is. Yeah. One billion three hundred seventy three million. The United States has inoculated 61% of our people. They have over a billion people. We have um, 350,000 people. No. 350 million people, and they have over a billion. 
and we have inoculated 61% and they have inoculated 86%. What's wrong? We have to fudge the numbers the way China does. That's, that's... No, it's, you know, there's lying on both sides. Right. Well, I think that I think I think uh, protectors of the status quo would say we're not a totalitarian state that we can't force. No, but other neither is New Zealand and they are 90 percent vaccinated. Right. Neither is Germany, over 70 percent vaccinated. Neither is France, neither is Norway, Sweden, Denmark. They're all vaccinated. But they have and their they have more free. They have, free you know, they have, they have more democracy than we do. The they have their anti-vaxxers in France as well. They do, but they're a small minority. It's not like here. So who, they're not. Whose fault? But whose fault is it? Is it the anti-vaxxers in the United States or Joe Biden's fault? Aren't there enough vaccines? No, it's no Biden. It's that people, first of all, in the United States, people have, after Reagan, who really worked hard on this, confused the government as their enemy rather than the puppeteers of the corporations that pull the strings of government as their enemy. So they resist everything that is the government. They didn't resist when they were asked to get their polio uh, vaccine or their measles, mumps, chicken pox, smallpox, whooping cough. No, because they trusted our government at that time. Right. Our government has failed to protect its people. And so people Economic don't. So people don't and, trust it. Right. That I. And I, so I come in at anti-vaxxers. They right. don't trust it. They don't trust that it isn't just a tool of the big pharmaceuticals who will poison them to make a nickel. They just don't trust it. Right. And look, it's not a trustworthy government. I think you should take vaccines, but still, you know, and I do. But I think that it's falling apart. People don't have trust in it. Jacinda Ardern, the leader of New Zealand, has less than a thousand people dead because they closed the place down. We're too busy making money to close the airports. They closed entrance to Wuhan when they got nine cases and built 11 hospitals and eradicated it there. Cuomo closed 20,000 public hospital beds. They stockpile equipment because they're not worried about, hey, if you stockpile it, you can't sell it and turn the money over and right. make money. Right. The only thing we stockpile is weapons. Right. It's the ultimate outrageous capitalism of the United States, untampered by socialism, that has made it a disaster. That's why we're dying. And there's a fatalism. There's, there's a fatalism yes, to it. Where we just there is people. There, there is people who are on the you know the the correct side when you talk about shootings you know murder has gone up in the past two years because of covid unemployment the it's, proliferation of guns everywhere that we don't discuss yeah. more guns are being sold now than ever in the history of america exactly. and more americans it used to be you know one guy was buying six guns a month but now it's spreading out. We're more people who are against. People feel endangered and they, they don't know what to do. And also the NRA, which is obviously, it's obviously a tool. It's a marketing company. And it's, they very cleverly figured out that it's a lot smarter if you want to market guns to say, reclaim your manhood, protect your family, get a gun, then make the armaments manufacturers rich, get a gun, get several. Right much better selling right. and what they are is market you know they're lobbyists for the gun manufacturers and they're allowed to go untouched now hopefully this latest the latest disasters will put them under but that's been allowed here in There's new york city of, here in new york city which is filled with i'd like to think 
uh, well, uh, anyway, we elected Eric Adams, who is a cop, a transit official who ran on law and order, even though crime is not really going up. Murders are going up. Shootings are going up. And so he sells himself, uh, I'm going to get tough on crime when in fact he needs to get tough on guns. The, the, the problem is the, problem, we're, the social situation that drives people into crime because they have no other alternative of making an honest living. That's what he should get tough on. Because most of the murders happen in certain neighborhoods, which are poor and struggling and where the youth doesn't have much of a chance. Unless they take the venture capital opportunity of becoming drug dealers. Right. Which is one of the only opportunities offered. That's what he'd have to deal with. Giving people hope of a decent living. And so housing and so on. We're never allowed in this country to address the source of our problems yeah. because that means there's some trade association yeah. that suffers. That's right. If capitalism it goes unchallenged, which it does here, it doesn't in any of those other countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, France, New Zealand, they all have socialist, communist, anarchist, as well as capitalist parties, and they have huge mediating influences. We don't. Everything. They've been allowed to outsource, which they're not allowed in Germany or France. They've outsourced. They outsourced in the 70s, had tremendous wealth, came back and bought our government, which is the best democracy money can buy. And so that's what you have. And people mistrust it. So when the government tells you to get vaccines, they don't necessarily believe it. And the corporate role has been hidden by our newspapers, and we don't have an alternative media that's big. It's only on the Internet. You have to want it to find it. There cannot be a solution to a problem without it benefiting corporate America from paid family mm -hmm. leave to paid sick leave to uh, child care. It has exactly. to be you, the only way the Democrats will get behind subsidizing mm -hmm. daycare, family leave, child leave is if the insurance companies or the for-profit daycare centers are the beneficiaries of tax dollars. Otherwise, it right. can't be passed. Look at the Affordable Care Act that went through the insurance companies. So 29 million people don't have any health insurance. And those who do don't go to the doctor because they can't afford the huge co-pays and the deductibles because it had to go through private insurance companies instead of what... One of the reasons I think that every other developed country has a tiny portion of the deaths of America is they all have public health care. We're the only outlier. So we have to wrap it up. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. We're, we're told it's going to get worse. If we can only have fascism through the blessing of corporate America... I don't believe we can become a fascist state without Stephen Schwartzman and uh, David Rubenstein from the Carlyle Group and all the financiers uh, who control the money in America. I don't believe we can have fascism without their approval. That's right. What and they're more? not by left movement because we don't have one. Right. That's so why they finance Hitler. So what more, they got a good thing going the way it is yes. right now. That's right. And they can keep profiting till it all disappears. Grab it before it all disappears, which is what they're doing. So having it devolve into a, a, a du jour facto, a du jour fascist state where it's like, yes, this is a military takeover of our government. They're not going to, that's not good for their branding. We're not, right? We're not going to 
Well, they like a peaceful environment. So they can keep making money in peace. Right. They, they don't. They didn't like January six. So they're just going to keep giving us people like Biden and Harris and Buttigieg. Exactly. And exactly. That's just what they're going to do. People who are neoliberals will let them do their profitable thing. And the only thing that would stop them is a mass movement of unified people recognizing the particular twists of oppression of all the different people, but also recognizing our commonality and joining together. Have you read about, we have to wrap it up, but have you read about this this new Marxist theory about the 10% that it's the, the capitalism has evolved. There are a group of, there were two Marxists. I think one of them is named Levy or Levy from France. And their theory is that capitalism has evolved and become, is surviving by being more inclusive. They're, that they're allowing the 10% in, the salaried employees, the doctors. Yeah, that's right. It's like the professional managerial class analysis of Catherine Liu. Right. Look, it is about the 10% because you have the 1%, and then you have all the people who service them and make them possible. I would think it's the top 20%, really. But that leaves 80% of the population desperate. Well, the, But their theory is, and I think they did say the 20%, that get, this is just a theory that these Marxists are uh, advocating to forget socialism, to make that 20%, 80%, to work within the... Well, that, well, how are you going to do? You can't make the 20%, 80%, because the whole system is you make more money by getting everything for less, giving people less and getting more for yourself. And that means outsourcing their jobs however you can and getting the poorer people and least protected people in the world to work for you then bringing the money back here and I buying whatever you want the whole government to be continued thank you dr harriet <laughs> fraud is the host of capitalism hits home it's not just in your head is another po podcast with that's max right. golding and, um, no he's out of it now with, oh he's that's um, right. Lee. And I have a new program that's starting Wednesday called Interpersonal Update USA on WBAI on Wednesdays at 2.30. 2.30, Wednesdays at on WBAI Pacifica Radio. That's fantastic news. Thank you, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Thank you so much. This is such a good program. Well, because Bye -bye. of you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you. Let's, thank you, Dr. Fraud. Let us now go to a civilized country, uh, <laughs> Canada, where... Yeah. Uh, well, congratulations to Dr. Fraud. That sounds great, a new program. Yes. I hope it streams. And uh, WBAI Pacifica, get the yeah. Pacifica app. Uh, Professor Adnan Hussein, I, I don't know if you've come loaded for bear, but let me, uh, let me ask you a question about this idea that you can work within capitalism to extend it so that it's not just the capitalists who control the economy, but the the salaried employees. I'm pulling this out of my ass. I read about this like at four in the morning on Sunday, but there are two- At least you read about it. <laughs> right, there are two, I think they're French Marxists mm. who are saying that, um, probably not doing, them justice that you can work within capitalism to expand the, the the reach of the capitalists beyond the people who have all the money. That's is that a fool's errand? Can that be done? Well, I mean, maybe that's you know what uh, um, democratic socialism is is you know extending. You know, you don't change uh, and transform capitalism's basis in, you know, wage labor exploitation, but you find ways to use the government to mitigate some of the worst effects and consequences of the inequality that it produces and try and constrain um, and regulate some of those industries and businesses so that they have to, have to adhere to more humane standards. I mean, that, of course, is... 
a story that has happened within capitalism. You know, um, even Marx in um, Capital Volume One talks about the struggles over the working day, you know, that um, capitalists wanted to extend the working day as much as possible because they get surplus, uh, you know, value from the labor after the laborer has uh, managed to kind of, um, in the first few hours of the day, produce enough that would reproduce their kind of existence. And after that, everything else is going basically towards, um, you know, surplus value and, and ultimately profit. But um, it wasn't possible to sustain, you know, 24 hour production. Once you've built the machines and you have the factory, you want to just keep using it. And that's why they wanted to extend that working day. But eventually workers organized pushed back. There were government commissions that saw that, that all kinds of social problems were starting to happen in industrial cities in the north. And so you have some regulation and some humane limits being being placed. So that maybe that doesn't sound to me. I'm sure there's more to their argument. I haven't read it and I haven't heard about it as well. But it is interesting. I think, you know, this is something that's very significant and important in the whole history of capitalism is how dynamic it is uh, in adjusting in seeking new um, sources of uh, revenue, new sources of labor. And it is clearly a different uh, system than it was in the 19th century. It has changed a lot. And of course, we're now entering an era where people think that um, you have to call it something different that you know this kind of knowledge so-called knowledge economy um, is a new mode um, of production that enlists everyone you know if we want to talk about how it's expanding its reach it enlists everyone to provide data you know on their own um, that uh, can be used to market to them and people are participating uh, in their own kind of exploitation through social media and so on. And this is kind of a new model where uh, they're not being paid for this, right? I mean, the value is being extracted without it being an employee, uh, employer relationship. And so, you know, this is a very dynamic system. And I recall that um, uh, Hart and Negri, you know, about two decades ago at this point, wrote an important book called Empire. And um, they were arguing that um, capitalism has successfully uh, adapted in such a way that um, particularly by um, exploiting and finding um, difference as something that it can market. So you see what happened you know, in the 1990s and 2000s um, is how much of, for example, uh, the 60s era culture of rebellion, you know, uh, the, the person against the system, you know, revolting against conformity, how nonconformity became its own mode of marketing. Everybody is a rebel. Everybody, you know, um, you know, can participate somehow in this culture of individual uh, rebelliousness. And, you know, these can all be uh, appropriated and exploited by corporate culture that has develop remarkable ways to find every form of niche difference to exacerbate those, highlight those, enhance those, and use those as a tool for incorporating people in into corporate culture. Um, so it, it's a remarkably adaptive system. Um, it has found ways that even though we might say that the 1% are um, the ones who are controlling uh, the economy, it has found ways to enlist a wide array of people across different segments of society uh, into reinforcing and, and seeing themselves as having interests in it such that they you find it very difficult to imagine an alternative system or even if they could imagine that this system should could or should be changed their interests are tied up um you know in it and in, in such a way that it's hard to mobilize uh people in struggle against it to change it 
capitalism created climate catastrophe and capital is like money we're we're being flooded we're, the sea levels are going to rise and water is going to find its way towards us the same way capital finds its way towards us is it possible to mitigate the flow of capital the same way we mitigate the flow of the rising sea levels that Warren, Elizabeth Warren talks about guardrails and just building dams and and do we need a major rev revolution to agree that no we money can't flow into this type of institution money this is a public good we build a dam money is not going to flow into this can we push the tide back without getting rid of all the water it feels like in order to defeat capitalism we just have to drain drain the oceans the metaphor i kind of i'm going to stick with the metaphor it does feel like money is water and it's uh we're drowning in it even though none of us seem to have it it's flooding well, us. i guess you could say yeah i mean i guess you could say that um you know, priming the pump. I mean, as if we're going to keep with the water metaphors, right. you know, I mean, this is in some ways what Keynesian, Keynesian uh, you know, economics um, tried to do um, to deal with the, the Great Depression and build up demand. And so, the, you know, there are techniques within the system that can overcome some of the problems for some period of time and one could say it was successful enough that it stabilized capitalism um you know a quasi welfare state in the united states uh, emerged and that you had 30 years of basically prosperity and greater equality um so could you country. say to the american people look capitalism capital investing it it, it there is a positive to it like water but too much water too much capital will kill you that that within reason you, if you had a strong government that could stand up to capital it could happen but you can't have a strong government as long as there's capital as long as there are capitalists owning the government that's the problem the only thing that stands between us and the end of the world is the, and the end of the world will be caused by the financiers, the bankers, the capitalists. The only thing keeping us from destruction is government. That's the only thing that can stand up to these. Well, monsters. government, when it is um, acting, you know, in democratic fashion, as an expression of the political will of you know the people i mean that's i think the issue is that government the state um doesn't necessarily uh operate consistently in that way it's a tool it's a set of you know processes for control for extracting taxes for you know uh, wielding force in society it's got all of these functions um but when it's not under democratic control it will um of course um and even when it is under you know representative democracy liberal democracy in many ways the um strength of the capitalists who wield wield financial power can wield political power um, as well. So I think just relying on the idea that if you have a strong state, I mean, you can have strong states uh, that support the corporate interest. That is, in fact, fascism. I mean, you have right. a very strong centralized state that looks at the interests of, um, you know, makes this partnership with, uh, you know, uh, corporate, uh, corporate industry, co corporate control. Um, so I think, you know, the only thing that really can restrain is uh, and, and the state is a way of organizing power, right? That's what it is, is it sets of institutions that manage and organize um, organize power effectively uh, when it's a strong when it's a strong state. But 
that's what's really required is organization, political organization among the people. That's the only thing really that does right. ultimately restrain the inequities that are built into the structure of capitalism. So um, right now, I don't see much opportunity for restoring the state to democratic control. It's so... Um, so outside of uh, of popular control, I mean, how many decades um, have we had, uh, you know, consensus on various sorts of issues that are very, you know, popular that we see no action on? Um, it's not that they're controversial in the public, but they're represented and portrayed as um, controversial issues or policies uh, on which there is great divergence. And that's just because the way our political system is working now, it's not responsive actually to popular popular will. Um, I talked about this. At that's the, top the first of the problem that has to be overcome, I think. There was a study, I'm sure you know about this. It came out in 2014. It came out of Princeton, and I believe Northwestern. They worked together. They studied something like 2,000 pieces of legislation over a 20-year period passed in Washington, and then they measured the polling on it. And no legislation gets passed unless the richest 10% give tacit approval. Even though it's popular among, you know, even though it's winning in the polls, if it doesn't have the richest 10%, if it doesn't benefit the richest 10% in some way, it doesn't get passed. And they concluded, we're an oligarchy. This is the definition uh, of, of an oligarchy. Um, yeah, that's exactly the kind of research I've been, I was thinking about, that it's not responsive to popular will, and that there's a certain influential class of people whose desires and wishes are achieved by the state. Um, and there's exclusively now, sometimes it may align with the rest of the population. And if it does, then great. Then, you know, the rest of the people will benefit. But it really is contingent upon this 10 percent of the well-educated, the wealthy, the well-connected. Um, they're the ones who that the government really does serve. How much of this is human nature that that I I, I refuse to believe that there isn't such thing as enough that that can you correct human nature so they're not so avaricious so rapacious i mean what does the walton family need <laughs> at some point uh, it's insanity aren't there can't there be a rational conversation of what constitutes enough yeah, you can. I mean, in an abstract philosophical way, I think many people would certainly agree that, um, you know, that uh, material uh, acquisition and accumu accumulation at a certain point doesn't bring actual happiness and that, you know, you have enough to live and what's the motivation? Well, it's clear that, you know, there are other motivations, power um, and control, protecting one's sense of future, you know, interest um, for future generations, you know, one's family and so on. People build, and I think you had been talking about this uh, before, I think you mentioned about educating, um, you know, you know, children that we sort of force them into, um, you know, pathways um, that are responding to our own projection into the future of our concerns, interests, anxieties. But that's, I think, when we talk about human nature, I'm sure there are some deep, you know, deep rooted um, elements of personality and so forth that emerged evolutionarily over long periods of, of, of historical time as a result of, um, you know, early settlement of societies and um, the transition to agriculture from hunter gathering these, you know, these things take a long time to change in terms of fundamental dispositions. And there must be some 
kind of inheritance that we have as biological and historical creatures. But I really don't think that that's very um, expansive uh, or grasps really the complexity of people's actual responses. I think really it is the social environment and how you perceive that individual desire to prosper. But your understanding of what it means to prosper is so conditioned by the horizon of possibilities in your society that that's what you think of as nature because everybody's sharing similar kinds of conditions and in a kind of capitalist system that runs on you know, competition um, has, you know, all of these uh, inequalities and inequities. I think it's only natural that you will see people acting in selfish ways. Um, but if the society was organized, I feel really um, in such a way that success um, was measured and understood through a different set of social relationships. Right. That is, you know, ideals of service or finding satisfaction in, you know, your community. Um, uh, you know, if we valued some of these other elements and not just valued them abstractly as ideals, but they were embedded actually in how society functioned, your social experience of success came from affirmation, you know, through relationships where you nurtured and you cared and you helped others and received back, um, you know, responses and you felt secure and stable in your future because your um, sense of security was rooted in social solidarity and equality. Right. Um, I think we would behave in very different ways. And, and so how do you mobilize society? Part of it is a cultural movement but without, you can't have a cultural movement without the tacit approval of our corporate media. You're not, you know, and our schools uh, instill one thing in our children. If you go to, if you sit in on a kindergarten class, Wall Street would be infuriated at the indoctrination, but what our, what is still being taught to preschoolers and kindergartners, if, if Stephen Schwartzman or David Rubenstein saw what they were teaching kids about sharing, they would, their heads would explode. The, do societies evolve? I know humans are supposed to evolve. Is there a natural evolution of societies with or without controlling forces? Well, this was, uh, this is a very interesting question, a uh, big question, but a very interesting one. I just got a hold of a book that um, I've been hearing a lot about, um, uh, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro, um, two anarchists, um, one's an archaeologist and the other is an anthropologist, the late David Graeber. Um, and what I gathered from initial um, accounts of the book and their own uh, talks and so on is that um, this idea that there is a relationship, a kind of evolutionary historical relationship to societies um, and their forms uh, over time and that you go through different stages from, you know, early primitive face-to-face uh, -face small communal societies to agriculture and more hierarchy and then aggregations into cities. And that's, that's the kind of, um, you know, condition socially and economically then creates political hierarchies and you know, more you know, kind of violent military states that control and dominate and, and are ceaselessly involved with war and, and so on and so on, that this is all, you know, even though scholars know that there's a lot greater variety in the relationship between political forms and social and economic relations, that there has been for a very long period of time uh, connecting of those two. And you find it even in Marx's thought, uh, you know, that he he really does imagine that the productive relations in society give birth to certain particular po political forms and forms of government, uh, and that that inevitably will lead to conditions changing such that you could uh, 
uh, reorient the state and eventually have no state at all. Like you would, you could, you know, have a condition of social and economic integration and equality that there was really no need for um, uh, a set of institutions that imposed itself upon the rest of society because fundamentally his idea or understanding of the state was that it was an outgrowth of these inequities in society and the form the state took was basically um, related to what the nature of the elite uh, that controlled the state needed, you know, in terms of organizing the rest of society to preserve their interests. And they're sort of taking aim, it seems, at that. I just got the book yesterday. I'm eager to read it. It's like a 700, you know, page work, but it seems very interesting um, in that it is examining, um, you know, from archaeological evidence as well as, uh, um, you know, enlightenment thought to, uh, try and unpack um, actual existing relations and also, uh, you know, over time and the variety of social and political forms and also um, to really um, introduce or reintroduce something that seems to have been suppressed in Enlightenment thought, which is that the encounter with peoples of the new world, indigenous peoples, actually spurred a lot of these ideas to try and justify the forms of hierarchy in, in European society um, in order to suggest that you couldn't have modernity, you couldn't have technological progress, you couldn't have advancement in science and medicine and so on without the kind of oppressive social relations. And we find that this is, you know, part of our contemporary thought, too, in terms of justifying, you know, capitalism. I mean, I keep hearing from people now there's Paxlovid, you know, oh, look at these pharmaceutical companies. This is the dynamism of capitalism while forgetting that, in fact, actually, um, you know, it was government investment and in labs that were crucial to the processes that developed this particular antiviral treatment. But there's this idea that we have to sacrifice equality, social justice in order to have these extraordinary technological advancements that they won't be possible. They're only possible through suppressing uh, uh, and oppressing you know, others. You can't have an egalitarian society if you want to move out of the hunter gatherer stage. Right. right. That's kind of the idea. And so I'm really interested to see, you know, if your question, if they are capable of answering it, because they're they seem to be proposing in this book a different view on the relationship. Um, you, you know, know, we want whether there is really evolution or not in, right. in human societies. I'm not going to defend the Soviet Union, but I will say being a. a oh, come on. You know, you want to. <laughs> <all right. laughs> I am a space buff, specifically the, the Mercury program all the way through Apollo. The Russians were. Were beating us big time, they, they beat. They they were they were orbiting the Earth before we were. They sent a, a woman into space before we did. They had satellites in space before we did. The only reason we beat the Russians to the moon is we were competing against the Russians who weren't competing against us. Khrushchev said, "We don't need to go to the moon. It's, I'm not going to spend that kind of money when." We have problems on Earth. In 63 or 64, Khrushchev said, we're not going to the moon. But they convinced us that we had to beat the Russians to the moon, even though there was uh, no competition. But the Russians were able to do it without corporations, without greed. It was maybe a totalitarian com commanding heights of the economy uh, being orchestrated. But... Uh, yeah. Well, this is one, I mean, this is one reason why I, th I would recommend next month, uh, Guerrilla History will have an episode on socialist states and the environment. Um, we had a wonderful conversation uh, with a soil scientist um, uh, who was just interested in whether this idea that uh, socialist states are necessarily terrible for the environment actually holds uh, true. And I think you can compare it with uh, uh, Kristen Godsey's book about sex under socialism, you know, being better for women. There's been 
some attempt to go back and actually study this history, put aside the mythologies and propagandas of the Cold War, and actually do the historical work on empirical terms and see, uh, you know, with a realistic assessment, what was the performance, uh, you know, of these of these societies. Of course, they had their flaws, but also what were their achievements? Maybe there's something one can learn from their experience. And I think one of the things that we learned was that um, socialist states, by comparison with uh, capitalist states, were actually a lot better for the environment overall. Um, and, uh, you know, they took that seriously, had better policies. Uh, they, you know, mitigated environmental, destructive environmental consequences of dirty, you know, petroleum era and coal era industries, but they actually were conscious of it and they didn't see the environment as just a mere externality. And as a result, it was important to do some remediation. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, we can we can understand that you can have scientific advancement without necessarily authorizing all of the destructive dimensions of capitalism on the environment, on, you know, human inequality uh, and, and so forth. So I look forward to that uh, episode next month. Great. Professor Adnan Hussein is chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He, you're an American living, Canada isn't abroad, right? That would not be, it sounds, but. We have a border, but abroad usually you think of as overseas, I think. Right. Um, so it's but a pretty near soon neighbor. it will be the way climate change is going we can say it's abroad. And you are the host of Guerrilla History with Henry Huckamacki. And who's on the Mudgeless po uh, podcast? Well, next uh, month we'll be having um, an interview um, about uh, the global war on terrorism, looking back on it uh, by Arun Kundnani, who's the author of um, several great books, one of which is The Muslims Are Coming, uh, about Islamophobia and the war on terror. I'm going to send you, I don't know if you saw the article in the Wall Street Journal about the $14 trillion that was spent on the war on terror this past 20 years, and how the lion's share, at least half of it, went to contractors who uh, well, that's not surprising. It's that's unbelievable. not surprising. I hadn't seen that article, but the Cost of War project at Brown University what, has definitely totaled up all of this. But the way it's going, um, you know, uh, this is what's so funny about all of these uh, complaints about foreign aid. It's like, well, you know, they've done analyses that 80 to 90 percent of what's spent on foreign aid goes to domestic service providers, NGOs, uh, and contractors. Um, so it's a way of recycling public money to private uh, to private hands, Thank you. which of course is the, the real job of our government currently is to find ways, it seems, of taking public money and funneling it into private uh, profits. Yes, the, the, the Brown Project is, is exactly what the Wall Street Journal pulled its information from. So you are, I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, we talk behind your, Hannah and I talk behind your back and say amazing things about you, but. Uh, well, that's too kind, but I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing um, your other guests. This yes. is a great show. Uh, it's the first show of the year. Yes. So congratulations on another year. And I hope 2022 is the best ever in the history of this show. So you're saying 2023, you're hoping is it's downhill in 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Up to this point. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Professor Adnan Hussein. And let's go to Peter B. Collins, who I know Professor Adnan Hussein listened to in the Bay Area. Adnan Hussein grew up in the Bay Area. And joining us is Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer, Peter B. Collins. And go to Peter B. Collins dot com for a treasure trove of his radio shows, his podcasts and his interviews. Welcome. Happy New Year. Thank you for for returning. 
Well, it's great to be with you, David. Happy New Year. And I wanted to wish uh, Adnan, before he gets too far away, uh, a happy birthday. He and his twin sister uh, will celebrate on a date that has been stolen from them. It is now a, a date of infamy, January 6th. Oh. <laughs> oh. Adnan, you're muted. That is that is true. Uh, January 6th, uh, also a great day, uh, used to be a wonderful Christian holiday called Epiphany or the Feast of the Three Kings. And that also has been, I was always pleased to share my birthday with that festival. Uh, but now we had to make room for Insurrection Day uh, okay. as, as well. Well, Adnan, I was touched by your Facebook post, and I, I don't know if you've mentioned it. Uh, I assume not, since David was surprised about the birthday thing. But you are fundraising for a nonprofit that your parents operate in the, in the South Bay, in Silicon Valley. And I was moved to uh, chip in a couple of bucks today. And I wanted to mention it because uh, I bet some Feldman listeners who had a good year in the stock market or uh, made money in other ways might be willing to support it as well. So tell us a little about the Rahima Foundation. Oh, well, um, and thank you so much, Peter, uh, for your donation and support. It's a uh, a uh, charitable foundation my mother started um, almost 30 years ago in our garage collecting clothes, food for the large number of Afghan refugees that had come to the Bay Area. They live in Newark, uh, East Bay, basically Newark, Hayward, Fremont, mm -hmm. and started coming in the late 70s, early 80s as a result of uh, the war there. Um, and um, it started slowly uh, in, in, in that fashion, work she had done for Afghan refugees, and then really started uh, taking shape in the early 90s with Bosnian and Somali refugees that were also coming uh, to, the, to the Bay Area, to the United States. And um, she... Um, continue to develop it. Um, it now feeds several hundred families a month um, and provides other kinds of assistance like rent support, um, job assistance. Um, and uh, it's really become a big part of her life. She's very well known in the community. My When my father retired, he joined uh, as well and they've been running it. So basically about 30 years. Um, wow. In the Bay Area. And, and where do you go to donate? Uh, you can go to rahimafoundation.org. How do you spell you Rahima? R-A-H-I-M-A. Dot org. So rahimafoundation.org. Um, and um, yeah, it, uh, they work um, with uh, other... Uh, food banks and you know grocery stores um this would be other... I, I don't mean to put you on the spot and don't but this would be a great idea for a fundraiser that we do through our community on a saturday night if if you wanted but you, you don't have to answer but that would be a great way for our community to put on a show and raise money we've done this in the past and that, i can't think of a better I think we could. I think we could raise a lot That's, of money. Uh, that would be. That would really be wonderful. Um, you know, I'm. They they have very low overhead and support. Um, you know, a lot of folks who are very much in need. Uh, you know, rent is insane. You know, housing prices in the Bay Area, as Peter knows, are crushing. Um, there's been a lot of unemployment. And um, I do recall that at the start of the pandemic, when there were the severe lockdowns and a lot of panic uh, that Rahima Foundation was an essential service provider. They kept their doors open. Uh, followed all of the distancing requirements, figured out very quickly how to adapt to um, working in their warehouse and offices to support uh, people who lined up, um, I'm sorry to say, uh, in the hundreds for for support. Um, and the so thing to keep in mind that we're in a society where these charitable organizations are needed. You know, mutual aid was very important, you know, through this through the pandemic. 
I wish our government uh, took care of its responsibilities on behalf of everyone. But unfortunately, in the meantime, some of these institutions are uh, desperately needed to fill in the gaps. It's not enough, but so anything we can do in these circumstances will be greatly appreciated. And it's not a level. Well, Adnan, Adnan I, I made my contribution in honor of two different people. One is my nephew's girlfriend, Arnella, and I'm sorry, I don't know her, her surname, but she uh, came from Bosnia in the mid 1990s and with her family they settled in san jose and i can imagine that she got assistance uh, from rahima or uh, others who uh, have welcomed refugees as that uh, has become uh, a rarer uh, reaction to the introduction of new people to this land of immigrants and the other person is my late cousin cousin uh, greg bunker who started and operated the food pantry in Sacramento mm. uh, in the 1980s. And he, he passed away about uh, maybe 10 years ago now. But uh, he uh, was somebody who me and my family members uh, supported every year at this time. And so I, I just want to recognize both the need uh, and the support that uh, your family's foundation is providing and uh, it, it just uh, deepens my respect for you, Adnan. Well, that's really kind. I'm very, really touched, Peter, by your interest in this. And, uh, you know, I'm sure people have, uh, you know, local uh, organizations everywhere and mutual aid uh, groups. I encourage you to so support them. Um, but if you're looking for one uh, option in the Bay Area, uh, Rahima Foundation, has been doing good work, and um, I really appreciate Peter your support. Let well, me. Really the just... other thing that comes to mind uh, is that, uh, and I welcome input from some of the people who are watching our live recording on YouTube. Uh, I'm looking for a way to send uh, some small amounts of money to the two towns that were utterly destroyed in Colorado last week, and we learned the hard way. Uh, through the 1989 San Francisco earthquake response, mm -hmm. that the Red Cross is never an agency to trust a single dollar with. They use today's disaster to fundraise for next month's bonus payments to their executives. Wow. And in San Francisco, the mayor at the time was Art Agnos, and he mm -hmm. had to repeatedly shame the Red Cross to get them to spend half of the, uh, I believe it was $100 million that they raised following the, the severe earthquake that we had back in 1989. And I've never given them a penny since. But if there is a church group or uh, a community organization that people know and respect in the Boulder area, I'd love to know about that because uh, I have other friends uh, who I think would help as well. Thank you for saying that about the Red Cross, which held a fundraiser at Mar-a-Lago when Donald Trump first was elected. Uh, they are notorious for not delivering to Haiti, and they are a bad organization that pays their leadership in the high six figures, if not more. Here's how I know the Rahima organization is fantastic. I, today, I swear to you, Professor Hussein, I was going to start the show by talking about beans, that the solution to the world's problems is switching to a diet of beans, that so much of our problems can be erased if everyone ate beans. The first thing you see when you go to Rahima.org are chickpeas, pinto beans, lentil beans, and then you read that their pantry is in coordination with Kaiser Permanente because so many people who need food have dietary problems that stem from eating the wrong food. And I look at when you give money to Rahima.org, they are buying healthy food, yogurt, beans, fresh vegetables, fish, tofu, 
eggs, whole foods, not garbage. Very, I'm like, well, that, that figures Professor Hussein's parents would probably have the same values as Professor Hussein. So thank you, Peter B. Collins, for telling all my listeners to go to rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A dot org. And that's what a great organization. What a great way to give money. Thank you for that. Let's let's talk about uh, doing a, a humiliating fundraiser, something that would be uh, would raise a lot of money, but uh, be humiliating for certain members of our community. <laughs> I can't. I, I, would, I would be happy to uh, support yeah. that and, and sit on the seat of the dunking machine. If that would help. <laughs> I think Henry in a wig. I think Henry will put on a wig. Uh, Henry Huckamacki. There's a, a wiggy at a buy for one of our benefits. That always brings in money just to see Henry wearing a wig. Thank you, Professor Hussein. And uh, what a you. great way Thank to start both. the year to learn about the happy Rina. birthday. Yeah. And happy birthday. Thanks. Happy birthday. Happy January 6th. I knew something <laughs> I knew something else great came out of January 6th. Well, Peter B. Collins joins us. Let's talk and thank you for for your words about Rahima. I had no idea about this. Well, I, I didn't either, but you know, I have these mixed feelings about Facebook, David. Uh, I I hate the data collection. And because uh, Apple now allows us to opt out of data collection on Facebook, we have these predatory posts about name your favorite dog. What was the first concert you went to? What was your first car? That's data mining, pure and simple. Uh, and I see at least my friends are linked to those sites and some of them will answer the question. And th there's a lot of bad shit that, that you know, we can uh, recount about Facebook. But Adnan Hussein is, you know, a recent addition to my friends list. He puts up really interesting posts uh, about things that I otherwise wouldn't know about. And I have some, I, I don't set any records. I think I have 1,400 friends uh, on Facebook. And many of them do put up pictures of their brunch and, you know, grandkids that I don't know and all kinds of effluvia like that. Right. But... But I have a core group of people who post articles and information and opinions that I truly value. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of people uh, exit Facebook, and I don't blame them. <clears throat> you know, there are good reasons to say this is, uh, a, you know, a drain or a distraction or a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> a quick story. One of the clips that circulated after Betty White passed was her appearance on Saturday Night Live, which was driven by a Facebook um, right. uh, drive, a campaign by people saying, you know, Saturday Night Live, we want Betty White to host. So in her monologue, she said, well, you know, I'd never heard of Facebook. <laughs> she said, while I'm grateful that I'm here, she said, it looks like a real waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so it is a mixed blessing. But Adnan posted because he and his twin sister celebrate their birthday on the 6th. And they are using that occasion to ask people to donate money to Rahima. And like you, this was the first I'd heard of it. Yes, there are. And it, it's just. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. I don't want to defend Facebook, but you're 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 right. Let's talk about the new mayor of New York City, who is what thirty five hundred miles away from you, you all the way on the other coast. We have a new mayor, January first, sworn in, replacing Bill De Blasio. Bill De Blasio. I think was the best mayor that I can remember of New York. He promised universal preschool. He delivered. Cuomo hated de Blasio, fought him every step of the way. 
That's uh, the biggest benefit that Eric Adams has. Is that Cuomo is not going to bigfoot him and try to run the subways and use the other authorities that are misplaced in Albany. But, David, I, I want to modestly turn the tables here because you're the New Yorker. And I'm offended by the proclamation from Eric Adams that I'm the new face of the Democratic Party uh, because I will wait and see. You know, campaigns are about marketing and actually governing can uh, create many different demands. But his alliance with the police department makes me extremely uncomfortable and to see Bill Maher, our favorite punching bag, slobbering all over him. He's had him on two or three times and just, uh, you know, loves to uh, foster this kind of phony, moderate agreement at the expense of progressives. And so I'd like to ask you uh, how you react to Eric Adams and what you see shaping up uh, in his term. He's a, a transit police officer, a vegan. He is African-American, which puts a friendlier face on the police. But uh, for African-Americans who have been victimized by the New York City police, we have a, we have a problem with the police in New York City. They they are bullies and they are murderer. They are murderers and they terrorize black communities. I worry that having a, a black mayor who is a police officer will be used as a way to uh, placate, to seemingly placate the African-American community when there is a serious problem with cops terrorizing African-Americans in, in New York City. Uh, crime has gone up uh, a little, mostly shootings have gone up. And his solution seems to be better policing, more policing, and not speaking out, at least not that I heard of, against guns. I mean, the, the problem, the solution isn't more police, it's fewer guns. But we can't have that conversation because that ended about 10 years ago. The idea of getting rid of guns, that's no longer on the table. So more Can policing. Can I toss you a, a Feldman-style hypothetical? Sure. You do. You do great hypothetical, David. Uh, what will will he do confronted with the next Eric Garner case? Will he support the cops who wouldn't let him breathe and snuffed out his life? Will he defend them? Because after all, he was selling uh, what are they called? Single cigarettes. Lucy's. Uh, Lucy's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, if we're going to adopt a broken windows, kinder, gentler, but stop and frisk approach to law enforcement in New York. What would he do in the case of an Eric Garner? Well, I think New York State eliminated qualified immunity. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't matter what, what he says. It's what he does. And, you know, uh, we have a, a, a female, I believe we have a, an African-American female police chief. Uh, but I think Lynch, appropriately named, is still the uh, head of the police union. And uh, we, we have to stop scaring New Yorkers. We have to stop telling them that crime is going up because the crime statistics like the stock market, are manufactured. Those numbers lie. You can make, you can make crime statistics sing or, or cry if you want. It is in the best well, interest. And, and David, we, we have across the country, and I'll use Oakland as the example that I know the most about, 
we have a rise in homicides. You have a what? And a, an increase in homicides in 2021. Shootings. So, a, why, why don't we call them what they are? Shootings. Okay, they're they're human on human killings. Shootings. They're shootings. And, and yes, but they are they lead to a loss of life. So they are murders or killings. And this is presented by a guy like Trump as you know singularly black on black crime. But it's really people with guns. And the purported solution that is offered now by uh, Democrats who are afraid of the backlash of uh, defund the police, uh, they're now saying, well, we need more cops in Oakland because that is going to stop human on human murders. Right. And and, you know, to a mild extent, if you have more cops who can investigate after a crime has been committed, uh, you might bring somebody to justice and prevent them from doing it again, uh, at least for a while. But this is so irrational that the solution to bad behavior by humans with guns is being uh, seen as a pretext to stop any further police reforms. And in California, we didn't eliminate qualified immunity, but it was uh, modified to the point where a bad cop cannot uh, resign from one department and get a job in another department in our state. He could move to Nevada or New York. Um, but, you know, we, we made a little progress in California last year, but it's O-V-E-R. It's over because it doesn't pull well, because the reactionary forces are able to uh, roused the public who watch local TV news with with the stories that lead because they bleed. And what we've really seen is an increase in crime on television news. Right. And that's not to dismiss the actual fact that more people died of homicide last year than than did in the first year of the pandemic. But the reasons are very complex. And the idea that simply paying more cops to patrol the streets and abuse members of the public, not all of them do, but enough of them do to make that statement, uh, is just preposterous. Yeah. And to me, that's what Eric Adams is saying when he says, <clears throat> I'm the new face of the Democratic Party. He's channeling Bill Clinton, who uh, left the campaign trail to go back to Arkansas just to be there. He didn't actually execute this uh, mentally retarded man. He just wanted to be part of that story because he thought it would help him politically. Right. So culturally, uh, we, we, we have I believe we have to stop calling it murder and call it a shooting. Most of these deaths are because of guns. And there are now 400 million guns in America. 81 million Americans own these weapons. The every study shows that where there is a proliferation of guns, there's a proliferation of shootings. You can't have shootings without guns. Wherever they ease up on the gun laws, people get shot to death. 20,000 Americans uh, died in 2021, uh, were murdered by guns. That's not suicides. That's another number. 20,000 Americans right. were shot to death. 40,000 were injured and survived a shooting. We have a gun problem, not a crime problem. And like you said, it cannot be mitigated by more police officers because police officers are terrified of civilians and they will pull you over for an air freshener dangling from your rearview mirror because that brings in revenue for the city. They will not pull you over if they think you are in possession of a... Uh, a firearm that hasn't been properly purchased. 
So if you want to lower the, the murder rate, either have the cops finally call for an assault weapons ban, which they did. Clinton did institute an assault weapons ban, and he had police chiefs from all over America standing behind him. Those days are over. The police chiefs are not calling for an assault weapons ban. Then have our police chiefs, if, they, if they're all in on gun ownership, have them go after the, the fully loaded Americans who are about to shoot somebody. If the cops David, aren't going to speak it, out against the NRA, then 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 put your lives on the line and pull over anybody you suspect is carrying an illegal firearm. They're not going to do that. And and, and David, um, putting aside the legal and technical issue of qualified immunity, the police still um, appropriate a sense of impunity. And a once decent newspaper called the San Francisco Chronicle, which is, um, you know, lumbering along, but it has moments. And one of those moments was today, a front page investigative story about an immigrant man who presents as a Muslim who was uh, piecing together a living, uh, driving for Uber, DoorDash, and his third job was cashiering at a gas station. And he couldn't afford to keep up the payments on his car during the pandemic. So he took a predatory offer from a company that is in alliance with Uber. And he rented a car. And so the car rental fees would be deducted from his Uber revenues. But uh, driving for Uber ain't what it used to be. Uh, they've jacked up the rates and traffic has declined. And so uh, he was, we don't know exactly how late, but he was late with a payment on the car rental. And Uber and its allies, which rewrote labor law in California to firm up their delusion that their drivers are not employees, um, they also tweaked a law that cut the length of time, the grace period, that one would have for not returning a rental car. And they said, well, this is about drug dealers and criminals, you know, who rent a car to do a job, and then they just leave it somewhere. Well, the, that may actually be true <laughs> as one basis for tightening up the law. But by shortening the grace period to 72 hours, this man then became a thief. His car shifted from a rental whose payment was overdue to a stolen car. Wow. Then he drove through a community in the East Bay, San Ramon, where they have license plate readers at every border. This uh, turned up the stolen car onto the computers of the San Ramon Police Department. And some eight hours later, as he was driving home from his third job, he was pulled over by six police officers with weapons drawn. He was not armed. He followed every direction. He stayed in his car at first with his hand on the, hands on the steering wheel. He was then ordered to get out of the car and he did. It turns out he was driving barefoot, which is not not much of a crime, if any. Fred, Fred <laughs> Flintstone does it all the time. <laughs> I think Barney so did, too. He, he steps out of the car. He drops his shoes on the pavement. He puts his shoes on and the cops react with weapons drawn, crouching behind their squad cars. Then they deployed a police dog that bit this man in the arm to the point where he had 48 stitches and his arm is permanently, permanently disfigured. He has problems with the hand attached to that arm and he uh, is now suing the San Ramon Police Department for this behavior. It occurred in 2021 after all of the, you know, uh, 
uh, appropriate response to George Floyd and other police killings, the cops have not changed their behavior. And so this man survived. You know, he, he didn't get uh, a fatal uh, neck, uh, a knee to the neck. But to me, this is an indication that even in uh, a more affluent suburb of San Francisco, the cops are still operating with very limited oversight. And uh, the department has self-investigated, but they won't comment on their investigation because now there's a lawsuit. And likely there will be a seven figure settlement that includes a gag order. And uh, I can't predict if there will ultimately be any discipline for these cops, but at this point it doesn't look like it. So that's a long winded story from the West coast, but it again is part of my reaction to Eric uh, Adams claim that he is the new face of the democratic party. Cause if that's the face uh, it's just another invitation for the party uh, to become even more irrelevant. We are learning that police departments, especially in smaller cities, are shakedown operations to pay bills for municipalities that don't want to raise taxes, that there are quotas, and they have discovered that by keeping primarily African Americans, people of color in a cycle of poverty, they can pay bills that every, you know, when when this officer Potter, who shot the African American kid, I think his name was Dante Wright. I think that that was Mm -hmm. his name, because he had an air freshener dangling from his rear view mirror and an expired Tag. tag license tag yeah they were they were looking to shake him down you know give him a ticket a fine and then he doesn't pay it so then he has to pay a bigger fine and then next time they pull him over they lock him up and there's money to be made in locking somebody up it was a whole cottage industry surrounding the uh, persecution of African-Americans and cities collect fines. That's the Eric Holder, when he was attorney general, the one thing he got right after Ferguson is they put the Ferguson Police Department under a consent decree. And the Obama Justice Department said the city of Ferguson is a their police department is a shakedown racket. That's how they pay well, their bills. And at the time of uh, the unrest in Ferguson, the cycle you're talking about was being used to pay the salaries of a nearly all white police department and a nearly all white city council. Right now that has changed. I believe they have a black chief and I think that there's more uh, diversity in the city council. But the other point I'll make is that, if you even have just parking tickets, okay, not even moving violations, and they stack up because you can't pay them, well, that becomes a huge barrier when you need to renew your registration. And I don't know if this was the case with Dante Wright, but COVID left a lot of people unable to pay uh, traffic tickets and parking tickets. And even if you could re, you know, renew your registration online, if you had to pay off all your tickets in order to do that, you, you couldn't. And of course, you know, the, the, the hardliners, mostly white conservatives would say, well, if your car's not registered, you can't drive. But <laughs> we know that that's not an option for working class people. Without mass transit, yes. without mass transit. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this, this is just part uh, I, I was really uh, fascinated by your conversation with Adnan Hussein. I just heard the last 15 minutes uh, uh, of, of that chat. But what you were talking about is, uh, you know, summed up in a simple phrase that the oligarchs are able to privatize their profits and socialize their losses 
while the people who earn, you know, in in five figures a year uh, uh, pay the uh, a, a much higher proportion of taxes, and they are forced to submit to, uh, you know, paying what they actually owe. They don't have trusts and CPAs who can uh, stack their stock options and pass them out to family members to, uh, you know, uh, enhance the tax breaks that, that these newly minted billionaires can, can get now. And, and so we really have returned to uh, a, a serf or a peasant uh, society. And the other thing that I just have to spout off about is that what television does. You know, with things like Shark Tank, it, it celebrates ruthless uh, entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship, that. and and then we've got Succession, which is a a more uh, toxic version of Dallas. Mm -hmm. If people remember that primetime soap from the right. 1980s, built around the Ewing family, uh, the oil barons in Texas. Well, Succession to me is just an update of that, with uh, you know even more conspicuous spending. And so we have this, um, the, the reality is the oppression of the people whose only escape is to watch television, which feeds them fantasies about capitalism. Yes, yes. <laughs> And I don't see a cure for that anytime soon. I, I, I swear to you, I was going to ask you this question. Is, is, you're, you, just, you were a Vunder kid. You, at the height of Watergate, I think you were a teenager and you had a, a, a radio show in Chicago, correct? Covering Watergate. Yeah, I started that when I was 19. A, a mere child. So yes. <laughs> I have told people who listen to this show and correct me if i'm wrong that by the time watergate rolled around most americans at least those under the age of 30 had a healthy mistrust of television advertising and corporations that to be called corporate was to be insulted that when a a musician was considered corporate when a rock band was considered corporate it was you weren't supposed to listen to it you were shamed by the culture we had a mistrust a distrust of corporate america or at least a lot of americans knew not to trust corporate america the culture did not trust there was a, a counter culture which meant don't trust corporate America. That has disappeared. Is that fair to say that that doesn't exist the way it, at least it used to? Or, or am I reimagining the uh, past? No, I, I would uh, <clears throat> generally disagree there, David, because okay. I think that there are more people who are critically aware of the pernicious behavior of, uh, you know, the corporate wing of America. And that, that includes the people who run them and the people who own them and uh, increasingly the people who work for them. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, it's actually increased uh, since then. And ju just a quick story, where I worked in Chicago was an FM station owned by the ABC network. And in the next studio, and, and we were a bunch of long-haired, uh, under 30 Paul kids. Harvey. Uh, that this, well, that's where I'm going. I, I, Paul he, Harvey. Right. Paul Harvey was in the next studio. And uh, Paul Harvey ruled the roost, okay, because he was this big national radio star, uh, big ratings all across the country. But who was Paul Harvey? Paul Harvey was the guy who sold the boardroom point of view to working Americans. And he was pro-Vietnam War. He was anti-desegregation. Uh, uh, and, and he, uh, without being as obviously uh, evil as Rush Limbaugh, was able to 
uh, really program brainwash is a little strong, but he he really did have an impact on middle America, Nixon's silent majority, uh, and schooling them that, uh, you know, these young long hairs who just want to do drugs and have sex in public uh, and disrupt the, uh, the war in Vietnam were the real threat uh, to America. And so I worked overnight. And Did you ever I meet him? See Paul. Oh, I talk to him all the time. He would he would say good day to me. <laughs> good day. <laughs> I, I was leaving. I was leaving the building at quarter to five as he was coming in, and I have a lot of respect for him as a broadcaster and a, a guy who was really dedicated to his work, his work ethic. Uh, he drove a Plymouth, and he he parked under Wacker Drive in Chicago, and insisted on plugging his own meters. Uh, he would only allow his producer to go down during his half-hour show. Uh, he declined the offer for a free parking space uh, from one of our uh, uh, greased-up employees, a guy who uh, had a full-time no-show job as a superintendent of streets and sanitation. And he said, Mr. Harvey, uh, you can park right next to this street sweeper. Uh, they only go out at night. <laughs> Right. And Harvey, Harvey was Mr. Clean. He wouldn't do that. But, uh, you know, he was on the board of major corporations at the time, insurance companies. I think for a while he was on the board of Sears. Uh, and so he really was very effective uh, in propagandizing uh, middle America and keeping them uh, uh, quiet <laughs> as their wages didn't go up. But of course, with the inflation spiral of the 70s, their cost of living went way up. And he taught them just to suck it up, grin and bear it, because you're an American, you're a patriot. Right. So, uh, you know, we, we really haven't changed that much. It's just gotten slicker. And uh, the concentration of media and the people who run it uh, they promote this capitalist message that, uh, you know, what you and Adnan were talking about was, uh, you know, small s socialism. And, of course, the knee-jerk reaction is to call anything that, uh, you know, shares the wealth communism, because we all know that's evil and it's Stalin and Lenin and right. Khrushchev and, and all that. So... Uh, <laughs> In that respect, I think, sadly, things have only gotten worse. Uh, interesting. Not better. Great. That's interesting. I mean, I, Paul, I'm interested about Paul Harvey because I remember listening to him and he was compelling. He used silences. He really knew how to capture an audience. He was a great communicator. He also taught Rachel Maddow how to do an opening monologue. And that is take any news story and start from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Rachel Maddow does that and Paul Harvey did it. So, it does, you know, uh, there was a young man who wanted to be president and he had a rich father <laughs> and uh, he served in the Pacific and almost died when his PT boat was cut in half by a uh, Japanese destroyer. And then you and go, after this commercial, I'll tell you the rest of the story. That man <laughs> arrived in Dallas today to a cheering crowd. You know, that's how he would report the Kennedy asset. The, 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 and that man is John F. Kennedy, who was shot to death today. I mean, he would take the headline and work, start from the bottom of the story and go and it becomes a story if you if it's a, it's a it was a great exercise in storytelling rachel maddow learned that from him if just take a news story and start with the least important information build to the top it's the inverted pyramid right. uh, all of yeah. a sudden they go wow he's a storyteller um, was he? Okay, I bet he. I have, I have. I have one more quick story about yes, Paul Harvey. Yeah, I wanted to ask. As you. I mentioned, I mostly worked at night, 
But uh, at one point, I scored an interview with Roger Daltrey, uh, the lead singer of The Who. Right. And he had a concert that night, so he couldn't come in for a live interview. But he agreed to tape one. So I come in uh, about 11 a.m. And the recording studio we had was a tiny little booth adjacent to the Paul Harvey studio. And there was a control room in between them and glass all around. So uh, Daltrey shows up with four young women. Hmm. And uh, he insisted that the groupies join us in this tiny phone booth of a studio for the interview. And uh, I was not in a position to, <laughs> to say no. So uh, we go in, we do the interview, and uh, I said, uh, Roger, you want to introduce these young ladies? And he said, well, I don't know their names. <laughs> That's great. He said, he said, but God bless the groupies. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, lovely. And so the next day, I get one of these official memos on a special ABC radio uh, memo form. And we called it a ton of bricks memo because that's when they really drop a ton of bricks on you mm -hmm. for some perceived failing. And Harvey had gone to uh, my station manager and said, I don't know who these people are, but don't ever let them come into my studio again. Who <laughs> and, is the and who? He wanted, me, he wanted me to be fired for that. Wow. And yes, he did, he did not know who was the who. <laughs> what a prick. What a, at least, good. That, that's, uh, so he wasn't a nice guy. But in, uh, he, he was unfailingly polite. Right. But no, he was not a nice guy. Yeah, <laughs> makes makes sense. Really interesting. Um, J. Edgar Hoover, Aaron Sorkin, being the Ricardos. Have you had just watched it? Right. Just watched it over the weekend. Yeah, Aaron Sorkin uh, is a disgrace. Uh, the West Wing, which I still watch, is a lesson in learning to expect less from your government, to have high expectations, but expect less with your high expectations. He's a disgrace. Being the Ricardos has one of the most offensive endings to a movie that purports to be uh, politically salient. J. Edgar Hoover is the hero in that movie, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, let me say that uh, I was not a regular West Wing watcher. I maybe watched three episodes and how long was it on? But um, I do think that Sorkin has uh, remarkable skills. I thought his uh, uh, screenplay for the Chicago 7 was a good way to uh, explain that history to a new generation which knew nothing about it. And I think that the technique he used with the Ricardos was interesting. But uh, I would uh, bet any J. Edgar Hoover fan, five American dollars, that that call never took place. <laughs> and that this is a complete uh, fictionalization to resolve the uh, central crisis if, in this fictional week of uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz's uh, life. Uh, and, and, you know, I appreciate the, what Hollywood does. It's, it's not a documentary, and uh, he does have a considerable uh, license. But I agree with you that uh, he ended up, uh, I, I mean, Hoover it's a complicated history. He he was jealous of McCarthy's power to bring people down. And he helped bring down Joe McCarthy. Uh, uh, not because he was opposed to the red baiting and to the blacklisting of uh, people who had barely any connection to the American Communist Party. Uh, but it was just about power. Mm -hmm. And McCarthy... 
uh, arrogated power to himself with the help of a young uh, Robert F. Kennedy and Roy Cohn, the most odious, uh, you know, American lawyer in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, so I, I share your rejection of the ending, and, and you know, we'll leave it at that for people who you haven't know seen it. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to be a to total spoiler. Well, I, I, you can't ruin that movie. It's already been ruined. The, the, the story is that Lucille Ball was accused of being a red, more than a red head, a red, and the, by Walter Winchell. And the way it ends is she's cleared by J. Edgar Hoover. There's a big speech that Desi gives and and he, she's got J. Ed, he's got J. Edgar Hoover on the phone saying she's not a communist and everybody applauds. And I went, F you, Aaron Sorkin. You just made <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover a hero. And it reminded me of that Muppet lady in 2008 who stood up at a McCain rally and said, I don't like Obama. He's a Muslim. And McCain said, no, 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 he's a good man. And uh, we just have a difference of opinion. And everybody said two things. One is how out of control the Republicans were getting with the Islamophobia, but also how heroic McCain was to say that he was a good man. What, what he didn't say is, he, he said he's not a Muslim. That's, he said, no, he's not a Muslim. He's a good man. And you, what should he have said, Peter B. Collins? Well, this was a, a, a sister soldier moment for John McCain. Because one of his fans articulated what many of the other fans were thinking, and he was able to <clears throat> separate himself from it without actually denouncing it. He should have said, what does it matter if he's a Muslim? It shouldn't, ma it shouldn't matter. And the, the message that- But, but that, would, that would negate the Islamophobia that was a central part of the Republican base at that time. So he was very clever. It, as I say, you know, and, and if people don't know my reference, Bill Clinton uh, dumped on Sister Soldier uh, in the way that Barack Obama dumped on Reverend Wright uh, to try to prove things to certain elements of their political base. And as I was reading about Stacey Abrams today, and how she is seen as both a moderate and a progressive by Georgia Democrats, she, I think, will be looking for a sister soldier moment to try to win some redneck votes because she knows that the actual progressive voter cells in Georgia are never going to vote for uh, David Perdue or Brian Kemp if he survives uh, Trump's effort to uh, dump him. Right. So the, the, this is a standard political tactic. Sister Soldier, graduate of Dwight Morrow High School. She went to my high school. She made a statement in 92. She was a rapper, is a rapper. It would be, she said it would be great if black people took a break from killing each other and started shooting white people, something to that extent, uh, which kind of made sense. You know, she was speaking out against black on black violence. Why are we attacking our own? We're not the ones who are making our lives miserable. It's white people. And then Clinton used that to separate himself just enough from the black community to bring some white voters in. And But with the knowledge that those black voters were wedged in to support him. Right. Right. Where else they are they going to go? Well, they weren't going to support Ross Perot or Poppy Bush. Right. And the thing with McCain was he didn't have the courage to say, what does it matter if Barack Obama is a Muslim? He said, when she said he's a Muslim, he said, no, he's a good man. And Aaron Sorkin 
the, the question should have been, what did it matter if Lucille Ball was a communist? And why are we depending on the FBI to clear someone's name? Why, why does J. Edgar Hoover have the power to be judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to persecuting somebody because of what their ideology may or may not have been? Uh, he touched on it a little, but to make J. Edgar Hoover the, the hero of that movie... He's a, he's a, you know, anyway, what are your last thoughts? I talked too much today. What, what are your last thoughts? Uh, I, I just want to yield to the gentle lady and the expert on the dark matter from the great state of Illinois. David, I, I've enjoyed our conversation, but uh, the professor is standing by. And we're on time today. I really no. enjoyed this. We're a half hour late. <laughs> oh, we are a half hour late? <laughs> How are we a half hour late? Thanks for indulging us, Marianne. Uh, she was she was scheduled for 9.30. Oh, no, great combo. According to the memo You know, it's I got. kind of funny that uh, you were talking about uh, that unfortunate Uber driver. Um, I, I That just reminded me that uh, Kamala Harris's brother-in-law was the lawyer for Uber. His that name is pass- Tony, Tony West. Tony is his West, name. right. And he had helped uh, push, they had lobbied for this, I think it was Proposition 22, that declared Uber drivers independent contractors, not employees. Yes, so. it overturned a state law that had defined them as employees. Right. And that was a very, that was a big win for Uber. And Tony West bragged about that and, and his connections to his sister-in-law. And, you know, it's just it, it's just part of that mentality. I mean, the idea, I'm sure these people think of themselves as kind of basically good people. I don't think they revel in, you know, like being the evil league. But, you know, when you just think of the human misery that you know, their actions result in, because they're trying to win at a game, a political game, an economic game, a game of influence. It's, it's just, uh, you know, don't make uh, heroes out of your politicians. Right. David well, Plouffe. Uber, Uber, Uber first came for the taxi drivers and <clears throat> nobody said anything because they weren't taxi drivers. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> David Plouffe, who got Obama elected is um, one of the advisors to Uber. And uh, what's her name? Huffington, Ariana Huffington is on the board. She's still around. She's on the board of directors of Uber. Blog for me, blog. (laughs) That's how she founded the Huffington Post by getting writers to write for free. Blog for me, darling, blog for me. I met her, she used to hang out at the Bill Maher show. She would blog for me and I went, Blog <laughs> back in her face. Blah. Well, David, I, I've I've uh, I'm way over time here, but uh, I will promise if we do that fundraiser for yes, Adnan thank you and for the that. Rahima Foundation. Yes, I mm-hmm. will tell you several stories about uh, Ariana Huffington and her one-time husband Michael, who tried to buy a Senate seat here in oh, California. That's right. Is about him going to rent boy parties. <laughs> which is, were documented. No, they kept that under wraps. Uh, I'll talk about his rent boy had, parties. I had the last um, uh, confrontational interview with Michael Huffington before uh, his campaign advisors said, uh, you're not doing any more interviews. We're just doing TV ads and we've got dirt on Diane Feinstein. So just shut up and we'll get you into office. Ariana ran him for office promising to deny social security uh, uh, going after illegal undocumented workers depriving them of health care and it was to root out what was it to 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 make they they discovered that feinstein had a uh an undocumented housekeeper for a while no i'm talking about was it 182 there was some proposition oh 182 was the ballot measure that uh was four-fifths unconstitutional that 
purported to deal with uh, uh, migration from Mexico. Right. They like and, they couldn't go know, to public a, schools. It, they couldn't get health care. Right. That was Ariana Huffington. It's a, it's, a, it's a federal matter. And, uh, you know, that's why four fifths of it were declared unconstitutional. The other piece that Huffington funded was the three strikes law. And they uh, uh, cynically use the kidnap and murder of Polly Class right. to uh, drive through God, you got a the great ballot memory. measure. What a great memory. Well, wow. I was there. <laughs> so I'll save that for a, yeah. a, a future show. Right. And she wrote Contract with America for Gingrich, as I remember. Did she, did I don't know really? about that. It, wow. it's, pos it's possible, but I, I don't recall that. I think it was a bunch of uh, focus groups that developed the contract. Uh, but to you be know, continued. I, I can't deny it. I just don't I don't recall that part. Thank you, Peter. A lot of fun. Thank you. My pleasure, David. Peter B. Collins dot okay. com for a treasure trove of his radio show podcasts and highlights. Thank you, sir. Mary Ann Cummings is a physicist, a professor, as well as an elected official. She was elected Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois. You are the real deal. I'm beginning. I, I mentioned you at the top of the show about, you know, fighting within or fighting without. I still believe that we can. Uh, Here's what I said at the beginning of the show, and then we'll talk about whatever you want to. If the left can't take control of the Democratic Party, which is ripe for a takeover, then they they don't deserve, nor can they take control of our government. If if we can't have a revol lead a revolution within the Democratic Party that started with Bernie and the squad, if we can't finish their work in the Democratic Party, then the left doesn't deserve to take over the, the levers of power of government. Well, um, yeah, I, I don't know what even is on Bernie Sanders' minds. I don't read minds, but it. I just feel, I really feel this achingly clear that a real movement that he was starting by his two campaigns, I think has just floundered on the shores of, you know, trying to like salvage a Democratic Party whose primary target is them, not the Republicans. <laughs> I mean, you know, Mitch McConnell and, and, and Chuck Schumer are friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Democratic leadership is uh, not really particularly uh, uh, afraid of another Republican takeover because they certainly aren't acting like it they were, but they certainly were were afraid and motivated and spurned into immediate action when uh, it was when Bernie Sanders threatened to win the nomination. And they do that. They, they basically were concerned about the influence, the possible influence of of the squad and of some of the progressives. And now they aren't. Yeah, Twitter's not going to like cancel the uh, the accounts of the squad. They're not. I mean, the corporate America is not afraid of them. I mean, they they're a branding issue. They are something that Nancy Pelosi now will trot out to like brag about how inclusive the Democratic Party is and uh, basically ignore them. I mean, so far that we have seen. So, I mean, but it was a good shot. I think that there, but. You know, as I said earlier, there are other people coming up the ranks to uh, to, to have their shot at, uh, at 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 taking on power within the Democratic Party. So and is it fair to say that instead of worrying about whether or not the Dems keep the House and the Senate, it's more important to use this year to clean house, to get rid of the corporate Democrats to support all primary challenges coming from the left. Mm -hmm. And we measure our success by how many corporate Democrats lose. 
to a primary. I mean, challenge. that's one measure of success because you can, when you look at now that the Democrats do have, you know, have the House and Senate and the White House for now, uh, you know, what are they doing with it? And if they're doing essentially nothing with it, uh, then it, it, you have to ask who is standing in the way of Medicare for all. It isn't Mitch McConnell. You know, it's it's people like Chuck Schumer. It's people like who is the uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee? Al, uh, Alex Neil, Richie Neal. Huh? Richie Neal. Oh, Rich, yes. Richard Neal. It's people like that. It's, you know, these are the people who are standing in the way of any of this getting passed. So, you know, you just have to focus. And it doesn't even have to be so much negative focused. You just have to, like, basically pick one or two things that you will you know, that are non-negotiable demands once you have power and run with them right and it, you know they don't part of the problem i think i was discussing it maybe on office hours about you know uh a bernie inspired group which is the progressives of king county is that you know, you we have a problem spreading ourselves too thin and we have a problem of staying to a lane in our lanes enough to actually get something done. Now, the, uh, in early 2017, when the Democratic Party was still reeling from the results of the November election, we were just right in there getting petitions, running for office. Several of our group made it to office. I was one of them. And, you know, so we were very focused and very and and very successful. Then a lot of groups looked to us and were trying to get us to help them with this and that and the other thing. And I saw a little bit of our energy dissipate. And I said, guys, these are a lot of regular Democratic groups who otherwise really are against us. <laughs> a lot of fraud. We need right. to. It's not like we have to like be in an open fight with any of them. We just have to, you know, like just focus on what we do well. And we recruit and we get people to run for local office. And we also sponsor and, uh, and promote and endorse uh, uh, progressive candidates running for any office at any level. We've, uh, we've already endow uh, endorsed four candidates. There's several others. We had a very interesting little office hours and hours discussion because one of our there is another person who is, did not run for public office, but is a librarian in our chat room. And you know, we were discussing who's on his library board up there in St. Charles, Illinois. And uh, so it, it's like these are the kinds of it, these are the kinds of offices we want to get people in. Absolutely. Because when you talk about it, you, you talk about a deep bench, but you also have to get a culture going, accepting yes. certain things. Yes. You know, like now it is utterly acceptable on in the park district on the board to talk about single payer and talk about fifteen dollar minimum wage and talk about social equity. And even we've got our Republican executive director of the park district talking about wage compression, meaning like, let's keep a limit on the top wages and start raising the bottom wages, you know? So you, you just, uh, so now the ideas that are like Bernie ideas are not, are not at all. Uh, they, they are, they're not at all radical. And they're friendly. Right. You know? it's, it's like, we don't have to be divisive over these issues when you, I, when you really explained them, uh, I was listening to a bit of your show earlier. Uh, I didn't quite get her name, but it was Howie Klein is uh, so endorsing a candidate, though I think for the third congressional district of New York you were talking to earlier today. Mm -hmm. And she talked about you can approach things like Medicare for all without immediately having to be divisive. Like, this is what I'm for. What are you for? You know, no, right. you can talk to people. Like the way Bernie approaches this, like, you know, imagine if you didn't have to worry about co-pays, if you didn't have a, if, if you didn't hesitate to go to the ER because of like, oh my God, what is this going to cost me? You just went when you were sick right? and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's uh, Melanie. Melanie Darigo, Darigo, Darigo 2020.com. People need to give money to Thank her. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn. Yeah. And so. The, the thing that I would like to do with office hours is we have a very powerful Zoom uh, platform. Uh, you know, I pay extra mm -hmm. for it. 
we can be doing fundraisers for local politicians who are vetted by the community throughout the week. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I, what you you said that it was just fantastic because the right understands it. They're they're going mm -hmm. to the school boards. People need right. to run for office as you did. You were a Bernie delegate, and then he said, "Run, run, run, run," and you heard him, and you ran for Parks Commission of Aurora, Illinois. And I I cannot stress this enough it it's the ground up without the, mm -hmm. the without a ground game we can't change anything and a ground game means politicians at the local level who are to the left and not corporate mm -hmm. democrats and run Everybody should run and pay attention. My sister has been talking about this, that she's so fed up. She's got Josh Gottheimer as her congressperson yeah. who, who won't hold a town hall because the man is trading millions of dollars in Microsoft stock and other uh, plays in the market. This is a disgrace. But she says on a local level, she is inspired every day by her local city council, the school board. Every day she has hope. Uh, One of the other things that we're doing, um, because we have, we're the progressives of King County, so we are not, we're certainly not a democratic organization, but there are people who are organizing to recruit precinct committeemen. Uh, progressive precinct committee persons for the Democratic Party. And, you know, you anybody can do that. Um, and it doesn't take much. It's like 10 signatures. And it's, again, it's the kind of thing that people don't even think of doing. Most, com most committeemen are appointed, not elected. And the appointees, yes, they, they can have influence, but the elected committeemen get a vote on important issues in the party. So that's one of these things that goes underneath the radar. Um, after the uh, after the 2016 election, I was the precinct committee person. And uh, after the 2016 election, in retaliation for anybody who was a Bernie bro, I mean, the, the uh, Democratic Party just decided to run heavily funded for precinct committee people, which no, normally don't cost anything to run. You go door to door. But, you know, they, they basically took a bunch of us out and didn't bother running anybody in the precincts that didn't have anybody representing them. And then they ended up appointing them. So that's how that went. But that's kind of that way. That was four years ago. And now they're just kind of like they're distracted once again. And COVID has distracted everybody. So we're, uh, we're going to just, you know, quietly get people uh, – get people to run for precinct committee person. When I was precinct committee person, I, you know, most people who are Democrats, they really don't you know, like a lot of people. They're not heavily political that, you know, they've been Democrats all their life. And when, when somebody comes to the door and they talk about a candidate, like I did Bernie, Hey, guy sounds great. You know, that's a, for the most part, if you have a one-on-one -on -one connection with voters, um, they're much more likely to vote for your candidate when they've had a personal connection. So there, there's you know, a hive um, think that takes hold in the party where where right. they there becomes this received wisdom that you don't challenge because it's just accepted that the only way the Democrats can win, this is what the Clintons did, they, they, the received wisdom was the only way the Democrats could win is if they were the party of corporate America, pro-business and pro-Wall Street. So the idea that on a local level that the Democrats would challenge a Target or a Walmart from coming in or a Starbucks mm -hmm. at the expense of the mom right. and pops, the received wisdom is no. These these box stores, these franchises are good for our tax base. 
without it being challenged when in fact they're not good for the tax base they're bad for the city how does aurora how are you doing fighting these big box stores uh a lot of aurora we just had a walmart that left and uh that was the walmart's at the at the other end of the west side of town uh, it's been tough because COVID has intervened, but there was a movement two years ago that's picking up again to take, instead of getting another big box store in there, which would just one decision made by one company, and then you've got several hundred jobs gone, turn that into a mall, you know, because it's a nice big interior with many, many small businesses that there are plenty of little state grants. We've got the the DECA grants from the state of Illinois, which is uh, economic development grants. And and have just kind of promote very small, very local business so that if a couple businesses go out of business, you don't have a debacle like we did when uh, Caterpillar closed shop a few years back, when John Deere closed shop, you know, several years before that, when Walmart's left several years ago i mean there was a lot of you know that 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 took a lot of jobs weren't great paying jobs but um but the the city of aurora it's a very diverse area and even though john lash who was on your show and ran uh early last year even though he lost because he ran our mayor had to do a whole bunch of stuff you know to show that well you know He's wrong. I'm, I'm on top of all of this stuff, including a, a citizen's board for the police. Right. So uh, and we also handed him uh, a couple of losses for which he's still pissed. But it was a great day. I mean, you know, my my first day in my second term, I uh, as park as the one of the park commissioners, I get an irate phone call from City Hall and an irate phone call from my executive director of the park district because you know i had spoken out at a city council meeting and you know that's the details are are kind of boring but the bottom line is we won we won and they're pissed right and you're an elected official you're an elected official you're allowed you answer to the people that's the thing you know i think people uh i get, get get over upset get get very too upset over the fact that people are pissed off at them. Now, I've had a whole lifetime of people being pissed off at me, so I'm kind of used to it. I figure if you're if people aren't getting pissed off at you, it's you're probably not doing anything. I mean, that's not a hard fast rule, but the thing is is that, you know, there is an idea in the Democratic Party, for instance, that you have to support that we have to be friendly to big business, but a big chunk of that is self-serving on the part of the candidates who are supported by those big businesses. In other words, a whole pile of things could get done within the Democratic Party, but they couldn't get done and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and all the leadership be in their positions of power because the only reason they're in their positions of power is because they keep the party in line. They get the money because the donors know they are reliable votes. Nancy Pelosi does not only knows how to count the votes, she appears to be able to keep people, to bring people to heel with enough threats and cajoling and things. So anyway, they are they are loyal servants to the to those that brought them. So if you are going to threaten that, they're not going to be nice to you. I once interviewed sort of have to be uh, years ago, I interviewed a city manager in Southern California who purported to be a liberal. And I I asked him about the big box stores. And I mm-hmm. said, do you have the power, if you had the political will, could you ban the big box stores? Could you ban McDonald's, any franchises from coming into the city through zoning and make it an entire city of mom and pops. I remember, I think it's San Bernardino. I remember driving through, it might have been San Bernardino on the central coast in California, this this tree-lined main street. This must have been 12 years ago. I mean, this is the most beautiful city I've ever been in, in California. What is it? And I looked around, it was a main street devoid of franchises. 
And I asked one of the shopkeepers, I think it was San Bernardino, and she said, yeah, we don't allow, we zone the franchises out of here. We don't allow a Starbucks. We don't allow McDonald's. If you're, is that legal? Can you do that? Can it, can it, can you zone out? You uh, can certainly uh, zoning look. They, that's why, like local government to first order, you know, for years and years was like real estate people because yeah, there's a lot they can do. Is in terms of they decide what gets built, what doesn't get built. There's a lot of power in uh, on these uh, in city hall. Um, and, and if you people understand, I know in, in Santa Fe that you can't make a McDonald's and make it look like a McDonald's. It has to be Adobe. It has to be charming looking. It has to conform. You can't have it sticking out like a sore thumb. And you can you can force these places to like pay minimum wage. But can you ban? Can you ban fast food outlets from a city? Can you say there? I know in New York City uh, they banned. Uh, a, a Walmart. They wouldn't allow Walmart to come in. Well, didn't they? And aren't that, there Facebook. areas in New York City where like Burger King had to be kosher? I mean, like Burger King had kosher versions of everything they they but offer. But that, that's business. I mean, I mean if, if it's in, you know, yeah. Corona Heights, they're going to be kosher. But in terms of okay. what kind of power does a city have to create business and keep the money in the city oh they they have a lot of power i mean there there is a lot of power they have the power to in as i said just the zoning laws the big battle that we won was that a donor to the new the newly reelected mayor wanted to expand his gas station to a place that was a kind of charming old it was a is kitty corner uh, from where they had their current gas station, but it was an old farmstead area. It was wetland. Plus, it was part of the uh, recently incorporated to Aurora place where people were were not getting city water. They were getting well water. And they incorporated with the specific proviso that they would never change the zoning, that this would always be either open space or residential would not be commercial. And, you know, we don't have to go on and on about, you know, the runoff from gas stations per year. But, you know, when you're in an area with, that is getting well water, that's an issue. We won that battle. Um, but yeah, but that's, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that we blocked that uh, could have gotten done through City Hall because we worked through our aldermen. I mean, the mayor can do, um, most of the stuff that the mayors do is kind of, unopposed but you know you get one or two aldermen who are speaking out and then you make an issue out of it and then you bring the press into it um i think the reason why i got in trouble which you know was not trouble at all but the reason why i got everybody pissed was that uh, uh a they got a certain uh reporter for a certain local newspaper to say that i was speaking for the park district when i was speaking out when i clearly was not but, you know, it's and I'm certainly allowed to speak out, but it's, you know, they, they try to do this kind of nonsense, you know, to look, I had I had a problem with, early on with the uh, head of the school board. Again, another very influential position, not paid. And these people are trying to nickel. And I mean, there are a bunch of people who don't want their taxes to go up. And the head of the school board was just all this outrageous lying about publicly about how I was conniving with the park, the executive director of the park district to funnel thousands and thousands of tax dollars to, I mean, it was, it was clearly a lie and everybody knew it was a lie. It still kind of bothered me. I mean, when I first heard it, it was kind of a shock, you know, and it, it, you know, it happens, but then it actually happens and it's a shock, but then you get over it, you know, and that's what, if you get over people just, you know, being in contention with you and you don't take it personally, it's very important, then it's fine. Look, I think that's why Bernie Sanders has been able to be so independent. He never joined the Democratic Party because he gets enough flack from Democrats to remind him that, you know, they don't really like him. And that allows him to just sort of, you know, uh, you know, he's built 
a position of power and influence, mostly influence, that does not rely on the Democratic Party whatsoever. So, right. What did you I want know, to talk? To what, what was on your mind? I, I kind of. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, I, I just come here. You know, there was uh, I did notice something that they're not charging. They are dismissing all uh, uh, inquiries into this nursing home scandal. Um, <laughs> remember Cuomo, yeah. uh, you know, w- early in COVID, he first required homes to accept COVID positive patients when the hospitals were overflowing. And why were they overflowing? Because Cuomo and others had been over the years closing down hospitals to save money and, uh, and wanted to further close down uh, hospitals in the middle of a pandemic. So it was engulfing the it was engulfing the hospitals. So they wanted these nursing homes to accept positive COVID positive patients, and then he hid the real data about the deaths in nursing homes for a long time. And so a certain you know bunch of investigations revealed that, and that maybe he was his actions were responsible for tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, but that's been dismissed because they got rid of him on uh, sexual harassment charges. So they're not looking into that, nor right. are they looking into the fact that he was doing it as a favor to his donors who were private nursing home, you know, uh, managers. So it's interesting uh, anyway. not to discount, not to discount sexual assault. No, but and I would never do that, by the way. Right. But. You can kill 20, how many thousands of old people? Oh, they were like 40,000 that had died in, in, in nursing homes. You, and that was just in the first few months of COVID. But, but, and, kiss, you know, but, I've heard but, numbers of he was, he was directly responsible for upwards of 16,000 nursing home deaths by his actions. Right. That's okay. And uh, that's okay. But yeah. whisper into an employee's ear, Cara mia, you got to go. Not to discount, I mean, he <laughs> he should have gone, but he should have gone for that. But he should also mm-hmm. go for killing people. But Yeah, but, you know, that was just business. So, uh, you right. know, uh, that's just the way it, that's just the way it goes. They're not, they're not. Uh, there pro- is a, there is a new law that's going into effect. And ironically, it was, I think, one of the last bills that old Trumpy signed into law, which uh, was the No Surprises Act. Did anybody remember that? No surprise that bills. Was, it was the uh, No Surprises Act. Basically, one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest problems with the Affordable Care Act, one of the major loopholes, was that you know um, people in emergencies. Uh, go to specialists or specialists are called in while they're on the operating table that are out of network. And suddenly you're hit with a $30,000, $50,000 bill that your uh, insurance provider won't pay for. And, you know, so that was enough to get bipartisan support on. However, not without a lot of haggling, it's not just a flat fee. It's it basically sets up an arbitration process, which is more complication. But nonetheless, it, it does address this. It, it kicked into effect January first, so it kicked into effect uh, on Saturday. But you know, uh, the other thing that it doesn't do is that it, for some reason, uh, ambulance rides have not are not covered by this. But emergency helicopter rides are. Okay. So it's um so that's a step. It's it's a small step. It's one of these incremental sort of, you know, things. But on the other hand, there is a way for people not to get hit and thrown into bankruptcy with enormous bills that they mostly had you know, this is not a, when you are dying or bleeding or something, you know, you're not in a position to go shopping for services. You know, you have to sort of and, and in many areas, there is no choices. You have to take this ambulance. You have to go to this trauma center. You have, you know, so it's 
I, I think that more and more when these things get explained publicly, you will see the kind of Rube Goldbergian nonsense you have to go through to solve problems like this in a system where we still have to entrench the for-profit uh, uh, insurance providers, as well as the for-profit hospitals and big pharma and the whole nine yards. So anyway, I think that- um, Why do we allow it? That will be- Why do we allow it? Money. That. So why do we, why does the 99%? Why do we allow it? Because we were told that we have to have to suck it up and vote blue no matter who. That, you know, eating half a bowl of excrement is better than a whole bowl of excrement. And, you know, so on. I mean, our, our stance. Well, that is true. The West, that is true. As somebody who's You been, mentioned the West Wing, and I did watch the West Wing and was rather amazed by it for a long time. I mean, it wasn't a very hyper-articulate show that managed, right. you know, to be for a little. But on the other hand, it, it sort of lulled a bunch of us in the back of our minds that, no, the president isn't this idiot, you know, like cocaine brain damaged, you know, psychopath, skion of a CIA dude. He, no, he's really a Nobel Prize winning liberal from right. the Northeast. And that was in the back. So we could tune in every day and see a universe where, you know, some of the Republicans actually had principles and the Democrats actually had a spine. And it was like total fantasy land. And we could just, it was like shooting up. Like, but equally oh, ineffectual, Joel Bartlett mm -hmm. was as in a, ineffectual as Bill Clinton. Right. Huh. I would not have been able to say that 10 years ago, but I actually looked back and said, holy crap, they really seduced and bamboozled, bamboozled us the same way Obama did. <laughs> the same way. It's like, yeah, they it was, did it it again. Was, the whole message of the West Wing is people with good intentions, people yeah. who think of themselves as lefties, hyper educated white men and women come to Washington and they learn to grow up. They learn to grow well, up hyper, and compromise and give up. What? I'd say hyper-credentialed people come to Washington hyper and get their minds right. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and growing uh, up means giving up. That's the message from Aaron Sorkin's yeah. West Wing. You grow up by giving up. Only a child yeah. refuses to compromise everything they believe in. That's the Aaron Sorkin message. Yeah, I know. But, I, you know, that was, look, that was an era where we still believed that Obama could be a FDR transformative scale president. I mean, I, I wanted to believe, I wanted to have hope even after he, you know, disappointed me bitterly in this first year as senator. I still wanted to hope that, no, this is part of a long range plan. You know, it's done. He's going to land this. He's, he's going to land this. Right. <laughs> when I did, watched the West Wing, I, I believed, th but for, uh, what's his name? Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton would be giving us free health care. That's how stupid I was. But for the Republicans. Well, you know, you can blame uh, Thomas Frank for like popping that bubble for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have to say that his book did radicalize me quite a bit. And then when you go back, you can see a whole bunch of things making sense finally. That, oh, this is, <laughs> they, they danced with who brought them. Of course they did that. And they really, it was a shortcut. I mean, you really want to think that you've hit on a new technology or you've hit on a new idea that allows you not to work as hard. Believe me, I don't want to work hard. If there is a new idea in physics or mathematics that cuts through a lot of ugly crap, I'm, I'm on all for it. But, you know, this going to Wall Street, going to we're going to have a tech, technocracy. And of course, these people is going to be very diverse and we will, you know, we will no longer have the problem of, of prejudice or sexism or racism or anything like that. And of course, we'll do good for everybody. And it was a shortcut. And then once people are comfortable 
you're feeling less urgent about the discomfort of the people you just left or the neighborhood you just left. You know, right. it's like, well, you know, it's just it's just one of those things. You have to grow up and accept hard things, hard, hard things for other people. Notice that it's the other it's right. the hardship. Right. Yeah. The hard decisions are not you losing your job or your kids losing health care or dying. The hard decisions are somebody else's kids you know, dying someplace and you and losing their health care and losing their jobs. So, you know, it's it's just a, it, yeah, it, it's a learning process. I think that's why people need to get involved in politics because it is sobering. I mean, I was just going through our budget again and I'm still looking over the fact that uh, one company seems to be getting an awful lot of construction work, both for the park district and the city. And, you know, I want to see their, you know, I want to see their bidding. I want to see all the bids I want to see. And I think even my being there asking this question, which former boards that were appointed never asked, I think that even somebody watching, like, makes people behave, even when they don't have to behave because, right. you know, all that powerful? No, but uh, it would be kind of unpleasant if Marianne caught something, you know, so they don't. So you show up. And but so it gives you also appreciation like these guys aren't my enemy at all. I mean, a lot of people are working extremely hard. As I said, people are working extremely hard, even in completely corrupt systems, just to get things working so that some other constituents are taken care of. You know, it's it's hard work. And so you appreciate that. So you're not just a bull in a china shop. You know, people I've been accused of wanting to throw bombs I'm the opposite of a bomb thrower. You know, I, I may just offend a few people. That's not being a bomb thrower. <laughs> you know, that might question a few people's cherished beliefs. But I actually have a respect for the people that show up and do anything at all. And, uh, but, you know, you have to be able to just call out people when they're wrong. Uh, I'm thinking that this next wave of people who are going to be running for Congress are, you know, they're not going to have time for the performative nonsense. You yeah. know, they're not going to. They, OK, the, the, the squad got to have their their covers, uh, their cover shots and Vanity Fair and all that. But I think the people that are coming up are really ready to, you know, to do the work. Last question. And we got to keep pushing. them. Yes, yeah, sure. Last question. Uh very quickly, January 6th, what do the Democrats mm -hmm. do if it passes without any activity? Oh, I have no idea what they're going to do. Because That's, I that think will be bad for fundraising, running. correct? Yeah, I think they're planning on using that as their, you know, stand in for all the other crap that they didn't get done. I mean, what's left of Build Back Better? I mean, it's it's just, you know, there's just a tsunami of lobbyists hitting back the the small tattered remains of any kind of progressive policy that right. is in that bill right now. And uh, I just don't see. And there's zero, absolutely zero fight for Voting Rights Act for, you know, at least temporarily suspending the the filibuster it, there, there just seems to be zero political will from the leadership for any of that so you know um it'll be if if we lose it all it will be because of the democratic party creating a vacuum we we knew what the republicans were the democrats were the vacuum that refused to stand up and offer an alternative. Mm -hmm. Professor Marianne well, Cummings, thank you. I hope to see you Thursday. Yep. Thank you. Let us now go to Denton, Texas, where Professor Mike Steinell has been waiting, and he is the, uh, the band leader for this travesty of a show but we can't seem to get him in. Are you are you there, sir? We did I disconnect you? Well, unmute, ask to start video. Professor Mike Steinell, there you are. Well, almost. We're at Mike's place. Hi, hey, David. 
It's good to see you, sir. Uh, Did you have a nice New Year's? Pretty tame. I think I'm into bed at nine. Professor Mike Steinel is a jazz trumpeter, composer, educator, member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from 1987 to 2019. He is the author of several highly acclaimed books on jazz, including Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, his latest is Running the Changes. It's also about jazz. You can listen to his latest release, Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet, featuring Rosanna Eckert. <clears throat> it's out on Origin Records. And Saving Charlie Parker is your latest detective novel. Is that correct? I would call it's a uh, it's jazz history and time travel. Jazz history and time travel. And yeah, I don't. I, I do. I have two. Um, what would you call them? Mystery novels. The Lake House, which you can find on for free on YouTube. The Lake House, one word. Lake House, part I, part one, with a Roman numeral. But you know, more importantly, I am a member of the David Feldman Book Club. Look at that. Look at that. I've got uh, Virtue Hoarders. I'm holding up for those who aren't on the YouTube, I'm holding up Virtue Hoarders, which is great, by Catherine Liu. And I just got uh, yesterday, Somewhere in L.A., by Jose Orero. I say? Arroyo. It's great. Everybody loves Arroyo. it. Yeah, yes. Arroyo. Yeah, Arroyo. Sure. And, God, we haven't seen it in a while, but it's a very funny book. It's a funny thing. Mike Rowe, How I Comedy Writing Made Me Fat and Bald. I have to have anyway, him back. I, I, um, you know what? I buy all the books you recommend. Yes. And it comes with the Feldman guarantee that if you don't enjoy the books, Professor Mike Steinel will reimburse you. For, no, I will, <laughs> I will reimburse you for these books. Uh, my, uh, Mike what, Rowe what has to come back. Get, what if you get deluged with actual people that say, I didn't, I didn't like the book. I want my... Uh, I want my four dollars and ninety eight cents. Jose's book is great. It's great. Uh, <laughs> it's cartoons, and uh, I think <laughs> I love this one here. It's a whole four, five people in black costume, and they're all raising their hands. And it says nine thirty p.m. Somewhere in L.A., an improv troupe decides that Justin has to go. <laughs> <laughs> and Justin's in the background, and he's, he's hamming it up. <laughs> you have to see it. It's not fair. I mean, Justin looks, I mean, they're all a-holes. It's an improv group. <laughs> What's the deal with improv groups? Well, it looks like Justin is having the time of his life getting all these big yes. laughs. And they're furious that he's getting all these big laughs. But Justin shouldn't be stealing the show because an improv. It's, it's an improv group. It's, it's, it's a group. yes and. Yeah. And it's you, yes and. You share. Yes. Surprisingly, we have a small audience, but they buy books. They don't read them, as I always say, but they buy them. <laughs> I, that's what I've been that's told. Mean. That's very mean for you to say that. Well, I've hey, got, um, I've got, got to song? know my listeners. Did you get my song? I have a yes, new song. Yes, I did, sir. Yes, I did, sir. Yes. I want to. I have a couple of things, uh, odds and ends to pick up from your last couple of shows. Okay. Um, uh, one of them is you. You mentioned Trotsky, uh, and you failed to mention one of the most interesting things. I think Peter B. Collins. Did he mention that Trotsky was killed by a Spaniard? Jose um, mentioned it. Okay, yeah, Jose. Hang on. Trotsky was actually killed by a Spanish, a Spanish gardener. And he was killed. The guy took an, a mountain climbing axe and hit him with it. Not an ice stick in his head. Not oh. an ice pick, no. And, um, and, What's that? and the. That's, this is, okay, this is bringing up the other thing. The other loose end was David Ives. When you, we talked about Sondheim and his last interview, he was working on a collaboration with this great playwright named David Ives. And David Ives has written this, all these one-act plays. This is called uh, 
all in the timing. These are great, very funny. And uh, the one of the plays is um, variations on the death of Trotsky. <laughs> and the thing about the thing about the Trotsky thing is that they actually the doctors didn't want to take he he didn't die right away, and they didn't want to remove the the axe because so it would he, cause he more damage. Axis. Yeah, because you know, like if you get stabbed and the knife is there, they say don't don't take the knife out. Right. Wait, you know, let a let a, a professional remove the knife. <laughs> right. <laughs> or your wife after she stabbed you in the back. Right. But anyway, honey, just leave it in there. No, no, <laughs> don't take it out, please, don't. But anyway, um, so th we saw this play in New York. Oh, well, it was hey, so, good. so, it was so Trotsky had an ice pick in his head that the doctors wouldn't no, remove. No, no, an axe. It's an, an axe. axe. Yeah. yeah. And so the play the, the, for the whole this whole one act, Trotsky's on stage with an axe coming out of his head. So no hat. Is. You can't just that. You can't you can't uh, <laughs> get a hat to cover it up. So it's no, one of the lines. One of the lines is his wife walks in and goes, Leon, you have an axe in your head. He goes, yeah, I noticed that when I was shaving today. <laughs> <laughs> And then they go, they go through, and um, all in the timing is all about time. And a lot of these plays have, um, they're 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 separated. They're little vignettes separated by a bell. Like the the first one's called the Sure Thing, and it's just a series of a couple trying to, a guy trying to um, approach a woman who's sitting in a cafe. And he always and he keeps saying the wrong thing, and then there's a bell, bing, and they have to start over. Well, that's funny. Yeah, it is. It's great. She, excuse me, is this chair taken? And then she says, "Excuse me, is this taken?" Yes, it is. Oh, sorry. Betty says, "Sure thing." Ding. And then Bill says, "Excuse me, is this chair taken?" Excuse me, is this taken? No, but I'm expecting someone in a minute. Okay, thanks anyway. Sure thing. Ding. And eventually it gets down. He says the right things. And uh, they they both enjoy Faulkner, but it takes a long time. It just keeps going, keeps it's brilliant. And the other another one is um, uh, Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread. You know the music of Philip Glass? I, I know of it. Piano. It would be like this. Oh, are you hearing anything? You hear my piano? Yes. Yes. And it would do that for like 15 minutes. And then after 15 minutes, he might. It just goes and goes and goes. Who so was anyway, this piano that, teacher? Somebody famous had a father who taught Philip Glass <clears throat> piano. And I can't remember. Who I don't it was. know about that. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, this David Ives, I was so. Wouldn't that have been great to see this David Ives collaborating with Sondheim on a musical? Yeah. That's really a shame. That that didn't happen. But, uh, so it took a long time for Trotsky to die. It took a day, I guess. He or or um, yeah, and then he, they just <laughs> left that thing in his Rasputin? head. Rasputin, some of that Russians, <laughs> to Stalin, it, it, it takes them. No, why do you why do you say ice pick? Had you heard an ice pick? I heard ice pick. Well, in the play, he's he he brings out. You know my fear of ice picks. <laughs> <laughs> he says, and we've have you promised me there's no ice picks in the house. He finally brings the gardener in to talk to him. He says, uh, Ramon, did you hit me with your axe? Did you embed an axe in my head? No, I smashed you in the head with an axe. Wow. He said, why did you do that? He said, I can I couldn't find an ice pick. <laughs> <laughs> so was then he the work says, well, for... maybe he's just a literalist. Maybe he went to the head gardener and said, uh, does does Trotsky want to look at the nesters today? <laughs> and the head gardener said, ax Trotsky. <laughs> Don't ax, ax Trotsky. Me. Why are you axing me? <laughs> <laughs> then anyway, so a communist... that was one. Had a gardener, Go ahead. a communist had a gardener. Yeah, it was a member of the. Well, the, I'm sure they had servants. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> That's why they went to uh, Cuba. Cheap labor, David. You know what I'm saying? Right. Or Mexico? Wasn't he killed in um, Mexico? Oh, I think you're right. Think yeah, Mexico. Yeah. Well, there you go. Cheap labor, David. You yeah. know. Hey. Um, 
The other thing was, did you did you finish the Beatles thing? I haven't even cracked it. <gasps> but I was kidding. listening to it's Hard Day's Night today. Interesting that you mentioned that. That doesn't count. I you got to watch this whole thing. It's I, I I talked about it on my Facebook page. I got very frustrated in the third episode because they just jack around. They're doing everything but working on the show that's like now it's a week away now it's five days away now it's four days away now it's now it's the day after tomorrow and they still haven't figured out what they're going to play and how the songs are going to go <clears throat> and um you know they're doing shake rattle and roll they're doing uh, you know interestingly john is doing many times john will take the song that paul is working on and sing it in a funny voice, make fun of it, kind of. I thought that's kind of you know. Did Paul get upset? Passive aggressive. Does Paul get What's upset? That? Does Paul get upset? Not at all. Not one bit. You know what's so amazing is they have this clash and they're trying to work it out, and they're so gentle with each other. They do on the th the day after uh, George walks out. He just says, I'll see you guys in the pubs. And he says, I'm leaving. I won't be back after lunch. And they, they try to do stuff, the three of them. <clears throat> and then the next day, they go to lunch. And the producers, there's no cameras, but the producers put a microphone in a potted plant on the table. So you don't see them, but you hear this very frank discussion about how they understand George's role and George's frustration with his role and, you know, his his um, uh, resentment about really not being part of the music making process, you know. But then they go to his house on a Sunday to talk it out. And they come back and they say he didn't say anything. Do, do we see um, that? It feels like reality television. Absolutely. It is like reality television, except it's real. I, and, you know, another thing I noticed, there's very little profanity. I don't think I heard one F-bomb. And today, if you had a rock group, well, you know. Well, the, uh, they were aware, show. but they were aware that they were being filmed. Yeah, it's just a different time. Yeah, they were aware. But even even when they're in that lunch and they're just talking and they don't think they're being filmed, I was surprised that they got away with that. And um, but at one of the meetings, Yoko do, did all the talking <laughs> like there's John doesn't come in the next day after Sunday. John doesn't come in, I think, if I get this right. And it's just it's uh, Paul and Linda and the, the, the producer, the director. And, um, um, oh, the Peter Jackson was no, 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 the the Michael, blah, 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 Michael, but he's got three names. He's he's this kind of insufferable guy who wants to his big ideas. We're going to do we're going to film the concert in uh, Libya. They're going to go to this ruin in Libya and they're scheduling. They're still a week out from scheduling it. And they, how are we going to get there? Well, we'll we'll, hire, we'll get a we'll we'll get a boat. We'll get a ship, and we'll take all the equipment there. It's a week away, and they and they they don't know what they're doing. It's so amazingly unorganized. So, but, go ahead. But I, you get to the end when they go to the rooftop and they do the concert, and it is so unbelievably good. Right. They were such a great live band. You could see why they were so compelling. I mean, all those studio albums were great, beautiful, and I love them. <clears throat> That's another thing. But Paul's bass sound and the way he hooks up with Ringo, there's, and it just cooks. It's, the groove is so... I mean, Ringo's a very simple drummer, but his groove is great. And um, they, do, they, do, they only do four songs, and they do each one at least twice to get different cuts. And a lot of that rooftop music that they did was the actual things they used for the album of uh, Let It Be. 
They went back the next day and they finished up the album and that's it. They don't do anything again until they do Abbey Road a couple months later. Abbey Road is after, but this album came out last. Right. Right. So anyway, I just say, if you're a little frustrated, just know that there's a huge payoff. Well, I know. I've been told it's the kind of thing. It, it, I started watching the first 20 minutes and it was a history lesson on the Beatles. It was all about, it was Peter Jackson. I, so I got turned off by that. And then I thought, well, this is a great way to spend Christmas. But then I had to rewatch Succession on Christmas. And then I fell down a, a rabbit. Like the, the Beatle, I've got this... Like, it's waiting for me. It's a, this treat. Uh, did you watch it in one sitting? No, it's too long. It's six hours. And I'm going to um, watch it again. Of course, I will. Because um, there's some things I want to go back and go, oh. Because I was confused at times because they're working on music for Abbey Road. Right. I'm going, that song's, that song's not on. Right. But Abbey Road is before this album. I didn't realize until after... Later, when I did some more reading, that um, Abbey Road was was later, and Abbey Road's a basically a studio album. Right. But you know the the frustrating thing was how they jack around, and second, they they just don't want to tune their guitars, and it's so god awfully, um, you know, out of tune. There's only one time when George goes, I need to tune. <laughs> and everybody's, you know, talking and stuff. Be quiet, I need to tune my guitar. And uh, he tries to tune up. But um, but when they when I, they I do think, finally record, it's they're in tune. It's in tune enough. And it's it's actually that's the that's the sound of the Beatles live. Is it's a little out of if you listen to those early things, you know, like I want to hold your hand and she loves you, yeah. The guitars are a little out of tune. On There's purpose? enough of them on purpose. No, I just think I think it's a neat effect. I mean, you know, rock and roll isn't perfectly in tune. Hey, it's an interesting thing. I have a good friend who's in a brilliant arranger. His name is Rich DeRosa. He was on the faculty. He is on the faculty here. Great arranger. And we were, he was helping me with one of my pieces and he was in his studio playing my music on his computer or his uh, keyboard with the string patch. And I goes, and he, he, he was playing, um, you know, something, you know, and it, I said, why, why does an orchestra sound so beautiful? And, he, and right away he says, because it's out of tune. And I went like, what? But you got, if you, if you have four, if you have a violin, a second violin, a cello, and uh, a viola quartet, they have to be right in tune, or otherwise it's, it's going to sound bad. But if you start to add more people, it's like a choir. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing to do is to make something sound good with four parts, one on a part. But if you, it's, it's pretty, a, a big choir, 400 voices, it's the out of tuneness that becomes the richness. And I think with the Beatles, I don't think it's on purpose, but I think that they, it didn't bother them. And their singing all the way through is kind of sloppy until they get on the rooftop. And then it's, they're, they're John and Paul, they have little parts that they do together and it's pristine. It's, you know, rhythmically perfect. And just the joy, like Paul's joy. Um, there's one one priceless moment, and I try to put it on my YouTube page, where when the police sh the police show up and they try to shut it down, and they're downstairs, and this the bobbies with the the you know the beanies and the the thing around their nose, and they're they're insufferable. You know they think we've had thirty complaints. You know this is unnecessary. What are they doing up there? Well, they're recording an album. Recording an album, you know. Meanwhile, down on there, a huge crowd gathers on the street below, and they're going crazy, you know. But um, they you know the finally story. get the police. Go ahead. What's that? There's a famous story about Al Franken, and Conan was there, 
it was SNL and George Harrison was performing on Saturday Night Live. So Paul McCartney stopped in because he was with Ringo and the three of them started jamming together in the writing room. Oh, wow. And Al Franken opened his office door and said, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to get this show ready. And he slammed the door and the Beatles. Oh, what an asshole. And the Beatles stopped. They got, they were scared. God. And then supposedly the next day during the table read, Lauren Michael said, Al, do you want to explain yesterday? And Al Franken said, anybody can say they saw the Beatles. Now, I don't know how much of that is apocryphal, but apparently... What, is he mean? what did he mean by that? that anybody, anybody can, can say they see. saw the Beatles. How many can say they told them to shut the fuck up? <laughs> oh, I see. That's, that's pretty good. And that's broke them good. up and they stopped. But... Uh, that is a true well, story. I don't know how much of that is true. I do know that they were jamming in the writer's room at SNL. It's probably true. It's probably and, true. and the truth That's is that bit. Al Franken opened up his office door, told them to shut the fuck up, slammed the door, and they stopped playing. And That's funny. That is pretty great. I mean, that that is pretty great. <laughs> like, it's just like a, yeah. a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. <laughs> to hear the Beatles. That's why these these cops are so clueless as to uh -huh. they're 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 here they're seeing the last performance live of the Beatles and they're they're trying to shut it down. They they get to the roof. This is what I want to tell you about. They get to the roof and they're doing uh Don't Bring Me Down. No, no. What are they doing? Yeah, I guess they're doing Don't Bring Me Down. And <clears throat> Paul's playing and he turns around and catches their looks at him and he turns around and smiles real big and goes woo <laughs> he goes a woo he does like a beetle woo and then then he then he turns later with john singing the verse and he kind of plays and dances and and like uh uh he's vibing him you know like what are you guys doing you know and then he jumps around he does you got to watch that part because he comes back around and he does a little dance now here's the weird thing about that I tried to do a screen capture of that. I played it on my t TV, I mm -hmm. mean, on my computer. And uh, you know what Movavi screen capture is? No. Well, that's the thing. You can you you decide what you want, and you you can record a video off your screen. Right, you I have it. something. It's pretty like cool. That. Yeah, but it, right. I go to edit it. It's black. It's black. I go, that's weird. I fix around with my computer, you know. So then I go, well, let me, I'll, j I'll just do a still. So I do a screen grab of this point where Paul's doing this dance. And the screen grab is black. And I did a little going Apple TV, no, HBO, Disney. or whoever's, Disney. they figured out somewhere you cannot, Disney. No, it's not on Disney. Yeah, it is on Disney. Disney. You cannot copy that stuff and then oh. i saw so I, I got my phone out and i filmed this little clip and i made an mp4 and i put it on on um, my um, facebook thing and put a little thing i just finished this you got to watch it blah, 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 blah. it show it's up there for about 10 minutes and then i get a thing your video is blocked Man, they are policing the crap out of that. Yeah, but they, they do that. Like, so, there are certain platforms where if you play any music that's licensed, they they can figure out there's some kind of marker in it and they can they can tell. Do you think it was the music or the visuals? The, the music, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Well, in terms of the screen grab, just coming up black, I mean, that's just a still. Right. I was shooting a still. I paused it. I'm shooting a still picture of it. Now, when I did it with my did camera, you... it worked. Right. You know? Here's something to watch on YouTube. Paul McCartney performed on the roof of the Ed Sullivan show for Letterman. This must have been 10, 15 years ago. 
Oh, really? To recreate their well, rooftop he, thing? He just decided that he was guesting on Letterman, and Letterman said, why don't we have him perform on the roof of the Ed Sullivan Theater in front of, you know, on Broadway, and everybody could... It would be kind of like, you know, get back. So it's interesting to watch, because Letterman had a great director. It's a great lesson in how to be a horrible director the way it's shot it oh really because you have paul mccartney on the roof and it became about the director and all these sweeping shots and all about these cuts and i'm thinking can i just look at paul mccartney please yeah really and and it's such a great lesson in yeah in why wow. technology and artifice gets in the way of something that's just really good. if you've got paul mccartney why add seasoning and it's so it's a great lesson in how not to yeah. how not to direct and how people can get their thumbprints on something where they don't belong it's it's uh, McCartney yeah. on the roof of the Ed Sullivan Theater. Watch well, it. Sounds be like I don't want to. Sounds like I don't want to. No, watch it's it. really interesting to, to see how <laughs> so, a, a sweaty director can get in the way of. How do you so, know? How do you know he was sweaty? Because it's can, sweaty to do something like that to have you know okay. fifteen <laughs> shots in one minute when you just have to stay on Paul McCartney. That's all you need to do. You don't need anything yeah. else but you know this was i've got paul mccartney i'm the director i'm gonna put my fingerprints all over this to ruin it people yeah people ruin things by touching it well i tell you what it's worth to anybody who hasn't seen the beatles thing it's worth the 14.99 what else do you Plus. think they have oh what what else do you think that we don't know about that the Beatles are sitting on. Well, so somebody in the chat last. No, 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 no. Somebody in my Facebook page said, oh, there's a there's a director's cut, 16 hour director's cut coming out. Peter Jackson. I would like to see what they did in. Um, I think they learned their lesson about the cameras and decided. Not to film anything in. Um, when they went to when they did Abbey Road, you know. Uh, I'm going to watch. You want to talk? You want to talk about the song? Yeah, Christian Smalls, who's been on this show, is being harassed by the New York City Police Department. He's been he formed Amazon Workers Union, and they're going to vote out by the fulfillment center at JFK and. He's being hassled by the New York City Police Department. They arrested two of his cohorts for no reason whatsoever. It's a page out of the Pinkerton Guards. It's New York City police yeah. acting like Ford, Henry Ford's police in Detroit and the Pinkerton Guards just doing the, the bidding of Jeff Bezos. Pretty horrendous you would think new york yeah. city police would pick on well he is black that that yeah uh, christian smalls is black yeah. so i uh, so you wrote a song about uh jeff bezos right? well, let me tell you about the title and 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 kind of the rabbit hole i went down to, to get it's called ain't ain't no chairs and um i started looking into um well first of all Bessemer, there was a vote at Bessemer, Alabama, at the uh, at the plant last April, and it was fraught with a lot of. Uh, they did a lot of dirty shenanigans, but the vote was seventeen hundred ninety eight against and seven thirty eight for, and that's like twenty five hundred votes total. But there were six thousand people at the plant, so most people didn't vote. A majority of people didn't vote, and one of the things that they did that Amazon did is they uh, got the postal service to install a mailbox on their grounds and they put it in a tent and they had a camera on it. And they said, yeah, you can just, you know, you can just drop your ballots off here and uh, we'll, we'll make sure they get counted. 
And there may have been, they denied that they did anything in terms of not counting the ballots or throwing ballots away. But still, that intimidation, um, it's pro- they're going to do another vote. The National Labor Relations Board um, threw, the, threw the election out because of unfair practices. It'll probably turn out the same because one of the things about that plant and Amazon in particular, you know, the turnover rate for Amazon uh, warehouses is 150 percent per year. Mm -hmm. In other words, so nobody's nobody's going there to this is my dream to work for Amazon. A lot of it's temporary. A lot of it's what they call peak. There's a couple of lyrics. The the main lyric is there. There ain't no chairs in this Bessemer place, in this Bessemer shop. And when I read that... Well, um, people do want permanent jobs at Amazon. Part of their business model is to get rid of them. Right. Because they don't want them to, to, to get, get pensions or anything like right. that. But the scary, one of the scariest thing is there's no chairs in these plants. They don't have to put chairs down. People work, the net, normal shift is 10 hours a day for four days a week. But in peak time, which is now, well, no, it's over. But from Black Friday to Christmas Eve is peak time. Most of the workers are working 12-hour shifts and doing six a week. And they walk probably, depending on what their job, some are sorters that just sort things and put them in bins as they come in. I, there's a, it's hard to really get online descriptions of how bad these plants are because I think Amazon is cleaning up the web. But I got on a site where people were talking very frankly about things, you know, uh, you know, getting hit by robots. There's robots. You, 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 you know, you have to be very careful. Uh, if something spills on the floor, you can't pick it up and it slows you down. They're being clocked by computers some are walking if you're a, if you're a picker you go from different places you may walk 15 miles a day the breaks are 10 minutes long uh parking is atrocious some people say they can't even uh get to their car it they have to be in the parking lot 30 minutes before if you're late if you get three dings three mar- three write-ups you get fired so being late is a, is a write up, uh, not making your peak. And there's a line in there. I've said, I got to make my peak. Your rate is, is something like um, it might be like 700 items uh, an hour that you have to 700, nail. 700 items an hour. And if you're not keeping your peak, they ding you. And if you can't keep up with it, I mean, the, these people write about how it just they, they are exhausted when they're done, you know. So I wrote this song from the perspective of a, a worker at Bessemer where they don't have any chairs. You know, they say they have a break room. They don't have hot food. They have cold snacks in vending machines that they can get. And very few places in the break room to sit down. So people sit on the concrete floor. The thing that sparked me to write this is there were two deaths in late uh, November on the 26th and the 28th. No, no, 28th, 29th of November, uh, two men died at the Bessemer plant. There's been a total of six people died at that plant, in, at the plant while working in 2021. One guy had a heart attack and uh, well, well, he complained of feeling bad. He went to HR and says, I need to go home. They said, well, you don't have enough sick time, so you better stay or we'll fire you. And then he died a few hours later. Uh, and they were slow in attending to him. He died on the floor. Another guy felt sick. He went off into a trailer somewhere by himself, and uh, he was feeling bad, and he had a stroke and died. So it's a horrible, it's a horrible thing. This is a serious song. I, you know, I haven't written many and, serious and, songs. And, of course, there were the, the victims. I think five died in the tornado in Kentucky. Evans, Ed, Edwardsville, Indi, in, in, Edwardsville, Illinois. In Illinois. Uh, they didn't have their they can't use their cell phones so they didn't get the the, the warning in time and the roof collapsed on them and you but need they, you know the the first responders are trying to find you if you have a cell phone you can be you know it's easier to find yeah you. hey uh before we play this song uh some things you can control in life and one of the things is 
not supporting Amazon. Just, you know, cut it out of your life. Do not shop on Amazon, period. Nothing good comes from Amazon. Nothing. Do not support Amazon, period. People should, you know, I got rid of the affiliate links. Selling crap on Amazon is, it's, it is an evil, evil company. Jeff Bezos is evil. Do not support Amazon. Nothing good comes from Amazon. He's destroyed Main Street. He's destroyed bookstores, record stores. He's destroyed the lives of ordinary workers who are forced into these warehouses with no, no light, no protective equipment for COVID. Yeah, it's horrible. Uh, no pee breaks. The man is evil. The man is evil. Amazon is evil. Evil. Do not give Amazon your money. Period. Let's listen to it's the hard. Song. You know, it's hard not to. I think that getting these places union, you know, the Amazon is the second largest employer in the United States. Yeah. And if they had a union, I personally think that the union that they're that's trying to uh, organize is the wrong union. The retail wholesaler is wholesale and yeah. department stores union. They need they need their own union. Well, that's what be. Christian is starting at yeah. JFK. Yeah, that that uh, that union in Bessemer is run by some Harvard law grad out of Connecticut. Stuart Applebaum. Stuart, Stuart Applebaum. Applebaum. You know, I try to get him on the show. Not, you know, I understand why people don't do my show. We're a tiny little show. Christian Smalls does my show. Not only did Stuart Applebaum not get back to me, I wouldn't expect a Harvard Law graduate to get back to me, but I would expect somebody from that union to get back to me. I didn't need, I, I said, can I get a representative from your union to come on my show? I didn't expect the Harvard Law graduate running that union to, to come on. Never heard from them. Yeah, you're right. Bad union, you know. Yeah, and Christian Christian said they they came in and they didn't really handle it well, you know. But anyway, so this song is kind of serious. I have I've done silly songs. I, it I really thought long and hard for about two weeks whether I should do this song, and then I thought I'm gonna and I spent I, I really worked on it hard. I hope you like it, but it's you know like it's. It's you kind of go out on a limb when you try to do something serious because people go, you know, if you do something silly, if they don't like it, fine. I, mean, I just did a silly song just right. to throw away. But um, well, it's kind of I think I kind of like this one. We'll see if you like it. OK. Here is new music and it's called Ain't No Chairs. Ain't No Chairs. Professor Mike Steinel. Chairs in this Bessemer shop. Packing all day, you don't ever seem to stop. A man went down, cause his heart gave out. Get back to work, we all heard them shout. They said the EMTs are coming. That's what they're for. And life slipped away on a cement floor. I know the bookstores are all gone away. I got me some books. I'm going to read them someday. Right now I got to make my rate on all these extra shifts. If I can make it to Christmas Eve, the kids will have nice gifts. 
And the boss man will have his money So he can go up in space There still won't be no chairs In this Bessemer plane That's amazing. Let's get, let's, uh, Professor Marianne Cummings, do you have the score for us? On... <laughs> let's unmute. Let's ask the Professor Marianne okay. Cummings. No, I, had to, I had to have a standing ovation for that. Okay. You're yes. welcome to stand. <laughs> yeah. There ain't no chairs in this Bessemer place. It's great. <laughs> Thank you, Professor yeah, well, Marianne. About that, that, Let me hang that on I, for one second. Thank you, Professor Marianne <laughs> Cummings, for speaking on behalf of everybody here. That was fantastic. That's high praise coming from Professor Marianne. I know. I know that. That's great. She's an artist. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, she's an artist. No, no, but you were going to I interrupted you about something else. That really is... No, I mean, when I read that, there aren't any chairs. I thought, wow, what a place. And you imagine just being on your feet all day long. And th they say the bathroom breaks. You can't even hardly get to the bathroom and back, you know, in 10 minutes. And uh, no, no cafeterias, cold sandwiches, if you want them, if you want to pay I, for I them. I don't know how it's possible to be on your feet that long. I, I remember I was like, 24 and i was pumping gas in sausalito california when i was yeah you know and i i bought shoes i was a kid and i couldn't stand i remember going my feet are killing me and no matter you know, whatever sneakers i use i just 
at that, I was in my early 20s and I had trouble standing on my feet all day. Yeah, well, I wish him I wish him a lot of luck. I hope they can get something down, organized down there because yeah. I know that area. I, I did my uh, sabbatical down in Birmingham, and uh, it's a tough. It's it had some tough times, you know, for you know, uh, racially and economically. Um, yeah. But it's a it's a beautiful state, and it's got a lot of nice people down there. Um, and you know, I met a lot of of uh, music educators there's some there's some really good feeling between the races down there not everybody right but uh i was kind of i was very heartened by it you know and bessemer alabama has a long history of african-americans unionizing there's a, there's a rich yeah, they, tradition in the in the 30s that was one of the areas that was immune from the uh depression because the steel mill there was right in Bessemer was going crazy, you know, and uh, that had a lot to do with the development of some really great jazz musicians that came out of uh, Birmingham and Montgomery. And the African-American like, labor movement. Yes, which was then tied into, you know, Martin Luther King was there and he he that that was it, it's all intertwined, the, the you know, the labor movement and civil rights when that that was a powerful um, marriage yeah. bet between those two movements. There's, we there's, need to do it again. Yeah. There's an argument in the chat room that's kind of interesting. I had said not to shop on Amazon. Some people are saying that you're not supporting the workers by telling people not to shop on Amazon. That calling for people to boycott Amazon doesn't help the, the labor movement because for whatever reason. Uh, I disagree. That's a dilemma. As, as I sit here, I go like, how could I help beyond just writing a song? It's just a song, you know. But um, um, I suppose uh, there's some way to donate money to to somebody, and and but I don't know exactly how, you know. Uh, these things are often very localized, you know, and. Uh, but for, for the, you know, for a future episode, because I'm open to criticism, obviously. Uh, I think. Since our votes are ignored, the best way to make your voice heard here in the United States is how you spend your money. If you don't approve of somebody's business practices, you should not give them your money. And you should make it known that I don't approve of how you treat your workers. I'm not going to participate in this. That's why I'm a vegan. I will not participate in the exploitation of Tyson workers and of course the chickens. I will not participate in big ag and the slaughterhouses. Will not do it. Yeah. And that makes me better than most people. <laughs> the fact that well, I'm a does. vegan well, makes me true. better. It, it does. I, it's, <laughs> I'm not a good person, but by being a vegan, I can lord, that's one of the few things I can lord over others. Like Marianne Cummings ran for office and got elected. That makes her superior. I'm a vegan. That's my little. Yeah. What do you got there? I love this cartoon. It says uh, this is one one of Jose's and it says a at 6.51 p.m. somewhere in L.A., a marijuana salesman tells a customer what the government doesn't want him to know. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately, there's only one place to buy that. <laughs> I think you, I, well, I don't know. You can only that. buy it. I guess so. You can only yeah. buy his book on Amazon. Uh, yeah. You know, let me offer up this suggestion to the chat room. Meatless Mondays. If you give up meat just on Mondays, you can lower greenhouse gases. So an Amazonless Monday, Tuesday, think twice. 
before shopping on Amazon. I understand. Donate. I understand that a lot of people don't live in Manhattan where all you have to do is walk outside and what, whatever you don't need is readily available. But you need Amazon. Yeah. But try not to shop on Amazon the same way you try not to eat meat. Donate to Mike Elk at uh, Payday Report. Yes. How's he feeling? I keep I keep going on the site. I, the, it, there's no update since the the 23rd of December. He hasn't been reporting at all. No, he's sick. Um, uh, what do you think of in these times? It's great. In fact, we have people uh, from from in these times on the show. Why? Why do you ask? They have a labor reporter. Uh, I wrote his name down, and he's done. You know, it's. It's really interesting to, to get into the details of the Bessemer thing. It's kind of, you know, there's just the same story, the AP story. Right. And they kind of harp on the fact that uh, it was a two to one, two to one uh, defeat for labor. You know, there was twice as many people didn't want it, but they don't talk about all the shenanigans, you know, the, right. the, the mailbox. And also in the song, there's a thing they had a meeting and they were required to go and it was all about anti-union it was an anti-union meeting every every person was required to go and then they handed out buttons that said vote no yeah and then you're being filmed all the time you're working so if you go and vote you know um and there's a, there was a lot of pressure there's a lot of pressure put by amazon and uh it's um, I think unions need support. So that would be one place is to um, it really is yeah. the solution. Yeah. The unions are the, the solution. I mean, if, if Amazon paid a living wage and was kind to their workers and gave them breaks and had cafeterias and was a, a great place to work, they wouldn't have that turnover. Right. But know? they want that turnover because they do. Yeah. It's by design to be cruel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, thank you for that song. You're welcome. I'm going to play that more and more. We've had, just to explain what's been going on, I do this entire show on one computer, and I've maxed out my CPUs, whatever that means. So we're doing this on, on just low voltage until I wipe this computer clean and then reinstall the all the software so i haven't been able to play a lot of your music and uh, and show okay. videos this that's all right this is uh, an acapella version of the david feldman show all the technology is gone and i have to say there's a part of me that doesn't miss it there, there's yeah. a, there's some this yeah. is just old school without all the the bells and whistles. There is something nice about doing the show without having to worry about all the other software. But yeah, I don't. I, don't think I got it, my computer fixed. I did it myself. I figured it out, and it was. Uh, can you fly was, to, fly here and do my computer? What was it? Uh, sure. Well, let's, do you have Dropbox? No. Dropbox is a thing that you can share files with yeah, somebody yeah, else. Yeah. Okay. So I had the Dropbox set up, and I didn't know that it was set up to copy anything from an external hard drive. Oh, so it was eating up all your stuff. So I would go, I was, I was going, I'm maxing out my hard drive, and I was taking stuff off and putting it on the external. And then <laughs> Dropbox was just copying all the new stuff back. So I kept coming back to the computer. I said, I got rid of all these files. I was cleaning out like crazy. And, uh, and it would go right up to the max. And then it wouldn't, it just slowed down and wouldn't do anything. And on the last two songs that I did, it didn't save the, the actual bulk file. It saved the, uh, just the MP3, which is a drag because I don't have those songs now. I don't have mixable versions of them if I want to tweak them. Oh, but um, anyway, thank you for that That's probably more than you wanted to know. Uh, yeah. Happy New Year, David. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Happy New Year to you, too. And I look forward to uh, you coming back next week. Your stuff is amazing. I should be here. I should be. I have no plans. Yeah, and you're not going up to Kansas anymore for the time being. Too cold up there. They got snow. I don't want that. Yeah. I think we It's had cold s- here. I think it's cold and we had snow here today. I think. What do I know? Thank you, All Professor right. Mike Steinel. All the best, man. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thank you. Great song. Mike Steinel is a jazz trumpeter, composer, and educator. He was a member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from 1987 to 2019. Author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, and his latest is Running the Changes, all about jazz theory. He's got uh, a CD out on Origin Records entitled Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet featuring Rosanna Eckert. That is our show. And let's see, we've got some people with their hands raised. Let's go to John Hayes. Hey, John. Hey, David. Go um, ahead. I saw the I saw the fighting in the chat room. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my point is, we only got so much money to spend and so many products to buy. So why buy them from a shit source like Amazon? Your, your money's still going to go to somebody. Right. Better somebody else if you can do it. I know some people can't. But. Right. Isn't it amazing that you have some people? I mean, I hate to be glib and insensitive, but some people have no choice but to shop on Amazon. Yeah. Amazing. Before that, they had no choice but to go to Walmart. And that's also right. the case with people yeah. who don't have Internet access Yeah, in some places. But I'm saying if you can, just like it's easier to go vegan if you can in a lot of cities, a lot of places, it's if getting, you can, why getting, not? Yeah, it's getting easier and easier. By the way. I had some beans. It, you know, it's un. You know, go to rahima.org, Professor Adnan Hussein's uh, mother's charity. D- did you go there and see all the beans and the lentils and the chickpeas? Because not yet. <laughs> I had beans last night that were so incredible. It was beans, carrots, and celery with. Uh, salt, sesame oil, and soy sauce. I know I shouldn't have salt or sesame oil. It The next day, it was breathtaking last night, and then today, before the show, I had more where the ingredients get to know one another. There's nothing better than that. Nothing. And if everybody did that, a couple of times a week, we could reverse diabetes, obesity, climate change, and war. The answer is switching to beans, putting more beans in your diet. Right, John? So, well, there is, Sharon doesn't like beans. I think it's Sharon. So they, and maybe they have a, maybe she has an allergy or something. So oh, in her case, it would have to be something else. But Is Sharon your wife? No, Sharon uh, in the chat room. You know Sharon. Oh, Sharon doesn't like beans. I think it's Sharon. I could be wrong. Okay, well. Somebody. But there's other options. Yeah, like rounding people like her up and placing them in re-education camps. She'll like beans. (laughs) (laughs) But we have the vegan re-education camps. Thank you, John. Let us now go to Benji in Florida. Hey, Benj. Hey, Happy New Year, brother. Thank you. Hey, man, I'm uh, sure you heard, you know, we're kind of seeing some record high daily cases of COVID down here again. Yeah. So I'm very sad to say we're going to have to cancel the surfing lessons I was going to give you. <laughs> oh, okay. Put the speedos away, man. You don't want to catch what's going on in the waves down here, bro. <laughs> I don't think you want to deal with some of these misguided Trumpers down here either. I mean, it's some guy was yelling at me today telling me that Trump put Christ back in church. Like, what? Like, this is the man who spent more time in Stormy Daniels than he ever spent in a church. Right. <laughs> and that was said to be only 90 seconds. <laughs> His supporters, man, they sound like uh, Eddie Murphy's uh, prearranged bride and coming to America. Just ask him anything. It's like, who do you like? 
whoever Trump likes. Mm -hmm. Who do you hate? Whoever Trump tells us to hate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's insanity. Hey, big news, bro. Uh, Swamp Post Studios Florida has officially reached out to Pamela Anderson about being the physical model for my boop top mattress officially from the Memory Foam Mattress Company. Yeah, tell me about the Memory Foam Mattress Company. The only motorboatable mattress company on the market. The mo- a motorboarding mattress. Motorboatable foam. mattress. And it only has motorboatable mattress. It has ma- mammary foam. Mammary foam. Not memory foam. Mammary. Not memory foam. How does memory that work? Foam. How does that work? It's a it's a boob top. <laughs> Boop top mattress. Boop top. You'll see it. Okay. Sweeping the nation. It's going to be big, man. I want. I want in on that. Yeah, it's going to be big, man. I I reached out to them, and the the response was encouraging, man. That you know, at first they said that you know, Pam wouldn't piss on me if I was on fire, and then, but then they invited me to have sexual relations with myself. (laughs) Jokes on them. I was going to do that anyway. (laughs) But then I asked them. I said, "Does, "Does Pam have any New Year's resolutions?" And they said, "Fuck you." And I was like. So I'm really for looking forward to this coming year. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Hey, Anderson, to me, man, she's still like my pinky toe, you know. Eventually, I'm going to bang her on my coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, uh, listen to this, man. My wife just texted me earlier, and she, she asked me if I'd seen the dog bowl. I'm like, no, I haven't seen the dog bowl. Hell, I didn't even know he had that skill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about my wife sometimes, man. Yeah. She's, of course, you know, she's married to me, so her judgment's already in question. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> she's got a degree in psychology. You know, she's not a shrink. You know, she can make things shrink, you know, clothes <laughs> and bank accounts and you know, things enclosed in skin. <laughs> my wife needs to be careful, though, man, because uh, according to my phone, there are a lot of beautiful local singles in my area that are just dying to meet me. Right. My uh, my wife told me the vacuum cleaner broke. It stopped sucking. Maybe it didn't break. Maybe it just got married. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Hey, man, uh, you, you know, I've been helping my wife uh, write her resume, and you're a decorated word, man. You know, maybe you can help me out a little bit. Um, what sounds more business like to you, orgy or gangbang? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure on this one, man. I, I feel like the guy with no arms and no legs that I tried to get directions from yesterday. He's <laughs> really stumped. <laughs> but hey, man, I got to get out of here, brother. I'll see you Friday night, man. Uh, Thank you, Benji. Happy New Year and Happy, happy New Year, all my brothers and sisters out there. Thank you. That's our man in Florida, Benji. Always funny. The only good thing to come out of Florida is Benji. Let's go to Mexico. Rodrigo. Rodrigo in Mexico. Are you there? Rodrigo. Did we lose you? Rodrigo. Hi. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, I fell asleep and missed you. Oh. Godfather thing on Saturday. Oh, you fell asleep on Friday. Yes. That's, I told you not to listen to the podcast before office hour starts. <laughs> um, I wanted to share a little holiday cheer with a uh, heavy size of sarcasm. So the bad news is that the bad people think we're stupid and have stopped hiding their true intentions. The good news is that the bad people are showing us who they are and we need to take advantage of this. Uh, Biden's administration has so many failed promises. It's hard to believe Trump would be worse. Nancy Pelosi is such an inept politician. She doesn't know how out of touch she is. And I could keep going, but David has mentioned many of the examples I was going to use, so instead I'll say this. Um, Many of us are skeptical that someone who wants to protect everyone protects anyone. But if the people you're following never speak up about minorities being bullies, they're much more likely to decide that poor whites could be successful if only they were willing to work hard and leave you behind. 
And I could go on a rant about how Max Blumenthal and Jimmy Dore are trying to convince people that the CIA told Google to modify the algorithm to make 600,000 people watch a one-hour video that deconstructs Jimmy Dore's multiple lies while they talk to their one million audience also on YouTube. But I want to mention that Matt Binder is still demonetized on YouTube after a bunch of right-wingers complained about his show mysteriously breaking the rules. Uh, there's somewhere lying here, and it's the people propping up a party started by a former OES intern, speaking of the CIA. And remember, please, that Trump passed around $2 trillion in tax codes for the rich who use their tax codes to buy NFTs instead of having people. Meanwhile, student debt has passed 1.7 trillion. If Biden forgot that debt, all that money would get dumped into the economy. And don't get me started on Hillary Clinton pretending that she lost to Trump because of 75,000 Bernie voters choosing Trump in three states when only 66% of eligible voters showed up to vote on 2016, and 1.7 million of the 138 million who voted left the presidential ballot empty, or the grifters convincing people that if you stop voting Democrats, the Dems will come crawling, begging for their vote. I mean, if Hillary is still pretending that her loss was Bernie's fault, the Dems aren't going to change just because you leave them. Or Joe Manchin, who, if he really wanted to help miners instead of protecting his stock in coal mines, could just ask for early retirement for the last 33,000 coal miners in West Virginia, and that would be cheaper than anything else being discussed. And just let me end by congratulating David on passing 36,000 followers on SoundCloud. I couldn't guess how many actually listen regularly, but 36,000 is a good number. So congratulations. I have 36,000 followers on iCloud. SoundCloud. 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 Oh, huh. I guess that's good. Thank it's you. not Apple Podcasts. Not Apple Podcasts, no. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you. David. Thank you. Well, that wraps up our show. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you to all our guests. Please, if you'd like to sit in our virtual studio audience, go to my website and sign up over there. Sign up for office hours. Sign up for my newsletter. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on uh, where else? Uh, Facebook. Congratulations to Kimberly Garfoyle and Don Jr. Uh, They've announced they're getting married. Isn't that sweet? The lovely couple is getting married. And uh, if you're interested in sending them a gift, Don Jr. and Kimberly are registered with the law firm of Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood. So if you want to send them a gift, uh, I don't want to say the Trump family is broke, but Kimberly demanded a prenup. All right. That's it. I want to thank our guests. I, I, I'm ending the show. I'm still sw I'm still fighting. I'm still swinging at it. Uh, I want to thank all our guests, starting with Mark Breslin, Howie Klein, Melanie Darigo. Uh, she's running for the House of Representatives, New York Three, David Cobb, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Professor Adnan Hussein, listen to Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless Podcast, Peter B. Collins, Professor Marianne Cummings, and of course, Professor Mike Steinel. This is our first show of the year. And I thank everybody for listening. I hope a safe and happy, happy new year awaits all of us. Get vaccinated. 
wear a mask, stay strong, protect the weak. I'll see you Thursday. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comments too. The Taylor Dirty Joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now on the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way.